This is Audible. Hachette Audio presents Moon Glow. Written by Kristen Callahan. Read by Maura Quirk. Chapter 21 An alpha, my boy, is not the beast with the greatest strength, but with the greatest will. Know your mind, boy. Know it without hesitation or reservation, and ye shall lead them. Ian strode into the great hall of Clan Ranulf, and his father's long-ago words rang through his bones. Here, in this hallowed court, he felt the power and will of his ancestors. Designed to impress, the walls and floor were lined with onyx marble, creating a void of black in which only the golden throne at the end of the hall shone bright. His father had sat there for clan business. His father had expected Ian to sit there one day too. Connell sat there now, his black eyes watchful as Ian drew near. Connell, the younger brother who used to dog his steps, pleading for a bit of Ian's attention. Ian had taught him to fight, tried to teach him the concept of justice, but he had failed at some point, for the reports Ian had heard from the refugee lichens that Lena sent to his home told a dark story of dominance, greed, and mismanagement. Worse, if those tales were to be believed, Connell had also formed an alliance with the human gangs around inner-city London and now preyed on the weak and the poor. Ian bit back a sneer of disgust as he stopped before the dais. Connell lounged upon the throne as if it were a bed, one long leg thrown over the armrest, his booted foot swinging an idle rhythm. Aye, his brother was strong, no doubt about it. Muscles dominated his frame, barely hidden beneath the modish clothes he wore. And he was without hesitation. But did he have the will? Ian would soon find out. Do what is right. Take control of your clan. His clan. The thought was smoke and seduction, whispering in his veins, creeping along his skin. He had lost everything because of his lichen heritage, and now his world had turned full circle. Connell gave him a thin smile, his eyes calculating. And so the prodigal son returns. His black gaze narrowed. After running amok in Highgate, it seems. Ian almost snorted. Is that what Connell would call it? And what of the ware he'd captured? Ian wanted answers, but he had to be careful. Behind him came the scent of Daisy. He ignored it. It was too easy to lose control where she was concerned. Damn it all, he hated having his weakness so close at hand. Considering his options, he realized he'd have to taunt Connell just enough to show he did not care, but not enough to challenge him. Wonderful. Connell, he said by way of greeting. His brother snarled. In an instant he was before Ian, his hand wrapped about Ian's throat. Pardon? Claws sank into Ian's neck. The faint sound of Daisy's muffled distress stayed his tongue. Easy, lass. Ian met his brother's eyes. Ranulph, he corrected with false ease. Sharp teeth flashed as Connell smiled. Better. He let Ian go with a shake. Ian stood steady. Connell strolled about him, circling. What are you doing mucking about in my territory, brother? Ian cut him a glance. Did Connell think he'd make excuses? Looking for the mad werewolf, brother. Ah, yes, this mythical werewolf that none of my men have seen hide nor hear of. Ian gave a humorless snort. So then, what was it you captured last night? Connell stopped. His dark brows lifted in an expression much like Ian's. I captured nothing, though I did hear that my brother has now been connected with two wild dog attacks. 
For a cold second, Ian couldn't answer. He hadn't expected Connell to deny having the wear. It did not make sense. Worse, there was something in his brother's tone that gave him pause. They'd grown so far apart that Ian could no longer be sure if Connell was lying or not, and that concerned him greatly. Are you trying to tell me that I imagined fighting that wear last night, or the fact that your men took it down with Ranulph darts just moments before they tagged me? Connell laughed shortly. I've no idea what you've imagined. Ian reached into his trouser pocket. Tell me then, did I imagine this? He tossed the silver dart he'd kept onto the floor, where it clattered against the black marble and then spun about in indolent fashion. From the grumbling that erupted around the room, Ian knew the lichens all recognised the dart. Connell stopped and turned on his heel. He glanced at it before looking back at Ian. Not a shade of emotion on his brother's face. Ian had to commend him for that. What is it I am supposed to be seeing? Connell said, still not bothering to look at the dart. Ian smiled thinly. Right, I'll play. That there, dear brother mine, is a Ranulf hunting dart, one of four that found its way into my chest last night. Ian snapped. After the wear that was attacking me received his fair share of darts. And yet, no clan members of mine were out hunting wares last night. Connell turned to Lyle. Or am I mistaken? Amusement lit Lyle's expression. No, sire. His cold amber gaze settled on Ian for a moment. Nor would a member of my guard take down Macranoff without just cause. Anger turned Ian's blood hot. Lyle, the bastard, would say anything Connell asked him to. Being a lichen, Lyle's age did not show. But he was older than all of them and had been baited to Ian's father. Back then, Lyle had been like an uncle to Ian, caring for him and his family in all ways until Ian had refused the throne. Then Lyle turned from him and swore loyalty only to Connell. Connell strolled away from the dart. Do you care to call Lyle a liar, then? Yes. I've no wish to call him anything other than a canny little lick spittle. If Connell and Lyle insisted on lying, there was nothing Ian could do about it. He yearned to shove the stick pin he'd found in Bethnal Green under Connell's nose and demand an explanation, but it would be tantamount to a challenge. So he glanced at the crowd of lichen assembled in court instead. Some were familiar, some were new. All were richly dressed, yet none of them had been seen among Ian's human familiars. What had gone on here? Had Connell isolated them so much from human society? It was a dangerous thing, for lichens needed human contact to stay sane. Have you all missed the stench of werewolf trailing all over our city? Ian asked. My city, Connell said, a fair amount of warning colouring his words. Our city, Ian retorted, or is Ranulf no longer a clan? A shift went through the crowd uneasiness tightening the air and tinging it sour. These lichen were too used to subservience. Ian could see it in their stance, the way they looked to Connell not with respect, but hesitation and fear. The question should be why you care, brother. Connell came toe to toe with him, and Ian smelled blood on his breath. You left the clan long ago. You're in no position to ask questions. That I gave you leave to even live in this city should have you bowing in gratitude. The werewolf's existence is a danger to every man, not just the clan, Ian said. He needs to be put down before he exposes us and hurts others. There you go again with your speeches, Connell strolled around Ian. A sorry way to get attention. Connell rubbed his jaw and for a moment 
He looked so like their father that Ian felt a stab of grief, which sets me to wondering, given as you're the only lichen claiming to have seen this wolf, well, brother, perhaps you are the one doing these deeds. Ian laughed. He could not contain it. Do I look like a wear? Once a man shifted fully into a wolf, he was done for. It was the warning hammered into every lichen's brain from the time they were weaned. No, Connell admitted, holding the irritating, smug smile that had Ian itching to swipe it off. But then one needn't be fully changed to inflict good damage, eh? His dark eyes narrowed. I hear you took Alan's head with one swipe. If Alan was the lichen lying dead in his front hall, then yes, he had. And he'd do it again. The bastard had been poised to launch a killing blow on Ian. Connell's claws tore free. One gleaming tip touched the corner of Ian's right eye, pushing in just enough to hurt. After all, we have claws too, don't we? Ian stared at his brother. Enough. Why do you persist in claiming there is no wear? Bloody hell, man! The beast has attacked at least five humans. Will you disgrace your own throne? He saw Connell make the decision to move a second before he acted. The hit took Ian hard in the solar plexus. Ian doubled over, the urge to strike back setting his claws free. He'd been stupid to fall for Connell's baiting, not with Daisy in the same room with him. So far, she'd stayed quiet. He'd kiss her for it later. But he would not make the mistake in thinking Connell wasn't aware of her. You do not question the Ranulf, Connell snarled. You do as you are told. Ian sucked in a hard breath. I wasn't aware that you were telling me anything, Ranulf. Christ, man, keep your mouth shut. Another blow caught him in the temple. He saw stars. Had enough? No. Hit me again so I can rip your throat out. Ian bit his lip hard to keep his mouth shut and stayed bent over. Connell's boots came to view. Your talk comes close to sedition, Ian. Very close. Connell leaned down to look Ian in the eye, and his voice went soft with menace. And I'm very aching to see you cross that line and have this business done with. They stared at each other when a sweet, feminine voice broke their stalemate. I saw the beast. Ian ground his teeth as he cursed six ways to Sunday. All eyes turned to Daisy. Oh, uh, that is, I saw the beast, sir, she corrected. Bloody woman. His claws punched free at the ready, for no one was touching her. No one. Daisy ought to have kept quiet, but seeing Connell lay his fists into Northrop had made her stomach turn and inflamed her sense of justice. The words tumbled out of her mouth before she could think better of doing so. Dark eyes looked her over, and she found herself quailing. And who is this? Connell asked. Mrs. Craigmore of Mayfair. Daisy inclined her head. She had no desire to offer her given name to this brute. I was witness to the second killings. Damn, how did one address a lichen king? Your Highness. A lock of hair fell across the lichen leader's brow as he tilted his head and studied her. Northrop's brother did not wear his hair long. Did he not then officially mourn his father's death? Yet you survived. He sounded dubious. By mere chance, she said. But I saw the beast before I blacked out. His movements were odd, like a wolf's, yet also like a man's. A stir went through the crowd. Daisy hadn't known what to expect when she'd entered the court of the lichens. These people looked just like any other but their scent was wild, calling to mind grasses and wind-swept meadows. They did not smell human. The notion made her shiver.
Northrop stood like a statue, not acknowledging her, but she saw the subtle flare of irritation in his eyes as he stared blindly forward. She felt another qualm of guilt. She hadn't meant to interfere. Surprisingly, Connell's voice gentled. And have you seen my brother and this werewolf at the same time? Well, Daisy paused. No. The Lycan King smiled pleasantly. Then how do you know it is not he? They do not have the same scent, she said without hesitation, but her heart was pounding. Did they all truly believe Northrop could do these deeds? She remembered the wild look in Ian's eyes just before he attacked her, and she swallowed hard. It would be easy to place the blame upon his head. Perhaps that was what his brother had wanted all along. She didn't understand their ways and feared that she was in over her head. Each step of Connell's booted feet sounded in the quiet of the hall. She clenched her hands as he came before her. His face was broader than Northrop's, and not quite as refined. He had coal-black eyes, but they shared the same auburn hair colour. He was a touch shorter than Northrop, and a bit stockier. Certainly he did not possess the same air of natural grace that Northrop exuded. For all of that, it still unnerved Daisy to look into a face so like Northrop's, yet not. Connell studied her with equal scrutiny. What do you know of sense, little human? Enough to know that Northrop doesn't smell like the beast that accosted me. Connell waved an indolent hand. I'm thinking you seek to protect your man. I am not. She was, and from the gleam in his eyes the lichen knew it. The sense of smell is a very powerful tool. I will give you that. His nostrils flared a bit as he drew in her scent. The very idea caused a ripple of disquiet along her skin, as if she were being considered for his evening meal. She smells lovely, Connell said to Ian, without taking his eyes from her. Like spring flowers. Northrop's expression was almost bored. Aye. Connell took a step closer to her, and Daisy caught the scent of him as well, of wet grass and turned earth. Not unpleasant, but nothing like the heady fragrance of Northrop. Connell's dark eyes roamed over Daisy. Frank appreciation flared in their depths. Delicious. Is she yours? he asked Northrop, as his gaze strayed to Daisy's bosom. No. The words were so flat and lifeless that she might have been a piece of misplaced furniture. The heat of Connell's body warmed her arms, and Daisy swallowed down her urge to step back. His lilting voice, holding more of the highlands than did his brother's, rumbled in her ear. Do you hear him, lass? For all your defence of him, he won't even claim you. He ran a calloused thumb over her cheek, and she fought not to wrench her head away. Does it no shame you to discover that your man is a coward? Northrop stood tall and still in the middle of the court. She shouldn't speak. She knew it was stupid to do so. But seeing Northrop surrounded by jeering fools who used the strength of their numbers to intimidate made her blood boil. Nothing about Northrop shames me. If anything, her words irritated Northrop, for his jaw tensed. A puff of air caressed her cheek as Connell laughed. <sighs> Fool girl, too blind to know real power when she sees it. Her insides went liquid as his claw slowly dragged over her jaw, not hard enough to cut, but to let her know how much it would hurt should he choose to. She held steady. I know true power when I see it. He did not miss the scathing bite of her words. The claw stopped at her jugular and pressed just a bit harder. Shall we test the theory? 
Daisy looked at Connell through lowered lashes and licked her lips in a show of nervousness, but it had the desired effect as his nostrils flared again. I hardly believe you need to prove anything, sire. He stared at her for a hard minute, and then ran a finger slowly over the swell of her bodice, as if considering what he might do with her. Northrop's voice broke the silence. I spoke to Lena. Connell's jaw clenched. Did you know? He turned away from Daisy, and her inside sagged with relief. Turned errand boy for the frozen bitch, have you? Northrop's mouth curled. Perhaps I have. Connell's hands went to his hips. Out with it then. Northrop's smile grew. Oh, I think you can imagine what she might say, brother. The entire court seemed to buzz with nervous energy upon hearing of this mysterious Lena. Whoever she was, she held a position of power. Dozens of shining eyes turned to him, waiting, it appeared, to see what their king would do. Suddenly, Connell snorted. Keep your counsel, brother. It is inconsequential to me. Northrop's mouth kicked up at one corner. I would expect not, brother. Connell returned Northrop's look, but his tone grew hard. You will cease this talk of werewolves, and if I find you anywhere near another human death, I will take your head, Ian Ranulph. Surprisingly, Ian bowed his head. As you wish, Ranulph. He was too complacent, Daisy thought with trepidation. Apparently, his brother did not know or consider Northrop's more canny tendencies, for he made a sound of satisfaction. Now that that is settled, there is one more bit of business before I'm done with ye. He turned back to Northrop. Payment for Alan. A ripple of excitement went through the hall, and Daisy's stomach clenched, for it held the taint of violence in it. Fangs lengthened, and the rangy scent of wolf grew deeper, all of it directed at Northrop. Northrop didn't flinch. Get on with it, then. As you wish. Connell's black eyes found her, sending a chill of ice down her spine. And let the lass watch. Chapter 22 It was going to hurt, hurt badly. Most men thought of torture in an abstract manner, never knowing precisely what they were in for. Ian knew, and although he'd like to think of himself as brave, a large part of him wanted to turn tail and run. He took a breath and walked calmly out of Ranulph Hall and toward the open balcony doors. Flanked on both sides by members of the pack, he couldn't see Daisy, but he knew she was there. Her scent touched the air, an elusive tease that heightened his senses. He didn't want her to see and vowed that he would not beg no matter how much he might want to. Connell followed at a leisurely clip as the party moved down the terrace steps and onto the large expanse of parkland backing the house. No trophies today, lads, he called out before slanting Ian a glance, and the crowd grumbled its disappointment. Not this time. Relief washed over Ian in a wave that dissipated too quickly. So he'd keep his appendages and eyes. They'd grow back eventually, but he was admittedly a vain man in regard to his appearance and didn't fancy the idea of walking around maimed, even for a short while. And hell, regrowing a limb hurt almost as much as the injury. Shit. He started to shake as the pack stopped and surrounded him in a wide circle. Relax. Pain grew worse with tension. Connell strolled to the centre of the circle, keeping his back to Ian. No trophies, I, but pound for pound he'll feel the force of Ranulf. He took one of the pack. Connell's black gaze scanned his subjects. When he's no willing to come into the fold as one of us. 
His eyes landed on Ian, cold and calculating. Connell knew nothing of true calculation, just brute force. Two lieutenants drew near. One ripped off Ian's shirt and the other clamped irons around Ian's wrists and neck. The heavy silver-dipped chains, designed to weaken lichens, clanked as they fell to the ground before being pulled tight by the lichens in charge of keeping him tethered. But he wouldn't fight. This was as much his show as it was Connell's. Wrists chained, he stood tall and looked around at the lichens who would mete out his punishment. Some he knew, old lieutenants of his father, who wouldn't look him directly in the eye. Others were younger and lusting for a bit of blood sport. When Ian spoke, his voice rang strong and clear. I accept the penalty for taking another lichen's life, for the law is clear. He turned his gaze to Connell and held it. The leaders of Clan Ranulf have always upheld our laws, as is their right and privilege, for who else has the strength to protect the innocent or the bravery? His voice rose on a wave of pride he didn't see coming, and his words came out a roar. De dono sum quod sum. Around him, Ranulf's men raised their fists to the air and returned the cry, caught up as he was by their clan motto. Cease, shouted Connell, his skin molting with rage. Spittle flew from his lips as he stalked forward. Will you let this bastard play you the fool and distract you with his speeches? Hear your king and show what the true power of Clan Ranulf means. On a grumble, the lichen men settled down. They knew better than to ignore their alpha's command. Connell flashed a bit of fang at Ian as he spoke. Teach him respect, lads, claws and fangs. With that chilling allowance, Ian's brother walked out of the circle and folded himself into the gilded chair a beta had set out for him. Daisy stood next to the chair watching Ian, her skin ghostly white and her eyes wide with fear. She shouldn't have to see this. It will scar her. I'm sorry, lass. It was the last thought he had before they came for him. Northrop was letting them tear him apart. Daisy pressed a shaking hand to her mouth as lichen after lichen came forward to slash, bite, kick or hit him. His body jerked with each attack, blood spraying and flesh ripping open. His face was now unrecognisable, his trousers hanging in crimson-soaked tatters. Bile rose in her throat. It was too much too much like the night of her nightmares, too much pain for one man to endure. Her stomach contracted and she swallowed hard, blinking back her tears, but she would not look away. If he had to endure, she would endure too. But why had he agreed to this? He might have run. Daisy ground her teeth as she realized that had he run, he would have had to leave her behind. The scene before her eyes blurred. The warm morning air grew thick and fetid with the stench of blood and sweat and the growing tang of aggression and excitement. There was a method to their torment. She could see that, but it was not going to last. The crowd swelled closer, the attacks becoming more brutish, one on top of the other. They'd soon break into a frenzy. She could feel it. The men had shifted at the start of the violence, their jaws elongating, mouths filling with fangs, their fingers lengthening, claws bursting from the tips. Despite herself, she pressed against the chair in which Northrop's treacherous brother lounged. She glanced at his strong profile and repressed the urge to do him violence. Don't like what you see? Connell asked, not bothering to take his eyes from the carnage. If she opened her mouth to speak, she would surely vomit. A particularly hulking lichen threw himself at Northrop, his blow opening a huge rent across Northrop's once magnificent torso. 
Northrop didn't make a noise as he doubled over and blood poured from his mouth. Daisy swayed. Let it end. Let it end. Perhaps I should have allowed them to take ears, Connell muttered. You sick bloody bastard. The man lifted a slanting brow, an expression disturbingly similar to her brother's. My parentage is secure, he said with a cold smile, but I can appreciate the sentiment. He glanced at Northrop. My brother thinks he knows me better than I him. He thinks he will not turn, that he'll take the beating, go free, and the clan will admire him for it. A disturbing chuckle rumbled from Connell's chest. He knows nothing. Connell stood and glanced at Lyle, who leaned against a nearby tree. Lyle? Though Lyle was several feet away from them, and Connell's voice did not lift beyond the level of normal conversation, Lyle stood straighter. Finish him off when he strikes, Connell said to him. Lyle gave a short nod and pushed off from the tree. No, Daisy hissed, turning on Connell. No, you said a lesson, not death. Did I? He shrugged. I can't say as I recall those words. She took a step toward him, fighting the need to hurt him. Liar! You made him believe he would go free. Och, that's not so much a lie as a tactical manoeuvre, lass. I needed him weakened. His amused expression travelled over her before dimming. Ah, but it is a shame that I'll have to be involving you. A fine bit of skirt you are at that. A look of true pity filled his dark eyes as he watched her. Normally, I don't fancy hurting females. It isn't sporting. He frowned, but then it cleared. Let us call this an unfortunate circumstance of necessity, eh? Daisy's heartbeat sped up as he stepped closer. Her answering step back had his nostrils flaring as though scenting a chase. I'll have him turned, Connell said with a jerk of his head toward Northrop, who was being kicked in the hip. Northrop's eyes were vacant, as if he'd moved his mind elsewhere. And I well know his weakness. A blow to her cheek sent her sprawling on the ground. Somewhere beyond the ringing in her ears, she heard a shout, halfway between a roar and a snarl, but then a kick to her midriff took her breath. Crawling along the ground on wobbling limbs, her mouth worked in a wordless cry, her fingers digging into the cool earth. Vaguely, she was aware of chaos breaking out around her. Lichens ran toward a commotion. Ian. She saw him in the corner of her eye. He'd risen to his feet and was straining against the chains, his eyes flashing fire. Blood streamed from his lips, thickening his words. You will not touch her. Connell grabbed Daisy by the hair, and pain exploded along her scalp as he hauled her up. Come and stop me then, brother. Northrop snarled, thrashing his arms to get free. One of the brutes holding him went flying forward from the force. The lichen struggled to get hold of Northrop as his body grew in size, ripped flesh and muscles swelling and shifting with the crackle of bones. Fur sprouted along his arms and over his chest and face. He lunged, his elongated snout snapping at limbs, and then the pack fell upon Northrop, dragging him under in a flurry of fangs and claws. Blood sprayed. He would fully turn, and they would kill him. Fury surged through Daisy's body so strong it felt like another kick to her gut. She lashed out, grabbing Connell by his soft cods and wrenching them. The man screamed high and sharp as he fell. Daisy stumbled free, the rage within her vibrating. Truly, it felt as though the ground rumbled. And then it was. It took a moment for her to realize that the lichens around her were falling, grabbing onto whatever they could to stay upright. Still hunched over, 
Connell tottered around like a drunken sailor as he glanced wildly about. Daisy turned for Northrop. Save him. Get him free. He lay in a heap as the earthquake made the others scatter. Two beasts still had a hold on him and were trying to drag him away. Daisy took a step toward him and then fell when the ground heaved up in great chunks of pungent earth. Another surge went through her. It felt like need, as strong as lust but with a painful force behind it. The ground around Northrop exploded in a spray of earth and grass as thick tree roots flew upward. One of the lichen blinked in shock as a thick tree root shot through his chest and his life ended in a gurgle of terror. The pack froze for a horrified moment, and then they flew into action, running for their lives as tree roots shot from the ground to spear or coil around their victims. Dark gratification burst through her at the sight. Run! You cannot hide! The words had barely formed in her head when a tree root sprung forth to claim Lyle, lifting him high and tossing him like rubbish. Strengthened by it, Daisy pulled herself up. Fear me. Beside her, Connell looked at her as if seeing a ghost. She smiled with grim satisfaction, the feeling of fearlessness like a drug in her veins. Run away, little wolf, or I shall kill you. Connell's eyes went round. Then he took off in a sprint toward the house, narrowly missing a tree root coming for his neck. She saw no more of him as she staggered toward Northrop's limp form. She was almost there when a hand grabbed her arm. She turned, her fist raised and ready to strike, caution be damned, when she saw the familiar face of Jack Talent. Let us collect him, he said in a rush, his green eyes flashing with terror, and leave this cursed place. Chapter 23 Agony had its own special burn, sharp and breathtaking. Ian lay as still as he could, every rock of the carriage slashed pain through him with lightning-hot intensity. His world was dark, yet loud, blood covering his eyes, blood roaring through his ears. Blood, blood, blood. He almost sang it aloud. Christ, he was becoming giddy with pain. The carriage hit a bump, and he groaned, tried to move his arm but found it bound against him. He's bleeding through the sheet! Daisy's voice, strained and rasping. He didn't like hearing it like that. Talent's dry lilt replied, Can't be helped. He's more slashed than whole. Good to know. Oh, God! God! Soft hands fluttered over his hair, the only place that did not scream for relief. So much blood, look at him, just look, his face, God! She petted him again, and he turned his head into the touch, which unfortunately made him whimper like a lad. The stroking stopped. He's going to die, isn't he? A sob. He liked the sound of that sob, bastard that he was. It spoke of regret. You're being overly dramatic, said Talent. It doesn't suit you. He's a lichen. A good thrashing won't kill him, just hurts like the devil. Aye, and didn't he know it? Simply taking a breath sent fire coursing through him. Ian concentrated on Daisy's scent to avoid the pain. Her scent was strong now, enveloping him. The scent of Daisy and woman. Despite his pain, his mouth watered. His head was pillowed on her lap, he realized. What he wouldn't give to be there when he was fully healed. He tried to open his eyes. It didn't work. A thrashing! They tore him apart! Gentle fingers ran through his hair, and he almost sobbed. It felt too good, that touch. That was the idea, wasn't it? At least they didn't take any parts, Talent observed with typical pragmatism. Stop your worrying. We wrapped him tight enough in that sheet. Won't lose any bits of loose meat that way. The hand in his hair tightened. He grunted, and the grip quickly eased, but not her voice. 
You're sick, Daisy snapped. All of you, sick. Talent let out a tired sigh. It is what it is. My lord knew what he was in for and accepted it. Why can't you? Accept torture without turning a hair? Her laughter held a touch of hysteria. How could he let them do this? What a question, said Talent. When you were like a grape ripe for the plucking from the moment Lyle put his hands on you. Do you honestly think his lordship would leave you to such a fate? I can only thank the devil that you had the sense to stay quiet. You were there? Daisy's voice grew shrill, the grip in his hair going tight again before easing over him like the flutter of butterfly wings. And you did nothing to save him. Are you cracked? You think I would have usurped his lordship's authority to save him? You think he would have accepted such an indignity? Crazy fool woman. No worse than an impudent, vain valet, if that's what you even are. No valet I know talks back in such a manner. And no lady I know goes stumbling into such trouble, yet here you are. They'd be tossing him aside to get at each other's throats in a moment, and Ian rather liked the plump pillow of Daisy's thighs. Shut up. His voice was as coarse as coal, but they heard. Oh! Hands fluttered around his hair. Northrop, don't move. We'll be home soon, and... She touched his earlobe. Past the burn of his wounds, he concentrated on her soft, warm fingertip, as if it were the only thing in the world. We'll get you well. She didn't sound so sure, but she went back to stroking his hair. Be fine, he mumbled. Speech wasn't advisable. His face moved too much. White spots exploded behind his lids and nausea pulled at his gut. When the fingers stilled, he made one last effort. Just don't stop. Her scent touched him as she leaned close. Stop what? Suddenly every gash and gouge screamed, and raw agony had him weeping inside. His throat worked. God, he wanted to scream. Razor-sharp fingers of pain dug into him, scraping his bones. He needed to go someplace it couldn't get him. To darkness. Touching me, he whispered, and then gave up the fight. Daisy stroked his hair until they reached his home. She held his fingers, the only bit of him that wasn't injured, after Tuttle and Talent unwrapped him from the bloody sheet shrouding his body. She kept a hold on his fingers, but averted her eyes when Talent lifted him into the deep copper tub in Northrop's bathing chamber, and clenched them tight when he lunged forward on a scream as the water hit him his face a horror of gashes that went bone deep. The sight made her want to sob, but she bit it back. Talent leaped forward, grabbing Northrop's bloody jaw and forcing something down his throat. Whatever he gave Northrop made the man slip back into oblivion. Tuttle cooed under her breath as she handled him with the gentle deafness of a mother. A little bit of witch's brew will make this easier. Tuttle held his shoulder as Northrop went limp once more, his broad chest sinking into the water, the wounds turning it crimson. He slid down until he was submerged to his chin. Daisy could only wonder if witch's brew was just that, or simply an opiate. She couldn't be sure of anything any more. Fresh, pure water is the best thing for a wounded lichen, Tuttle said to Daisy. Clean them up, let them heal is what they say. No one knows exactly why that is, but I am not one to question a good thing. Still, the elder woman shook her head at the sight of Northrop. If he's been worse, I've not seen it. Worse didn't begin to cover the damage. His expressive lips were torn open, exposing his teeth in a gruesome grin. His eyes were swollen shut and blackened. Gore, blood and dirt matted his hair, covered every inch of him. How? How could he heal from this? 
Talent bustled around the chamber, pulling out a pot of the same concoction Tuttle had used on Daisy before, and a stack of thick towels. You shouldn't be here. Her fingers laced with Northrop's. He said to keep touching him, and so I shall. She glared at the hostile young man before her. And if you say one more word about it, I'll thrash you. Talent scowled, and Tuttle chuckled as she poured water over Northrop's face and hair. I suspect you would at that, lass. Despite Daisy's doubts, the water was working. Before her eyes, the edges of his gaping flesh slowly began coming together. As the flesh grew, blood ran from the wounds, a gruesome sight, and yet he appeared to ease just a bit more. Daisy caressed the backs of his fingers with her thumb, soothing him in the only way she could. She hated the way his brow pinched in an expression of deep pain, and the way the corners of his mouth twitched as if repressing a scream. Part of her wanted to shake him for accepting such torture. The other wanted to crawl into the tub with him, curl around him, and cry. She did not let him go when Talent took him from the tub, dried him off, and began rubbing the ointment into his skin. The fresh scent of chamomile and lavender, with an underlying bite of tea tree, filled the air. Soothes his nerves, Talent muttered reluctantly to Daisy. Eases the itching that comes with the new skin. Skin that was covered now, not with deep rents, but with lumpy pink slashes that wept a clear liquid. Daisy kept her eyes firmly on Northrop's face. She would not dishonor his sacrifice by looking upon him in his vulnerability. Will he heal completely? It would not matter. Her regard for him wouldn't change if he remained in this scarred state. Only Northrop was a bit vain about his good looks, and it hurt her to think of him suffering for the loss of them. Of course he will, Talent said. His age and his blood will see to that. He's a Ranulf, purest blood a lichen can have. His hands worked rhythmically against Northrop's skin. Makes him strong, where an ordinary lichen would have succumbed. But his father was burned, Talent said emphatically. Fire destroys flesh, eats it, if you will. Cuts merely separate the flesh. Much easier to heal from that. This was why you did not worry, she asked. Talent set the pot of ointment aside and wiped his hands on a towel before looking at her. His green eyes were hard in the flickering lamplight. I didn't worry because worrying doesn't change a damn thing. He pulled the sheet over his master. Fate is fate. Chapter 24 Hours passed and day gave way to night. Daisy watched in fascination as Northrop slowly healed. First, only pink lines marked where he'd been abused, and then the slashes across his face faded. Presently, he was whole and breathtaking once more. Daisy's hand slid along the sweeping curve of Northrop's jaw, where the skin was as smooth as a lad's now. Down along his strong neck she went, and then back up, across the high plane of his brow. The room had grown ghostly quiet while Northrop slept, with only the occasional crack and hiss behind the grate to punctuate the silence. Before leaving them, Talent had carried his master into the bedchamber and tucked him into the massive tester bed that dominated the room. Though young and mouthy and surly, the valet cared for his master with a loyalty that required respect. He'd left her standing by Northrop's prone form, with the brusque instructions to make herself useful and rub some ointment on his lordship's face now and then. Blighter, she muttered, as she picked up the jar and dipped her fingers into the slightly greasy ointment again. The substance went on cool, but as she worked it into Northrop's skin, it began to warm. It was the same ointment that Tuttle had given her days ago, when Daisy had been bitten. Whatever the concoction was, its healing properties were beyond the pale. Tuttle had insisted that Daisy use it again on her stinging, swollen cheek. Within minutes, the pain had gone. She hadn't looked in a mirror, 
but suspected the swelling had subsided as well. Northrop did not move as she worked on him, but the tightness around his mouth eased with each pass of Daisy's fingers until finally it was gone. The bedside lamp had been turned low, and its light played over the crests and hollows of his countenance. He would never appear soft, not even in sleep. His features were too sharp, the angle of his dark brows etched into a permanent slant of concentration. Knowing he slept soundly at last, she released the tight rein she'd kept on her gaze and let it wander downward. Daisy's breath caught as she took an unabashed look at Northrop's uncovered chest. He was gorgeous, perfectly balanced between sheer strength and elegant economy. Lean, flat muscles defined the dips and planes of his torso, and rose and swelled along his wide shoulders and long arms. Gold and ivory in the low lamplight, his skin was a smooth canvas that highlighted all his glorious definition. Were it not for the gentle rise and fall of his chest, she'd think him a sculpture, Endymion, laying in wait for Cellini. Indeed, he might have been a sculpture save for the dusting of copper and bronze hair scattered along his upper chest, hair that lovingly surrounded little flat nipples of light brown. On his left pectoral muscle was a fist-sized tattoo. Daisy had heard of such things, but had never seen one up close before. Northrop's was of a black wolf's head, with De Dono Sum Quod Sum inscribed around it in bold script. Rusty memories of her Latin primer came to the fore. By the grace of God, I am what I am, she whispered. He'd shouted it earlier, and she had to smile at how very fitting the motto was. The tattoo appeared to move as he breathed with the even cadence of sleep. Her mouth went dry, her fingers curling into a fist. She would not touch it. He gods, but the sheet was too low around his waist, stopping at a line of dark auburn hair that peeked out a little bit farther with each exhale of Northrop's breath. The muscles beneath his belly button lay flat like a plate of armour above the narrow plane of his hips, the skin stretched so tightly over them that the veins stood out, one of them leading a path down below the sheet. Flush with heat, she bit her lip hard. She wanted to trace that path with her tongue and pull the sheet away to reveal the rather large bulge hiding beneath it. A delicious image, ripped in two as he tensed on a sharp breath, his eyes snapping open and his hand shooting out to grasp her wrist. She yelped as he wrenched her toward him. Daisy fell upon his chest with an undignified oomph. Northrop blinked once, then immediately his eyes cleared and he relaxed his hold. Are you well? His voice was a rasp of sandpaper, but strong. Stiffly she nodded, the shock of his sudden movement still upon her. You? He scowled as if taking stock his eyes darting over her face. I feel as though I've been used to fill a mincemeat pie. How vivid, she croaked, and unable to hold up the weight of the night any longer, she let her head fall to his shoulder with a thud. He felt as warm and solid as he looked. Beneath her, his chest shook with a small laugh. That bad? Her deep, shuddering breath was the only answer she felt capable to give. He smelled too good, of ointment and Northrop. She burrowed her nose deeper, searching for the pure scent of him alone. His fingers combed through her hair, parting the tangled curls that tumbled free now, a gentle stroke designed to comfort. He hurt you. For that he will pay. Her cheek worked against his skin as she swallowed. It is over now. Northrop made a sound of disagreement, but did not stop his explorations. You did well, Daisy girl. You stayed quiet and demure. Mostly. Daisy pinched at his side and he yelped. Of course I did, she said. His body moved as he shook his head. I should not have fought them when they came for us. 
Carefully, he touched her cheek. It gave Connell the knowledge to use you. You chose the best course with what you were given, and I'll hear no more about it. Her breath stirred the hair upon his chest, and his nipple hardened. Her finger crept closer to the little nub. Who is Lena? Beneath her palm, his heart pounded. An ally at one time. His voice was careful, quiet. Now it seems I have none. You have me. She almost said it when she felt him move and could have sworn he was smiling. His voice drifted down, and there was a definite lilt of amusement in it. Did I detect a note of jealousy in your voice just then, Daisy Meg? Yes. You detected curiosity, you arrogant sot. He grunted. Of course. A thousand pardons, madam. He did not sound conciliatory in the least. She relaxed her hand, and her fingers moved a fraction, the very tip of her nail touching the flat edge of his areola. Northrop stilled and her muscles tensed, her skin heating. She wanted to pet him, to feel the strength of his musculature and the silk of his skin. She forced herself to speak instead. What did Lena have to say to Connell? Northrop's free hand fell to her waist. He had a big hand, and it was warm as it smoothed slowly up her side, stopping short of her breast before easing back down to her hip. She closed her eyes and almost purred in pleasure. Nothing to Connell, he answered somewhat roughly. Again came that slow, easing caress that held nearly all her attention. His hand stopped. She wants me to take him from the throne. To challenge him and become the king? Northrop's grip tightened at her waist. She thinks I'll be a better leader, but I've no interest in the role. Why not? Is it not your birthright? She touched one curling auburn hair upon his chest, a light touch that perhaps he wouldn't notice, but his breath caught before he let it out slowly. I don't want to be a lichen. He said it so softly she almost didn't catch it. I want to live as a normal man. His fingertips traced the seam at the side of her bodice. Live a normal life. Normal. After what she had seen and done this night, she could see the vast appeal of normalcy. And yet when she thought of Northrop living and acting as every other man, she found herself frowning. I should think I would find you rather dull, Northrop, were you a normal man. The heartbeat beneath her ear grew to a rapid tattoo as he tensed. His fingers threaded through her hair to cup the back of her head. Gently, he held her against him. Thank you. The whisper stroked along her skin. He said no more as he continued to play with her hair. They sat as such for a long moment, until her side hurt from the pinch of her corset, and she made to rise. He stopped her with a touch to her cheek. Ensnared, she blinked down at him, aware that her mouth parted with her quickening breath, and that her skin suddenly felt too hot. The thumb at her cheek moved in a halting stroke that had her trembling. I didn't let you go, she blurted out inanely. He stilled. No, he said. No, you didn't. A smile wavered at the corners of his mouth as his gaze grew unguarded. The heat and yearning there took her breath. Suddenly, he wasn't smiling any more. His voice cracked between them. Daisy, let me. He pulled her down as he rose up. They met in a melding of lips and tongues, slow and decadent, and it sent a sigh of sweet relief through her. On a breath, he lifted her up and beside him to lay her down upon her back. His lips never left hers as he slid against her, holding her close before cupping her neck with a strong hand. Her legs were in a hopeless tangle with her skirts, her arm trapped against the wall of his chest, but her lips were in perfect accord with his. She licked inside his mouth, a warm, wet glide that uncoiled something hot and thick within her. 
Ian made a sound of contentment within his throat as he kissed her and then pulled away to look at her beneath sleepy lids. This, he whispered thickly, this is what I thought of when they had me, touching you. He kissed her again, again, tasting you. He touched her cheek, his mouth brushing over hers. You are my safe harbour. She traced the silken path of his brow with a shaking finger, then pulled him close. He was so very strong, warm, present. Holding him close, she could acknowledge how afraid she had been for him, how much she wanted him. They explored each other slowly, deeply nipping and sucking their hands, bumping as they reached for each other and held each other steady. The languid sensation made her head spin and her body grow heavy. His hand glided up her ribs to cup her breast. She arched into the touch, her belly pressing against the hard length of his cock, bunting up between them. They both whimpered at the contact, their kiss shifting its intensity. I love this gown, he murmured, licking a path across the low line of the bodice. The touch was fire along her skin. A strumpet's gown, she answered breathlessly. Precisely. He kissed the swell of her left breast. You should have one in every colour. Suckling the tender skin at the base of her throat, Ian rolled onto her, his hands at her waist, hips, rubbing, urging her on. The hard press of his body, the smooth shift of his muscles against her palm felt so good that she shook with the need for more, to rub skin to skin, to lick a path down his chest and take him in her mouth. His shoulders were granite under silk. She could write a sonnet on the beauty of his shoulders, a symphony about the bulge of his biceps. She sank her teeth into one, testing its hardness, and he groaned. Ian! She took his lips in a greedy kiss that explored his taste. He broke off with a smile. Ian, he repeated, nipping her lower lip. Finally, you call me Ian. Their eyes met, and a bolt of tenderness hit her with unexpected intensity. Took you long enough, he whispered, his hand smoothing back a curl at her cheek. He was alive and whole, and looking down at her with heat and affection in his eyes. When had he become so necessary? She could not afford necessary. Suddenly she couldn't draw a proper breath. A spike of pain shot down the side of her skull with enough force to make her gasp. Ian's brows knitted. Daisy? He touched the curve of her temple with a finger. She blinked, trying to ease the feeling away, but a film settled over her eyes, all at once too bright yet wavering. She closed her eyes against it. I, a sharp breath left her as another bolt of pain attacked her head. My eyes! He eased off of her. Your eyes. Another gentle touch. What, love? Where does it hurt? Daisy let out a frustrated breath and flung her legs over the side of the bed, an altogether undignified move as she was too far away and had to slide along the mattress. I'm sorry. I can't. I cannot do this. Ian held her shoulder as she made to leave the bed. Daisy, calm yourself. His hand lay warm and heavy, a comfort. She tried to ease it off, but he wouldn't be budged. Tell me. What is the matter? Fighting tears, she pressed a shaking hand hard against her eyes. I can't see properly. There's this blur, and she waved a hopeless hand. Lights. A migraine, he said softly. At times she forgot that he was a physician. He was very near, his arms steadying her shoulder, and she let herself rest her head on his bare shoulder. The action made her brain slosh within its bed of pain, and she hissed. Yes, she said on a breath. They come when I'm... She didn't want to talk. The pain behind her skull made her feel brittle, capable of shattering with one wrong move. Ian's arms came around her, and he pulled her close, holding her as if she were a hollow eggshell. When you are under great stress... He cupped the back of her head with his palm. 
Christ, you should not have seen what occurred this night. It is my fault. Tension rode over his shoulders, building with force until she found herself pushing at his chest with clenched fists. It is, she cried in a low voice. Of course it is. You. Her fists rubbed over his chest, half a caress, half grinding into his flesh as if to imprint herself there. Don't you ever. She broke off when he gathered her nearer, his lips grazing her temple. She gave his shoulder a light punch. No! Don't kiss me! Don't you ever do that again! Kiss you, he teased softly, in doing just that. She turned away, tears leaking out of her eyes like little traitors to her will. Let them hurt you like that! She glared up at him, but she could see only a sparkling blur of his face as if viewing him through thick bottle glass. You fight, damn you! Damn me too if it comes to that! And then she was sobbing, burrowing her head in the shelter of his chest. They tore you apart! Oh, no! His calloused palm cupped her cheek. Did you fear I'd lose my pretty face, he said, drawing out his brogue as though he knew she liked to hear it. Of course. She nudged his ribs with her fist. What else is there to admire about you? When he bent his head down to peer at her, she rested her forehead against his. Certainly not your inane conversations. Her fingers curled about his shoulders as he peppered her face with soft kisses. Or your ri ridiculous jests. He gathered her tightly once more and soothed her with gentle strokes as she cried. His chest was a fortress, his arms battlements. Her cheek pressed against the warmth of his pectoral muscle, and she heard the steady drum of his heart. Come. A tug on her bodice made her stiffen, and he uttered a short laugh. If you think I intend to offer you anything more than comfort at this moment, I fear you've greatly underestimated my sense of honour, lass. The sound of his Scottish coming out unfettered had her crying all over again, and he tisked as he turned down the light and quietly undressed her in the dark as efficient as any maid. The sheets were smooth and cool as she slid between them in nothing but her chemise and drawers. Ian followed her in and then spooned her against him. The feel of his hard body so warm and solid against her back steadied her. Be at ease now, he said on a breath as his strong fingers tunneled into her hair and dug into the tender spots along her scalp, scattering blessed relief in their wake. His dark voice drew her into dreams on a promise. I will not let you go either. In the thin hours of the night, Ian left a sleeping daisy under Talent's guard and headed for the clock tower at Westminster. Big Ben, some called it. He remembered it being built. He sprinted toward the looming tower and nearly threw himself at its limestone walls. Up he climbed, hand over foot, scaling the intricately carved edifice with ease. The wind howled in his ears as he neared the top, moving past the gilt letters along the base of the large clock face. Domine salvum fac reginum nostrum victorium primum, O oh Lord, keep safe our Queen Victoria the First. He was in no mood to think of the Queen. The thought of gaining her attention caused a fine shudder to work through him. He had turned his back on her when he'd turned his back on the clan, and he had no wish to return to that life. Only when he'd passed the bell house and reached the iron-clad spire did he slow down. He vaulted over the gilt and cast-iron railing on the topmost steeple, and sucked in a deep breath of London air, a witch's brew of scents and tastes. Nothing of the werewolf. It was as if it had been plucked from this earth, but Ian damn well knew it hadn't been. Below, the black surface of the Thames rippled like snakeskin in the moonlight. Tiny pinpricks of light marked the windows and lamps of London, a glittering web of stars in the dark. Though he was not afraid of heights, his stomach turned. 
for the temptation was there to jump. From this great height, it must be nearly like flying. His fingers curled into his palms until he felt the bite of his nails. A breeze lifted his hair as he gazed down at the river, undulating and black. To fly free. He could do it. Only he'd land, his head smashed open but still alive, unable even then to die. A choked laugh escaped him as he pictured himself lying upon the pavers like a broken marionette, forced to wait while his body slowly healed. Had it felt like flying to Macon? Macon. Blackness danced at the edge of Ian's sight before he brutally shoved the name and the feelings that came with it back into the deep, dark hole in his heart. He would not think about that. Not ever again. Ian had much practice ignoring that particular pain, so the darkness quickly passed. Ironic, because it was that adaptability that had dragged him down into a half-life of apathy. On a sigh, he moved to the edge of the tower and took a calming breath. But calm was hard to keep tonight. Restlessness had pulled Ian from Daisy's bed and out here where he could think. Inside his pocket, the moonstone stickpin lay like a ballast, weighing him down. He didn't want to look at it, or touch it, unnerved as he was by the very sight of it. The last time he'd seen his own pin, he'd been burying it with Macon. Connell had one, but he wouldn't willingly part with the piece. Why, then, was it pinned to a woman's corpse? Had Connell meant for it to be found? Was it a taunt? And if so, why? It didn't matter. Whatever Connell was playing at, he was involved in this madness, and it was a kick to Ian's solar plexus. Resignation settled in his bones. He knew what must be done, and if it cost him his soul, so be it, for he could not live this half-life any longer. But he needed a plan. He needed allies, and not the bloody SOS who would want to control him. Only one thing was certain. Daisy was his to protect until it was done. With a sharp inhale, Ian sat up straight. For the first time in years, someone needed him. The sense of purpose stirred him. He felt alive, not merely moving through each day, but alive in a way that made his blood sing. Tilting his head back, he gazed up at the moon and the lace-thin clouds that drifted in front of her glowing face. The sky behind it was so deep and close that he fancied he could sink his hand into it and pull back with inky fingertips. Alive. The wolf inside of him felt it too. Emotion, anticipation, and surprising joy welled up within with a sudden force that had him panting. He let the feeling crest and held it until his chest vibrated. As a lone wolf, he was forbidden to do it. In so doing, he would be stating his intentions to the lichen world. But centuries of instinct could not be denied. A howl tore free, rising and falling in a long wave that spoke of his return and his promise to the woman. Chapter 25 The sign on the bookshop door said closed. Daisy did not bother knocking. She was expected, so the door was unlocked. The bookshop. Ha! <laughs> Leave it to practical Poppy to pick a name for her bookshop that was utterly lacking in any lyricism, and so very... literal. As much as Daisy loved her older sister, she sometimes yearned to crack through her indomitable and proper façade. Daisy's heels clicked as she strode along the narrow hall, past the shop entrance and toward the private areas at the back of the building. She left Tuttle and Seamus waiting in the carriage, though not without a bit of fuss, for they both feared for her. They needn't. Not here. The familiar scent of wood polish mingling with book mould and linen paper touched her nose. Light slanted in from the back door window, landing in a square block of gold upon the dark wood floor. She moved through it and yanked the door wide open before slamming it behind her. 
Before her spread a little green square of a garden enclosed by the walls of surrounding buildings, a quiet oasis in the midst of the bustling city. Blinking in the brightness of the sun, Daisy lifted a hand for shade and found two sets of eyes upon her, one set gleaming green and curious, the other shrewd and brown. You look as though the very devil were on your heels, said her eldest sister Poppy. Daisy opened her white parasol, lined with copper satin to keep the sunlight out, and walked toward her sisters, who sat at the little table nestled beneath the lacy shade of a budding willow. Perhaps he is. She took her seat as Miranda set out a glass of iced tea and a plate before her. Or perhaps the devil is a woman and I am she. At that statement, she put away her parasol, helped herself to a ham sandwich, and took a hearty bite. Miranda's brow arched delicately. Care to explain? Thoughtfully, Daisy chewed and let her sisters wait, but her eyes went to Poppy, who looked somewhat hesitant. Interesting. Her eyes narrowed, and Poppy's did in return. Daisy took a careful drink of deliciously cold tea, thankful for the way it soothed her sore throat before addressing Miranda. Well, dearest, it seems strangeness runs through our family after all. No. Miranda went pale, but a smile tugged at her lips. You didn't. She leaned forward in excitement. You started a fire. No. Daisy shot a look at Poppy, who remained surprisingly quiet. Nothing quite so exotic. Dirt, she shouted, no longer able to contain her ire. Of all the gifts I could have received, I am left with dirt. She shoved back from the table and leaped up to pace in front of her shocked sisters. Panda gets to play with fire, and I get filth. How very disgusting. Have you any idea what lives in dirt? Bugs. Worms. She flung her arms up in disgust. Daisy, dearest, Miranda pleaded. Calm yourself and explain. Yes, Daisy whirled about. Of course. She stopped and clasped her shaking hands. It appears, love, that when my ire is stretched to the limit, I can make the earth move, and tree roots appear. She flung her hands once more. Honest to goodness, tree roots shot from the earth and speared people. At this, both sisters went white. Tree roots, Miranda intoned. She got up and caught hold of Daisy's arm. Sit and tell us what happened. Daisy let herself be led back to her seat. She took another sip of tea before recounting what had occurred the night before. Well, not all of it. She left out her kiss with Northrop. Miranda certainly wouldn't approve. Despite not wanting Northrop when he wanted her, Miranda fervently objected to the idea that Daisy might get involved with him, which both irked Daisy and made her love her sister for her protectiveness. It was my doing, Daisy said to them. I felt it in my bones. I caused the earth to heave and crumble. I caused those roots to burst free. It felt like want and power. She frowned, trying to explain, but Miranda nodded and clasped her hand, like a need trying to break free, and then a shiver of pleasure when it does. Daisy squeezed her fingers. Yes, exactly. They shared a look in which they both grew distressingly misty-eyed before blinking their tears away and taking a bracing breath. I thought it only me, Miranda said, after taking a moment to collect herself. Indeed. Daisy turned her gaze on a silent poppy. I thought so as well, and yet one of us appears to be not the least bit surprised. Poppy Ann Ellis Lane. She lurched forward in her seat, her fists rattling the plates upon the table as she glared at her sister. You knew this might happen. Do not try to pretend you didn't. You are the smartest of all of us, and the oldest. You knew, didn't you? Silence filled the garden as the younger Ellis sisters stared at their eldest sister.
Poppy had gone as still as the statuary gracing the four corners of the garden. She blinked back at them for one tense moment, and then inhaled sharply as if bracing herself. I knew. Two simple words and the garden erupted into a volley of shouts, Miranda's being the loudest. She stood to glare down at Poppy like an avenging angel, stray wisps of her red-gold hair stirring in the breeze. You knew, Miranda hissed. You knew how alone I felt with this burden. I felt a freak, an aberration of nature, and you knew it was not solely I who possessed strange powers. Poppy's expression remained frozen, and her eyes were hollow. It hurt me to keep quiet, Miranda, but it was not my place to warn Daisy or speak of your power unless absolutely necessary. How could it not be necessary when I was turning things to ash? Miranda shouted. If you had been seriously out of control, I would have helped you, Poppy said calmly. As it was, however, you handled the situation quite nicely. Another round of cursing broke forth, but this time Poppy's clear voice cut through it all. Sit down, the both of you. Now! Something in her tone was so like their mother's that Daisy found herself obeying, and Miranda shortly followed. Explain, Miranda said. Of course, Poppy said. You are elementals. Elementals, Daisy parroted. The sun seemed too bright, the air too hot in the face of such discoveries, but she was not inclined to break up the conversation to move indoors. Poppy's expression was serene. Beings who can control the elements. In the past, elementals were touted as witches, many of them burned at the stake. Daisy shuddered and leaned back in her seat. Witches. Lovely. Though with your temper, Panda, she sent a small smile toward her irate little sister. I can fully imagine the moniker. Miranda had clearly learned quite the number of colourful hand gestures during her time with Billy Finger, and used one then. Daisy stuck her tongue out before turning back to Poppy. How did we get this way? You inherited it from Mother. Elementals are usually women, and the trait passed on to the daughters. It was she who forbid me to speak of it unless asked. And you simply obeyed, Miranda asked even when you knew what it was doing to me. Poppy blinked. I took a vow. As first daughter, it was my duty to keep the secret. Only if you sought to do harm should I interfere. Only if you sought personal gain. You did neither, but merely sought to suppress your talent, Miranda. What good would it truly have done to tell you when you didn't even want to use it? Miranda's teeth clicked together. That statement is so utterly wrong that I don't even know where to begin. Poppy looked away first, her fierce straight brows furrowed with emotion. She was wrong, Daisy knew, but either would not admit to it, or didn't fully see the fault in her logic. Daisy's mind fairly reeled. Not just Miranda, but all of them were different, and their mother had known. She thought of her beautiful and ethereal mother, who had died giving birth to their little brother. The poor little mite hadn't lived past the first day. From the looks on her sister's faces, Daisy knew that they too thought of that devastating loss. What could mother do? A long sigh lifted Poppy's breast. Her powers were a lot like yours, actually. She could influence nature. Remember the way she had with animals? Miranda's lip wobbled. God, I'd forgotten. She used to say that she told the rats to stay out of our pantry. Her voice broke on a laugh. I always thought she was having me on. Poppy nodded stiffly. Nature gave her strength. She yearned for the countryside. She hated London. They'd lost her too early. Some days Daisy missed her so much it was an ache in her chest. And father, Daisy asked, breaking the silence. I suppose it is the practice of elementals to keep their husbands in the dark.
She glanced at Miranda. You are in trouble now, pet. Poppy's mouth thinned in clear defiance. Father did not know of Mother's talents, only of Miranda's for obvious reasons. But not of yours, I gather, Daisy supplied. When Miranda sat up straight, she gave her a repressive look. Come now, she called herself the first daughter. You can't have imagined she doesn't possess one either. Poppy actually grimaced. All mine. What is it? Miranda snapped. Poppy sighed again, and then slowly moved her hand forward. Her long, blunt-tipped finger touched the tea pitcher, pebbled with condensation as it warmed in the sun. A shiver of air drifted over the small space, ice cold and clear. Before their eyes, frost moved over the glass. Laces of ice soon covered it, and the tea within froze solid. Wow. At least that explains iced tea on a bookseller's salary, Daisy said. Might we have iced cream next time, Pop? Poppy's look was frigid. Does Winston know? Daisy asked. No, and he never will. The threat was clear and chilling. Bloody hell, Miranda muttered, still gaping at the frozen tea pitcher. Bloody hell is right, Daisy snapped, crossing her arms in front of her. You have fire, she has ice, and I have dirt. When they both stared at her, she made a noise of disgust. Fire and ice are elegant, brutal powers. I hate dirt. And really, what can one do with it? Oh, I don't know, murmured Poppy. It sounds to me as though you used it quite effectively to fell your enemies. Daisy batted back one of the curls tickling her cheek and looked away. Refusing to be persuaded, and it wasn't the mere moving of dirt, was it? Poppy said. You mentioned tree roots, which makes me believe that nature is attuned to you, as it was with Mother. She glanced at the patches of spring crocuses growing along the borders of the newly budding flower beds. I suspect you have more power than you think. Why not try speaking to the flowers? Speaking to the flowers. How very ridiculous! She glanced about her. True, each blade of grass, every flower had its own scent, which she could detect as clearly as the tea before her or the lemon cakes on the stand. If she were very still, she could hear the little flowers stirring in the breeze and the tight buds straining to break free from the willow overhead. Cautiously, she took a little breath. And let go of the strange swirling that somehow lived within her belly, a power that seemed to have always been there, had she thought to look for it. The air about the table seemed to crack and writhe with a strange hissing sound that Daisy realized with a start was the growing of things. Something brushed against her ankles, grass, grass shooting from the ground, growing high. The timid little cluster of crocuses bloomed a full, deep purple. Miranda gasped as the rose vines attached to a trellis at the back wall exploded in a riot of lush vermilion colour and sweet, tender fragrances. The garden darkened a touch, shade from the willow now in full bloom. Golden petals rained down like snow as its branches swayed in the breeze. The heady perfume of flowers and fruit thickened the air. Daisy sucked in a breath and cut the energy off. Well, now, Poppy plucked a brilliant green apple from the tree at her side. I wouldn't call that display inelegant. No, it was wonderful, Daisy retorted airily, though her insides were shaking. I shall be the belle of the garden club. Miranda chortled into her glass of tea. Daisy tapped her nails upon the tabletop, drumming out a hollow rhythm. What I don't understand is why now. Why hadn't I seen some hint of this talent before? I'm older than Miranda. Ought I not to have come into my power before her? Bloody hell! She burned father's warehouse to the ground when she was ten years old. A thoughtful expression came over Poppy's features. It usually manifests during a time of great stress. She looked at Miranda. Panda was a special case, 
for she had it as a tot. For me and others, the power made itself known when I felt great danger and the need to defend myself. Believe me, sister, Daisy said darkly, I've had need to defend myself before now. Oh, what she would have given to have used this power when Craigmore had lived. That is true, Poppy said. But you've a sunny, caring nature, dear, despite your efforts to shock. Daisy resisted the urge to squirm, but Poppy continued in her maddeningly pragmatic tone. Surely there were some signs. Daisy thought on it. Craigmore loved orchids, she said slowly. Somehow they always died immediately, shriveled up in their pots. And then there was the ivy. She bit back an evil smile. Remember how thickly it grew over our house? It covered Craigmore's study windows no matter how many times the gardener tried to rein it in. Daisy laughed lightly. I remember thinking, good, grow so thick that he never sees sunlight. And it did. She sighed. But nothing like what happened last night. Many elementals do not manifest their powers unless someone they love or care for deeply is in danger, Poppy said. Again, two sets of eyes pinned her to the spot with their piercing stares. Her cheeks heated. You were defending Northrop, Miranda said in a hollow voice. Do you? You couldn't possibly. Care for him, Daisy supplied with a tinge of bitterness. Would it be so very surprising? He is kind and charming. Never mind that he was being torn apart, his flesh cut to shreds because he was keeping me safe. Her chin lifted a touch. Is it so very wrong of me to want to protect him? To feel gratitude? Miranda's eyes remained watchful. Is it gratitude? Or are you falling in love with the man? Daisy crossed her arms over her chest. I do not see why it would concern you if I was, which I am not. Because he will break your heart. Likely he is toying with you to... Her mouth snapped shut, a look of horrified embarrassment widening her lovely eyes. To make you jealous, Daisy finished for her. She hated saying the words aloud, but they were hovering in the air between them regardless. After all... Why would he want me when he's seen you? Miranda paled. I never said that, or thought it. I only meant that he has a history of dallying with women. No, sister, it was precisely what you meant. Daisy drew away from the table and stood on weak limbs. Her throat was beginning to hurt most dreadfully. I cannot fault you for thinking so. You are quite the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. Why should Northrop want another? Daisy held no illusions as to her own appeal. She was pretty, very pretty, but her attractiveness was, as her husband had constantly reminded her, common, lusty. She'd never told a soul how she'd overheard Craigmore offering for Miranda and being forced to make do with her when her father refused to part with his favoured daughter. I wanted the beauty and I got the barmaid, good for nothing more than being passed around. Why should Northrop think any different? Daisy, Miranda said softly, don't say that. I simply do not trust his motives. I never have. He did everything he could to drive a wedge between me and Archer. I cannot speak to Northrop's actions in regards to you and Archer. Daisy gathered her parasol and gloves. She needed to leave. The garden was too small, too overladen with damned flora, thanks to her. But I do know this. The man you do not trust saved my life, repeatedly, and suffered for it. Might we give him that small credit? Miranda's lips pursed, but she gave Daisy a stiff nod. Daisy took a breath and stood. He has been a friend to me. The word friend felt wrong on her tongue but she forged on. I'm not falling in love. I may act foolish now and again, but I'm not a fool. A lie. Because she knew she was the worst sort of fool. All right.
right, Ian said when he could no longer keep himself from asking the question. Where is she? It irked him that he had to ask talent. It irked him that he'd woken up in his bed alone. He'd had plans. Plans that included sinking into a soft, warm woman blessed with a particularly tart tongue. After returning late in the night to slip back into bed with her, it had been the only thought on his mind, and he'd fancied she would finally be compliant. Ah、oh、well, the best laid schemes and all of that. Talent slanted him a glance as he helped Ian into his morning coat. Despite the growing craze for the sack suit, neither man found the cut appealing. The shapeless style had no elegance about it. In that, at least, they were of an accord. On other things, however, she has ensnared Tuttle in her little web," said Talent shortly. They set out at daybreak. To where I cannot say, or care. The rest of the sentiment was clearly written over his expressive face. Ian craned his head around. With Tuttle, two women out alone with that beast on the loose. He tensed. Ready to stalk out of the house and hunt the blasted woman down, perhaps take Daisy over his knee. The thought held appeal in more ways than one. The woman had the most lusciously round ass. Hold your water, Talent adjusted the line of the suit shoulders. They took Seamus with them. Ian grunted. Seamus was a strong lad. All right, a brute. Easily six and a half feet of pure muscle and speed, the Lycan stable master was as good protection, if not better, than talent. Tension eased a bit in Ian's gut. They'd be safe with Seamus, but the scowl remained as talent fussed about with his cravat. Ian's skin itched and felt too tight for his frame. He couldn't credit it entirely to the healing. She was out of his sight, and he—he he didn't like it. Did they say when they would return? At this, Talent's open features pulled into a sneer of disgust. Henpecked already, are we? Ian could only grin. What did a boy know of it? Only a boy would view anticipation as a trap. Despite various aches and pains that lingered, Ian felt a certain lightness in his chest. So she hadn't been there in the morning. There was always later. Always that taut pang that hit him the moment they set their eyes on each other. Always that catch of his breath right before he took her in his arms. Ought a man ignore such pleasures simply because the rest of the world was falling down around him? After nearly a century of being numb, he rather thought not. He deserved a bit of pleasure. Damn it all! Talent gave Ian's sleeve a tug that was a tad too efficient. And Ian turned his attention back to him. You don't like her. Talent's shoulders hunched as he kept about his business. Ian laughed and inspected the sets of cufflinks lined up in their case like good little soldiers. Admit it, you'll be no use to me until you do. A set of garnet studs winked in the sunlight. Perfect. I won't have you brooding when there's work to be done. Talent swatted Ian's hand away from the studs and plucked up a pair of gold and black enamel links, stylized into small skulls. Gems for night, gold for day. Deftly, he took hold of Ian's cuff and pinned a skull in place. She's a distraction. Of course she is, Ian said. The best sort. Look what trouble that's given you so far, his valet muttered. Ian knew that talent liked his life set up in well-ordered categories, and one should never bleed into the other. Ian's hand dropped, and the other was grabbed. You don't like anyone who takes attention away from you, Ian countered. Had you your way, the whole household would revolve around your dramas. I've never seen a vainer man pretend to be so humble. Talent snorted. You possess a mirror, eh? Ian had to concede the point as Talent brusquely began brushing his coat. Be one thing if you'd tap her and have done with it. The brush whacked his shoulder. Instead, you're having conversations. Talent drew the word out as if tasting something foul, and walking around like a barmy nabob with your head in the clouds and a grin on your face.
Another whack found him between the shoulder blades. What's it done but bring trouble to our door? You could have taken all four of those wolves without breaking a sweat, were it not for worrying over her. Let's be done with her, I say. Get her out of the house and... Ian caught Talent's wrist mid-strike. I believe we can both concede that my propensity for picking up strays has yet to be regrettable. He let his gaze bore into the lads. Pray, do not give me cause to think different. The young man's eyes narrowed into green slits, and Ian leaned in a touch. Whatever your feelings for Daisy may be, put them away. You will watch over her as instructed. He did not bother to add a consequence for failure. There was no need. The thing was either done or it was not. Talent held his gaze for a second more and then broke it. Talking like a proper gent again, are we? When Ian let him go, Talent straightened his own cuffs with care. Ian grabbed his walking stick and headed for the door. Least you're thinking clearly now, Talent said. At that, he trailed off with more mutterings under his breath. Pausing to inspect his form in the mirror, Ian remarked more from idleness than true curiosity. Hmm? I said she's right about one thing, Talent answered in an overloud voice. You get your cock up, and your Scots goes hanging out in the wind. Pretty soon, all one I'll have to do is look for the saltire flapping over your daft head, and your brother will know when to strike. Ian gave the boy a warning glare before striding out of the room, but Talent's irritating voice chased him down. She makes you weak, Ian. Chapter 26 Death lived in this dark alley. Winston could smell it long before he approached. A London particular had drummed up early in the morning, and now the fog was thick as pudding and just as murky, despite the noonday sun that must be burning overhead. Their lamps did little more than reflect the light back into their eyes, turning the fog around them into a living, writhing thing. So they turned them down low and stumbled along. They ought to have turned back, or perhaps have waited until the fog lifted, but the chase was upon them, and Winston sensed its end. He needed to see this done. Even so, he pulled out his revolver and had it at the ready as they drew closer. Sheridan's voice was a thin echo in the murk. We ought to have brought back up. Hmm. The dark outline of a building emerged, its windows and doors shut tight against visitors. From there came the foul, overwhelming stench of rot, of death. I know that smell, sir. Unfortunately, Winston did too. A body's in there. The younger man moved closer to Winston's side. Hmm. Was it Ned Montgomery's? A man otherwise known as the Perfumer. Word on the street had it that the Perfumer hadn't been seen in at least a week. Was it he inside, or one of his victims? Backtracking, prodding, and pondering had finally brought to light that the man had a personal connection with both the victim Mary Fenn and the missing Lucy Montgomery. The scuffle of Winston's shoes sounded overloud in the quiet. Somewhere beyond came the steady drip of water and the discordant strains of a violin, perhaps. Sheridan's breath chuffed at his ear. Doesn't feel right, sir. Feels like a trap, it does. Cold danced up Winston's spine at the words, and the feeling of being watched oiled over him. His fingers tensed around the gun. Hmm. Hmm. Sheridan glowered at him, no more than a bit of eyes and a flattened mouth in the swirling stew of fog that danced over them. Is that all you're going to say? Winston held up a hand for silence, his eyes searching the alleyway from whence they'd come. Mud-brown fog seemed to part and close as though breathing them in. His ears filled with the sound of his pounding heart and each laboured breath he took. Slowly he cocked his gun, the click like a thunderclap in the quiet. Beside him, Sheridan moved to do the same, 
when a figure burst through the fog, a snarl of rage and igniting sheer terror in Winston's gut even as the thing slammed into them. Sheridan's shout was cut short, his copper-bright head snapping back as he flew into the side of the old shack. The wall cracked on impact. Winston went tumbling, a shot going off wild and wide. Scrambling back on his ass, he lifted his gun to aim. A blur came at him, dark and hulking, and then white-hot pain sliced through his cheek with one blow. The gun clattered to the ground. Blood poured into his mouth, filling his nose. He retched, his arm coming up in defense as another blow fell, cutting him to the bone. Screams. He heard his own. His world slowed to jerks and thumps upon his body as the thing came at him. Through the blood he saw it, the long jaws, flashing fangs, hands, half human, half beast, a wolf, and a man. Werewolf. The word popped into Winston's head like a nightmare as he slammed down against the wet, packed mud of the alley. The beast lunged, a killing blow, its mouth open wide with fangs and fetid breath, ready to tear his throat out. And then there was only air. The form of a man was before him, grasping hold of the beast with inhuman strength. In a haze of red blood, Winston saw the man lift the beast high and toss it. A yelp rang out, and another as the man moved off. The sound of him beating back the beast, clear, despite the ringing in Winston's ears. Blood bubbled in his throat and poured hot down his chest and between his legs, his life's blood slipping away. It numbed him and made his eyes want to close. Wouldn't want to lose mother over this. A deep voice touched with ice. Then something felt his neck. He hadn't the strength to look. He was too heavy too cold. Arms lifted him, as if he were a child. He forced his eyes open and came face to face with an angel. It must be so. The man's skin glowed with silver light as if he were made of ice and glass, inhuman and... Christ, were those wings? His vision dimmed. The feeling of being borne up, of bobbing in the wind, made his head light and his wounds scream. A great whooshing sound filled his ears. He chanced to glance and saw only fog speeding past, and the sculpted, icy profile of a man who looked oddly familiar, as did his charm. Despite his pain, everything in Winston focused on the silver charm pinned to the man's lapel. He knew that charm. With the last of his strength, Winston grabbed hold of it and tore it free, the metal cutting into his palm. Then he let the darkness have him. It pulled him down into an eternal rest, and he found he welcomed the embrace. Daisy was already coming in as Ian strode down the stairs toward the main hall. He paused mid-step, overwhelmed by the sight of her looking so sunny and fresh, a true flower with her bright hair curling in profusion around her face. She noticed him in the next instant and stopped short, her cheeks flushing as their gazes locked, and then her lids lowered to hide whatever it was she felt. She makes you weak. His hand curled round the balustrade. Part of him feared he might careen down the stair and fall flat on his face before her. Christ, he didn't like the sensation. But Daisy her locks ablaze in a nimbus of gold from the light pouring in through the window, was a sight from which he could not turn away. He had hated seeing her fear last night. He hated that this thing wanted her. Mine. A ridiculous sentiment, given that his heart could not afford to claim her, but one that wouldn't go away. You're going out, she said first, her voice music in the quiet of his house. Seems you've already been. Damn, but he sounded unhinged, affected. Aye, she made him weak to be sure, but alive. So very alive. I went to visit my sisters. Her eyes clouded for a moment. We meet on Tuesdays for breakfast. 
He took the last few stairs at an easy pace and came to stand in front of her. The sweet scent of her, untainted by perfume, enveloped him, and he forced himself to speak lightly. Are you well? Yes. She gave him a slight, practiced smile. My headache is gone, and Tuttle's potion patched me up quite well. Gently he touched her temple, not missing the way she stiffened. The reaction slashed into his heart, but he forged on. I'm glad. He let his hand drop. However, I was referring to what you saw. Her jaw tensed, but she met his eyes with an even gaze. That was horrid. But you are healed, so I shall not dwell on it. The fingers of a memory pulled at the edges of his mind, of the earth quaking and men screaming. He'd been too lost in pain to remember it clearly. Perhaps he'd been hallucinating at that point. As neither Daisy nor Talent remarked upon it, he figured it must be so. But he'd been close, too close to fully turning, and that scared the hell out of him. She makes you weak. It pains me that you had to witness it, he said softly. It pains me that you had to endure it, she said just as softly. Quite suddenly, all he wanted to do was kiss her, to taste her flavour, lose himself in the decadence of her succulent mouth once more. His flesh tightened with need, need enough to make him lean toward her, but her expression cried out, Stay away! So he stepped back and put a distance between them. Need you rest now? he asked, or would you like to come out with me? Her eyes widened as she blinked up at him in clear surprise. Where are you going? He smiled at her, a devious grin he knew she wouldn't be able to resist. Somewhere proper ladies would not dare venture. He offered his arm. Somewhere foul and most likely dangerous. A smile crept over her features, turning her from lovely to breathtaking. Oh, la! If it were truly dangerous, you'd endeavour to keep me away from it, Northrop. But she put her slim hand on his arm anyway. The contact felt a balm to the irritation that had been plaguing his inside since he'd woken to find himself alone. How did she manage it? To always say and do the exact thing to keep him going. True, but that wouldn't stop you from trying to follow, now would it? Her smile was the sun itself. How very clever of you to realise you've been bested and admit defeat now. Although he laughed, his heart clenched with sudden brutal force, for he feared truer words had not been spoken. Chapter 27 Tell me about her. Daisy's soft voice cut into Ian with the stealth of a switchblade, as they waited for a skiff to take them to their destination. Standing beside her on the wooden docks, Ian tensed. Talking about her was the last thing he wanted to do. The very idea made him sweat. Her who? Lovely response. Made him sound like a bloody night owl. The corner of Daisy's succulent mouth lifted, but the smile didn't reach her eyes. The woman whom you seek in red-headed whores... Jesus, where was this coming from? What did she want of him? I no longer seek horror's love. Not when what he wanted stood less than a foot away. Again that look, pitying, accusing, and sad. It made his insides itch and his collar go tight. Ian, she said softly, do not play games now. Ian... The sound of his name on her lips surely did make him weak. Blue eyes pinned him. Was it truly another? Or is it... Is it my sister whom you think of when you bed them? Right. She'd been visiting with Miranda just now. Lovely. He must have scowled, for Daisy made a furtive move, as if to place a hand on him in placation. I will not judge you for falling in love with her, she said quickly insanely. Who wouldn't love her? I love her to distraction myself. But after last night... White teeth dug into her bottom lip, denting it, but she faced him without flinching. 
I need to know. I won't be a substitute for what you cannot have, especially not if it is my sister's shadow you mean to place me in. I will not be that woman, Ian. Brave, proud lass. Something inside his chest shifted. And if I should tell you that you are more than what I craved before, he asked, that you are not a substitute or distraction, but a balm, would you believe me? or accuse me of saying what I would in order to get you into my bed. Her expression grew pinched. You cannot deny that is the tactic most men would employ. So I am buggered no matter how I answer. She flinched. When he spoke, his voice came out rougher and angrier than he'd like, for he could see her skittishness. There is only one thing you truly need to know about me, Daisy Meg, and that is that I will not lie to you. Ever. His fingers curled over the silver wolf's head of his walking stick. I told you before that it was not your sister who made me want to seek ginger-haired lasses. That was truth. She nodded with a jerk of her head, but her eyes did not clear. But you did fancy her. Oh, for God's sake! He threw a hand up out of sheer irritation, and a passing dock worker flinched. The man gave Ian a wide berth as he walked around them, and Ian lowered his voice. Yes, I fancied her, but it wasn't what you think. Surrounded by swirls of fog, her heart-shaped face glowed like a fine pearl. What do I think? That I was so beguiled by her beauty that I lost my mind to it. He made a sound of disgust. Well? She frowned. I'll tell you and then we'll have no more talk of your sister. I'll not have her standing between us, eh? Again she nodded stiffly, but she'd flinched at his use of us. Out of surprise or distaste? His hand shook as he raked his fingers through his hair. He wouldn't lose her to this, not this. Damn Miranda, and damn himself too for letting the world believe she meant more to him than she did. Part of it was her looks, her ginger hair and green eyes, mostly, mind. I've had plenty of beautiful women in my life, enough not to be turned into a panting pup by appearance alone. My God, it wasn't redheads that plagued his dreams now, not even a little. He took his eyes from Daisy's golden locks. Her voice was hesitant, unbelieving. If it wasn't her appearance, then what? Thick, cold fog seemed to creep down his throat and smother his nostrils. He struggled not to pull at his collar. She was a supernatural, like me. Around them, commerce teemed with activity. Dock workers and sailors, street walkers and pickpockets went about their daily lives. Here, standing beside a wooden piling, it was just him, just her. Most humans would likely think I was mad if I revealed my true self. I thought she would understand. I found the notion of not having to hide what I was attractive. And she was loyal. So very loyal to Archer. Daisy was silent for a moment, her head tilted slightly as though she were contemplating, which she gathered she was. How could she not ponder on his humiliating confession of neediness? Again came the feeling of suffocation, the air too heavy, the smell of brine and fish overwhelming. His hand convulsively clutched his thigh. Daisy saw the action. If not Miranda, then who is the red-headed woman you seek? He hated the softness in her voice most of all. Perspiration bloomed along his upper lip as he stared at the mucky brown water of the Thames. When her pointed silence grew unbearable, he made himself say it. My wife, he swallowed. Una. Saying her name was akin to calling forth her ghost, and his hackles rose in defense. Under the cold eye of scrutiny, Ian didn't really know what he was after when he bedded women who resembled her. Forgiveness? Another chance? Revenge? His thoughts were muddled, and part of him resented Daisy for making him examine his motivations. Daisy's eyes were wide when he looked back at her. 
hadn't expected a wife, had she? Perhaps she thought him incapable of love. If only that were true, it would have saved him much. He almost laughed, save his chest hurt too much. Not to worry, she's been dead some seventy years. Daisy's bottom lip pushed out. I did not think you had her tucked away somewhere while you dallied about, if that is what you are implying. Didn't you? No. You were too honourable to treat any woman so poorly. You are the only one who seems to view me as honourable, he said with an unfortunate rasp in his throat. Her expression did not alter but stayed hard, piercing. What happened to her, Ian? I thought I could stand it, Ian. I was wrong to hope for the best. They'd both been wrong to hope. His nails turned to claws, catching on the fine weave of his trousers. She died. How? You destroy everything, you and your beast, just by being. His jaw clenched. For a moment, he wanted Una in front of him so badly he could taste it. Of a broken heart. Oh, yes, oh, he thought with a silent shout. He saw Daisy's frown of disappointment and wanted to punch something. He took a ragged breath and then another. Did you... did you no longer fancy her then? His laugh was light, sardonic, yet it burned like acid in his throat. Who said I was the one to break her heart? God, if only Una were here, he would put his hands around her slender neck and wring it. Possession of an excellent sense of smell was not always a boon. Beautiful in its own way, the River Thames was nevertheless a foul place to be. Overcrowded on the dock, with the sweating bodies of men labouring to lift and transport huge crates, as well as the riff-raff of hawkers, vendors, pickpockets and cutthroats, and the halls who serviced them all. But on the river, well, one could not get away from the thick, burning stink that came from the millions of gallons of raw sewage that emptied into it twice daily, nor the briny dampness that clung to one's hair and clothes, a fact that had Daisy breathing through her mouth and resisting the urge to burrow her nose in the folds of Northrop's coat. It couldn't be any better for Northrop, whose senses were no doubt stronger than hers, but he sat erect and alert as their hired skiff bobbled across the dark, glossy waters toward a ramshackle-looking barge moored near the Waterloo Bridge. Only a certain tightness around his eyes and nostrils betrayed that he too was suffering from the smell. At some point, Northrop had quietly taken her hand in his, pulling it close. He had yet to give it up. Now and then he would idly play with the tips of her fingers in a gesture that she realized was subconscious. She had yet to take her hand back, for the touch left her feeling warm and cosseted. Were she to concentrate too greatly upon the sensation, she'd crawl into the circle of his very capable arms and nuzzle his well-formed mouth, kiss and suck those lips until she forgot everything. A shiver let through her. God, he'd been delicious last night, and she wanted more, always more, which was insanity. A wife. He'd had a wife, one that he had obviously loved. She had seen that much in his eyes, a wife whose ghost he sought in so many others, and yet the woman had her heart broken by another. Daisy had wanted to ask by whom and why, but instinctively she knew he would have cracked if she'd asked more just then. She wouldn't do that to him, because she cared. She needed to end this thing between them. Now, before she sank in too deep. Weary and confused, she turned her head to find the haggard-looking man who rode them staring at their clasped hands. The muscles along the back of her neck tightened. Words such as strumpet and Jezebel came to her mind unbidden, filling her with thwarted rage. Why was it that her affection for men, her need, was so very vile, while a man's was simply touted as natural. Northrop felt her tension,
for he looked down at their linked hands as if suddenly aware of them. His brows drew together in a puzzled frown, and then his nostrils flared, and he brought her hand against his flat stomach. His blue gaze settled on the man before them. I don't recall paying extra for the scenic route, Clive. His expression, for all its outward pleasantness, held a hard glint of warning. Clive flinched and put his legs into the next row. The oars slapped through the brown water and the skiff cut into the light wisps of fog with a smooth whoosh. Scenic route's free for favoured customers, Governor. Northrop flashed a set of even, sharp teeth. Just get us there before I lose my breakfast. Clive cackled with good nature. Never was a good waterman, was you, my lord? It was then Daisy truly noticed the grey cast in Northrop's skin. But it was of little matter, for the dark, hulking shape of the barge now loomed before them, the craft rocking gently against the slow-moving waters. Clive manoeuvred them to the side of it, where its hull spread out over the water in a wall of dull, black-painted wood. Barnacles and slick algae clung to the old wooden vessel, various creaks and groans and ominous sound among the clangs and whistles that rang out over the river proper. A ladder, made of greying rope and dubious-looking slots of weathered wood, dangled over the side, and Daisy mentally cursed the fashion for narrow skirts. She was grateful that Northrop went up first, for the idea of stepping onto the ghostly craft alone did not appeal. His step was light and sure, and he soon disappeared over the side. After a moment, his head popped over the edge, and he gave her an encouraging smile. Up with you, old girl, or risk missing out on the fun. Hands on hips, she glared. Call me old girl again, and I'll leave you here. Northrop merely winked. I'm certain Clive would be most willing to give you another scenic tour of the Thames, wouldn't you, Clive? Twill be my great pleasure, my lord, Clive called back, his bleary eyes alight with the prospect as he eyed Daisy. Northrop held out a hand. Glaring promised murder, Daisy grabbed the ladder. With Clive holding the bottom and Northrop calling down various cheeky suggestions, she managed it to the top and despite wanting to kick him rather badly, she happily accepted Northrop's warm hand and stumbled onto the abandoned deck. There's no one here, she said, allowing him to draw an arm about her waist and hold her close. The dank air was cooler on deck, a chill that seemed to run over her and coil about her ankles. A growl sounded deep in Northrop's throat, and he raised his voice, his gaze not on hers, but on the empty deck. Oh, there is someone here, and if they've a mind to keep their throats intact, they'll leave off. On that rather odd request, the air about them stirred, and suddenly it was warmer. Making a sound of annoyance, Northrop led her forward, their steps hollow against the damp wood as they went to the captain's cabin. The door opened easily, and Daisy found herself stepping into a riot of colour and light, Saffron silk damask lined the walls that glowed like fire in the light of a dozen Moroccan lamps. Her footsteps were muted as they moved over jewel-toned carpets made in the east. Before her lay a great table of golden ormolu, on which a lavish buffet had been spread. The foul scent of the river receded in favour of roast beef and hot rolls. She could not help but blink in stupefaction. Lord Northrop came a deep voice from the far end of the room. Precisely on time, as always, and you've brought a guest. It was only then that she noticed the man lounging in a throne-like black chair inlaid with mother of pearl. The man himself was as stunning as the room, his caramel-coloured skin light compared to the shining raven hair that rose from his high brow to flow like ink around an exquisitely carved face. He turned his eyes to her, and a little breath left her. They were eyes of the palest green jade that seemed to glow with an inner light. Northrop heard the sound, and his grip on her waist tightened a fraction. She might have laughed at the possessive gesture. Certainly the man before her was handsome, but there was a coldness in him, an oddness that left her feeling on edge. 
The man seemed well aware of the effect his appearance had on the uninitiated, but the look in his eyes was weary and resigned, as if he took no joy from it. Daisy was left with the oddest feeling that he resented his own beauty. He wore not the attire of a proper modern gentleman, but something out of the previous century. Blue satin breeches, a lacy jabot at his throat, and a frock coat of aquamarine satin embroidered with tiny chartreuse dragonflies. His voice was smooth and welcoming as he stood. Welcome to the Marietta, madam. He bowed with grace before gesturing to the seat beside him. Please, do me a great honor and join me for a bit of refreshment. His words ran together in a thick syrup of sound, the lilt in them foreign yet pleasing. An American southerner, if Daisy had to guess. Famished, she moved to accept the seat to which she gestured, but Northrop put a staying hand on her arm. I think not, Lucian. Northrop's mouth twisted wryly as he glanced down at Daisy. Many an unfortunate innocent has sat down to sup with a gym, never to get up again. Northrop drew out a chair for Daisy decidedly away from Lucian, before sitting in the one Lucian had offered to her. Poison or sleeping draughts are the most loved weapons. Never share a meal with the desperate Jim, Moira, or risk it being your last. Lucian laughed at that, a deep rumbling sound that unnerved her, despite its warmth. I am greatly aggrieved at the charge, Ian. His smile was the uncoiling of a snake as he took his seat, even if it is true. A Jim? Daisy asked finding her voice at last. Lucian's strange green eyes settled on her, and in the candlelight they seemed to glow. Gim, short for ghost in the machine, ma chère. She turned to Northrop, who, for all his talk of poisoning, settled back into his seat with casual grace. Yes, a gim. It is what we came to see. Home. Lucian's drawl though still mellow, had a bit of steel beneath it when he addressed Northrop. If you intend to come for a visit, Ian, I expect a measure of politeness. Northrop inclined his head, all sense of play having fled from his expression. Quite right. A thousand pardons, I forget myself. He placed a hand upon Daisy's forearm. Daisy, may I present Mr. Lucian Stone, formerly of New Orleans, Louisiana, now leader for the London faction of the Gims. Lucian gave a stately nod as Northrop continued. Lucian, may I present the lovely widow Craigmore? Lucian finished for him. Your paramour of late, if gossip is to be believed. When Daisy sat up in ire, he smiled, though, according to my sources, we are not quite there as of yet, are we, my dear? I expect you to play nice as well, Lucian, Northrop warned. Hmm. With a languid hand, Lucian picked up a glass of red wine and took a long swallow, somehow managing to make it look delicious to Daisy's parched mouth. Certainly, mon ami. She rested her hands in her lap for fear of reaching out for the wine. If the two of you have finished baiting each other... Would one of you tell me what or who is a ghost in the machine? Lucian set his wine down. It is quite a tale, as tales go. He plucked an icy-looking grape in his mouth and sucked it dry with relish. Daisy's mouth watered. There are, he continued, certain individuals who possess a great desire for life. Unfortunately, circumstances never kind, and their life ultimately ends. Doesn't it for everyone? Lord, but the grapes looked refreshing. He took another one. One would think. However, these individuals refuse to go gently into that cold night, as it were, and so they wait, without a body to warm them, a soul drifting in search of a home. When lo and behold, this poor, lost spirit finds an opportunity. A dying body, Northrop put in, his eyes narrowing on Lucian as the man licked up another succulent grape. Yes, said Lucian, a perfect home, 
for the body is soon to be vacated. And so, Northrop continued, this spirit pushes out the rightful spirit of the dying body and takes possession. Crassly put, but accurate, Lucian toyed with the stem of his wine glass. But there is a problem. The body is still dying, Daisy said. The story had set her heart to a slow, hesitant rhythm and lifted the little hairs along the back of her neck. He beamed. Exactly. Fortunately, with every problem comes a solution. For upon possession, if the guards are smiling down, Northrop's snort was ignored, a being appears. Lucian took another drink, and Daisy swallowed, mimicking the action and wishing the wine was sliding down her throat. Northrop's hand fell upon hers. The stern look in his blue eyes had her sitting back. He calls himself Adam, Lucian said. As he ate from the tree of knowledge, and in so doing learned how to create his own beings, Adam will give the spirit the home it craves, restoring the dying body and turning it into a perfect, ageless shell. You mean, Daisy swallowed, you are a spirit using the body of another. His smile was all teeth. In the flesh, he chuckled, and a rather lovely body at that. Wouldn't you agree? Daisy pursed her mouth, but he kept grinning. You should have seen my birth form, sweetness. It was plain, odd, and gangly, the crowning glory of breeding cousin with cousin for generations. He gave a little bow with his head. I was the very rich, very spoiled son of very white, very ugly planters. Another grape disappeared through his full, beautiful lips. Oh, how they would roll over in their graves to learn that I now inhabit the body of a quadroon whore. Perhaps they would think you fortunate for a second chance at life, Daisy murmured. Doubtful, Cher. One must not overlook the very real price to pay for this second chance, as you put it. His green eyes iced over. The spirit must procure other bodies for Adam. And if the spirit does not... Oh, but he must, for Adam builds in a rather clever fail-proof. At that, Lucian undid the middle two buttons of his shirt and parted the linen. Good God, Daisy breathed, holding her own chest for the sight painter. Embedded within the centre of his chest lay a little glass window framed in gold, through which, beneath the cage of bone, blue veins and flesh pumped a golden heart, a miracle of clockwork gears and moving pistons. Having seen a man merged with a wolf, Daisy knew the impossible possible. It still did not prevent her from leaning forward, her hand rising as if to touch the little window. She curled her fingers into a fist at the last moment, realizing the rudeness of the gesture. How many goodly creatures are there here? she quoted softly. He gave her a knowing smile as he buttoned his shirt. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it, he said, finishing the quote for her. Knowledge is a wonderful thing, is it not? You see, my dear, if the ghost who now drives the machine should fail to comply to his maker's wishes, his heart will stop, and the machine works no more. Is it worth it? she asked, to murder innocence in return for a life of servitude? The corners of his eyes crinkled. Oh, now we've misled you, Northrop and I. We need not resort to murder. The dying are plentiful, especially in a city such as London. However, one occasionally grows weary of the search and may, if tempted, take an easier route in procurement. With a lazy sigh, he poured himself more wine, sending forth a bouquet heavy with notes of currant and black cherry. And we mustn't forget the certain, shall we say, benefits one acquires. He turned his gleaming eyes upon Northrop, which presumably is the reason you are here. Releasing his proprietary grip on Daisy's arm, 
Northrop reached into his breast pocket to pull out the unicorn stick pin he had found in the perfumer's shack and passed it over to Lucian. I found this pin to the bodice of a dead woman in Bethnal Green. A lovely piece. Lucian swirled the pin between his fingers, making the unicorn dance. But I needn't tell you what it is. Northrop scowled at the pin. No. Daisy leaned closer to peer at the little pin. Perhaps you could tell me. The lion and the unicorn are the monarch's symbol, Northrop said. Daisy nodded. The lion for England, the unicorn for Scotland. Aye, but what you do not know is that upon ascension to the Ranulf throne, the British monarch presents a pin such as this to the Ranulf king as a symbol of good faith. She blinked. Does the Queen know? About lichens? The Ranulfs are closely tied with the royal family. We share a direct blood tie with Queen Mary of Scots. His expression turned wry. Queen Victoria knows of us, the royals always have, and though the British monarchs rule Scotland in the human world, the Ranulfs rule the subjects of the lichen world. Northrop, rather than looking smug, seemed to flush at this. His lids lowered and he studied the place setting before him. Recognising our ties is essential to maintaining civil human lichen politics. My father passed his pin on to me before he abdicated his throne. Lucian smiled widely, much like the cat that ate the cream. I take it this one is not yours. No. Northrop's tone was final. I can only assume it is the one Connell received from Queen Victoria. Making a steeple with his fingers, Lucian's expression turned inward. I've heard tell that Connell is on the outs with Victoria. He gave Northrop a stiff smile. She always liked you better. It's no secret that Victoria was put out when you did not become the Ranulf. That has stuck in Connell's craw. True, Northrop said. Since I refused the throne and he took it, Connell has hated me. Now a pen that would implicate both the house of Ranulf and the Queen has found a murder scene. So, said Lucian, you believe Connell might be stirring up trouble and letting the werewolf live to bedevil the Queen? Northrop's jaw tightened. Last night, I was hit by Ranulf darts, as was the wear. Daisy and I were taken to Ranulf House. Connell feigns ignorance of the wear, but I have little reason to believe him. Either he is taunting the Queen or me or both. I do not know. He picked up the delicate pin and made the unicorn spin round, which is why I want you to find out what my brother is doing and why. Lucian's mouth twitched with what looked like resigned humour. Just so I have this straight, you want me to spy on the Larkin King? They stared at each other as the Ormolu clock on the wall ticked away the seconds. Well, said Lucian as he rang a bell by his side, it appears we shall need Mary Chase. Chapter 28 Who is Mary Chase? Daisy asked while they waited, and why do we need her? Lucian's strange eyes flashed on a smile. Reconnaissance. We are the spies of the supernatural world, my petite. For the right price, we can get into anywhere at any time. Observe. Lucian became utterly still, and his gleaming eyes immediately dimmed. A caress of ice-cold air touched Daisy's cheek and then surrounded her breasts. Icy prickles rippled over her sensitive flesh, beading her nipples. She sucked in a gasp as a cold draught blew between her legs. Oh! A vicious snarl burst from Northrop, and he was out of his seat, his hands fisting Lucian's collar. The man's head flopped to the side as if he were stunned. Northrop gave him a violent shake. Fangs sprang long in Northrop's mouth, his eyes going round and filling with blue. I'll tear your fucking head from your neck if you don't leave off. The air about her whooshed past her. 
Lucien's prone body jerked and he blinked, his eyes returning to normal. Still caught in Northrop's grip, he offered an innocent little smile to the snarling lichen bearing down on him. Tampa, Ian, it was only a bit of fun. Northrop was past hearing. His jaw cracked as it lengthened, the fangs in his upper and lower jaw growing longer. Not with her. A snarl tore out as his claws sank into Lucian's neck. The man gurgled as Daisy leaped up. Northrop, stop! He bared his teeth at Lucian, and the muscles along his forearms bulged. Crimson blood ran in rivulets down Lucian's neck and into his snow-white cravat. Ian! With a shaking hand, she touched his arm. He jerked, as though shocked, his eyes gleaming ice blue, turning to her, unseeing and wild. Let him go, Ian. You don't want to kill him, not truly. Northrop cocked his head, his nostrils pinching as though he were inclined to disagree. His tense frame vibrated as a series of low growls rumbled in his throat. Daisy blanched, but did not let him go. She had to trust in his promise not to hurt her. Ian, stand down. On a shudder, his body began to ease back to normal, and the confusion and rage in his eyes cleared, to be replaced by a possessive heat that made her blush. A grunt of acknowledgement left him before he turned away from her. Northrop hauled his prey close, his nose butting up against Lucian's. Plea with your own lass, eh? With a final snarl, he shoved Lucian back into his seat. The chair slid a foot before Lucian's boot heel stopped it. A thousand pardons, Lucian said, panting. I forgot myself. Daisy, on the other hand, having just realized that the cold touch was Lucian, suddenly felt far from appeased. That was you, she said through her teeth. The man held up his hands in apology, and she turned to Northrop. I was wrong. Tear his hands off. Northrop's eyes glinted with wicked humor as he winked at her, his smile feral and still showing a bit of fang. He turned back to Lucian and let his claws free. Lucian backed into his chair, his handsome mouth opening in alarm. Here now! Daisy gave him an evil smile. Now that Northrop had calmed, he wouldn't follow through, but he put on a very convincing show. I wouldn't be too alarmed, Mr. Stone, she said. After all, it appears you do not need your hands to get into mischief. Northrop took another step, making a great deal of growling, and Daisy almost laughed. Oh, now, sweet, I do apologize. Northrop grabbed his flailing arm and Lucian yelped. I was disrespectful and I was wrong. Now call off your dog. I suppose we ought to let him alone, Daisy said with a sigh. After all, I abhor violence. Northrop chuckled and let him go. Quite good of you, Lucian muttered to Daisy. I am in your debt. The door opened, and in walked a woman Daisy presumed was Mary Chase. Sugar and spice and everything nice, it was all Daisy could think of as the young woman glided toward them. Golden brown hair, glinting like spun sugar, framed a heart-shaped face from which eyes of pale butterscotch glittered with bright, watchful intelligence. Those eyes glanced over her, taking note, and then moving on as if she found Daisy a rather boring addition to her day. Lucian, however, saw the way Daisy gaped. It is the eyes that snare you. Smoothing out his rumpled coat with a shaking hand, he forced a wide smile. As is their purpose, crystalline eyes to draw you in, entice you to tell us your secrets. Daisy closed her mouth. You pick your bodies well. Mary Chase's petal pink lips quirked, but she said nothing as she perched on the arm of Lucian's chair. Mary's... Lucian ran a knuckle down the woman's arm. The lightful body is her own, as she had the choice offered to her moments before her first death. Mary Chase accepted the man's touch with neither encouragement nor rejection. 
Her odd eyes rested a moment longer than proper on Northrop before sliding back to Lucian. What is it that you want, sir? Her voice was warm toffee, and some base part of Daisy bristled with pure feminine jealousy. Northrop here wants us to play shadow to the Ranulf. Lucian handed her the stick pin. Are you up to the task, ma petite? Her butterscotch eyes settled on Northrop. A dangerous thing to follow a lichen. A slow, wry smile curled Northrop's lips as he took his seat once more. Very dangerous. You might not survive. Lucian laughed again. Helping along our bargaining, are we, Ian? Hurrying it along more like, Northrop said. We all know what it is I am asking. Daisy leaned in. Do we? She rather hated being the ignorant party. Lycans can see spirits, Northrop said patiently. For a gim to spy on one is a tricky business. Well, at the very least, Daisy understood how Northrop had known what Lucian had been up to with his tricks. An understatement, Lucian cut in. I don't lightly risk the welfare of my brightest. Lucian's hand drifted from Mary's arm to the narrow curve of her waist, cinched in golden silk. Daisy could not help but admire the gown, or the woman for choosing it. Here was a woman who knew proper dress. One wonders why you don't volunteer for the deed yourself, then, Daisy said. At that, Mary Chase's gold gaze flicked to Daisy's. A small smile sparked in those strange orbs. Because he needs the best, she said. That would be me. Humble girl, she was. What is it that you want to know? Mary asked Northrop. Daisy tried to take her eyes from Lucian's roaming hand, but she could not as it slid slowly up to cup the young woman's small breast. Northrop's seat creaked beneath his muscled frame. The werewolf terrorizing London. Does Connell have it? And if so, where? Long, dark fingers idly circled a budding nipple, a whisper of a caress. The woman leaned into the touch, slightly, subtly. Heat bloomed between Daisy's legs and spread over her flesh. She shifted in her chair, pressing her thighs together. That shall take some time and finesse. Are you willing? The questing fingers stilled, but did not give up their prize. The blunt tip of one finger rested gently over a hardened nub. Daisy swallowed, the tightness inside of her clenching. Her cheeks were surely aflame, yet she could not move her eyes from the sight. Mary Chase's small breast lifted and fell with the rhythm of her breathing, causing dark fingers to slide over the curve of flesh. A pale, feminine hand fell upon a muscled thigh encased in blue satin. Slowly, the hand stroked up to the bulge growing between his thighs. Daisy squirmed and gripped the side of her chair. I am always willing. The questing hand stopped, having found its prize, and squeezed. A blast of heat hit Daisy's cheeks. Lucian's voice was surprisingly benign for a man who had a woman's hand on his cock. There is the matter of payment, old friend. Northrop's arm moved, a pile of pound notes scattered among the plates and goblets. Money is lovely, Ian, but I think I'll need something more this time. He made a show of straightening his cravat. So they would have to pay for Northrop's temper. Northrop's jaw tightened. What do you want? Lucian let go of his mole and leaned back in his chair. Do you know your brother will not work with the Giams? A cold look frosted over his features. Rather, he'd prefer not to pay, but to force our hand into providing services. Northrop did not move. What, Lucian? You. His expression grew deadly serious. You get that brother of yours off the throne and take it. A bitter laugh escaped Northrop. Why does everyone seem to think I'll be a better leader? 
Did you not think I might be inclined to hold it against you once I got there? Ah, but that is why I shall also ask for your assurance that you shall treat us fairly. Lucian waved an idle hand. Fairly? That is all. No favoritism. You could not ask for a better deal. I can ask for a hell of a lot, Northrop snapped. He turned away and lowered his head, but Daisy could see the capitulation taking over his expression, and it made her want to shout in protest. He wanted a normal life. He would not do this. He could not. I'll need assurances as well, Northrop said. I do this, and not only will you tell me what I want to know, but you will work for me exclusively until the wear is dead. Daisy's safety will be as important to you as it is to me. He leveled a glare at Lucian. I trust you understand the full extent of that importance. Lucian's smile was the devil's. Of course, she shall be as dear to me as, well, let us say a daughter, shall we? I wouldn't want you getting your fur up once more. Northrop began to nod his assent, but Lucian held up a hand. To be clear, protection is null and void should you fail to become the Ranulf. As much as I'd love to help the lovely Daisy, he glanced at her with humor, I cannot risk all for nothing in return. Dead calm colored Northrop's voice when he spoke. When I challenge Cornell, I will not fail. His eyes held with Lucian's. But I will not do so until the werewolf is destroyed. With a chill, Daisy understood. The werewolf was a threat to her. He could not risk his own life until he knew that she was safe. Northrop, Daisy said, coming forward. Do not do this. Not for me. There are other ways. There are always other ways, he agreed, not looking at her. But this is the best. He gave a sharp nod to Lucian. Done. Why did you do it? Daisy asked him. You told me you wanted out of that life. Ian sat back against the squabs, as comfortable as he could get given that he'd been fighting off an erection for the better part of the hour and had only just got it under control. Damn Lucian and his antics. Ian had seen the display before, and he didn't give a fig if the sly game fondled his protégé. Daisy's reaction, however, was another matter altogether. Seeing her grow agitated with desire had set him aflame. You know why. Her white teeth caught her lower lip and worried it. I'm not worth this trouble. You are. Ian cleared his throat. My course was set the moment those Ranulf darts hit me, lass. At least this way, I'll know the Gims will be watching over you. It isn't the best of arrangements, I grant you. They are a sly lot, but we needed the help. I can assure you, however, that once a deal is struck... They will hold up their end. Daisy frowned. I thought you were friends with Lucian. No one is truly friends with a gim. Their very immortality is based on theft, which does not endear them to many. But Ian did not want to discuss Lucian or their deal. No matter the necessity or the facts, Connell was his baby brother. The thought of killing him crushed Ian's heart. No. All he wanted to discuss this very moment was Daisy, and him. He beguiled you, you realize. Daisy stiffened against her seat, into wanting the food. With undue intensity, she studied the view outside of the moving coach. I figured as much. I've never been so moved by a common grape. He wanted to laugh at the way she so neatly sidestepped him. That evasion was prettily done, my dear. She sniffed. I don't know what you mean. Feeling fiendish, he nudged her skirts with the tip of his booted toe. Her red and cream-striped visiting dress, with all its flounces and bows, put to mind wrapping paper, an irresistible present that his fingers itched to unwrap. Did it not affect you?
the way he touched the ethereal Mary Chase. She edged away, her plump lips flat with annoyance. Of course it did. How can one not be affected by such a disgraceful display? Mmm. He rested the offending foot over his knee. So those blushes were out of disgust, were they? She glared at the passing traffic. A certain sense of glee lightened his chest. See, I rather thought you found it arousing. She did not bite, but kept a bland face turned toward the window. You would. Hm. Perhaps there was another reason you squirmed within your seat. I would blame it on luncheon, but as we've had none. She shot him a repressive look. Now it is you who is being disgusting. He laughed for the sheer joy of doing so. This was what he wanted from life. Not death or clan machinations. Just her. Just them. Daisy girl, you are a terrible liar, did you know? Ass, she muttered under her breath. Planting his feet on the coach floor, Ian rested his elbows upon his knees, bringing himself into tempting proximity of her lush figure. He allowed himself one breath of her natural fragrance and felt it swim through his veins. Are you saying you have no interest in that sort of activity? Oh, but he was a bastard. The bored look remained. Voyeurism seems a rather unbalanced exchange. Were it not solely voyeuristic in nature? He ran his tongue along the outside of his teeth and was gratified to see her twitch. Unbidden, images of the night before flashed through his mind, of her mouth opening for him and the feel of her abundant curves filling his hands as he pressed against her. By God, she'd bitten him, and he'd loved it. His fingers clenched. Were it perhaps one man with one woman? You, I mean, with one man? Northrop. It was a strangled sound, a plea for silence. But the devil in him had taken reign of his common sense. Did you take a peek? She startled, but he could tell by the look on her face that she knew precisely what he was about. What? No! Her eyes cut to his and then darted away, high colour painting her cheeks red. You were unconscious. It would have been rude in the extreme to take advantage. How disappointing. His smile grew. Ah, oh, to tease her. He got more enjoyment from doing so than entertaining a bed full of women. Suddenly, it was not enough to face her. Ian moved to the space beside her, taking note of the way she tensed. And if I hadn't been? His heart beat too quickly, the blood pumping through his veins too hot. Had I been awake? He whispered in her ear. What then? Her cheeks plumped on a repressed grin. In minute detail. Heat washed under his clothes, and he pressed his shoulder more intimately against hers, knowing it would agitate her just as it agitated him. And then what? His voice had gone rough and thick, not his own. Daisy kept her eyes on the window. From what I saw of your torso, I think... Little pearl teeth caught on her pouting bottom lip. I think I should like to dip you in melted butter and lick it off. A shocked laugh burst from his lips, his cock pushed tight against his trousers. He adjusted himself and took a deep breath to keep from hauling her onto his lap then and there. I'm asking Cook for butter when we arrive home. A chuckle escaped before she pressed her mouth tight, but her eyes twinkled as she maintained her vigil of the road. No, you are not. Even if you did, it wouldn't matter. I won't succumb. He turned toward her, suddenly irritated. You are evading this. Why? We are both unattached and healthy, and we want each other, he said, quite desperately. Daisy drew in a sharp breath through her pert nose, but she faced him, her blue eyes steady and filled with the same desire that burned inside of him. Yes, we do. God, but her admission heated his blood. Then let us enjoy each other. 
Is that what we're doing? She said it so earnestly that he almost smiled, so she also appeared distressed at the very idea. Enjoying each other? Is that what this is? No. It wasn't what this was. Suddenly his chest felt too tight and his jaw clamped shut. Blonde curls trembled as she shook her head. You can't even answer. Of course I can. He rubbed his chest irritably before glaring at her. I want you. Now, here. Is that clear enough? Heart thundering in his ears, he watched her in the ensuing silence. Her lovely face fell as if she'd expected withdrawal instead of a confession. Yes. She averted her eyes, their brilliant blue depths going murky. It isn't a good idea, Northrop. The coach slammed over a rut and his teeth rattled. He ground them together. It was that easy for her, was it? And what of him? If he thought too closely on all that he risked, he surely would turn tail and run. And yet he was here. Willing to try. This is bullshit, he got out at last. Her head snapped up in surprise, her eyes going wide. Pardon me? Such outrage. Oh, but he saw the hurt there too. The fear. His fist clenched on his thigh. It isn't in your nature to turn from pleasure. Yet you are. What do you know of my nature? I know it is exactly like mine made to enjoy sensation. You weren't afraid before, and now you are. Why? Tell me what has changed. She gave a little laugh. I don't have to tell you a thing. No, he admitted, calming. No, you don't. Gently, like you would approach a frightened wolf, his hand settled over her smaller one to show her he could lead her from any danger. But you can she stared down at it for a moment. This isn't about Miranda, is it? His fingers tightened over hers. For I told you. No, that isn't it. Ian ran a hand over his face in an effort not to shout. Then tell me what it is. You wouldn't be a nameless tup in some alley. She inhaled sharply and looked away, hot colour rising over her cheeks, a golden curl bounced over her ear, and he caught it with his fingertip. The tendril coiled around his finger as if a living thing. When she spoke, it was barely a whisper. It would mean something with you. The bronze fan of her lashes swept down. You would become a complication I wouldn't know how to manage, Ian. Everything inside him tensed. His finger still embraced by her curl, clenched, and the strand slipped free. Part of him didn't want to speak. Part of him wanted to leap from the coach and run away. Were he honest with himself, it was the greater part of him. And yet he could not stop his mouth from slowly forming the words that the stronger, deeper part of him wanted to say. I'm willing to risk complications to be with you. A pained sound tore from her lips. I don't know how to do this. Her mouth pinched as though tasting something bitter. For a moment, he feared she wouldn't speak, but then she took a deep, choppy breath. Not when my heart is engaged. Daisy. She didn't appear to hear him. Bloody Craigmore, she ground out, viciousness twisting her features. I know his words were lies, cruelty designed to torment. Her hands opened and clenched as she spoke, and yet I still find myself believing them. He threaded his fingers with hers, keeping his hold light no matter how much he wanted to turn and punch a hole through the coach window. I'd rip his throat out where he's still alive. Daisy blinked back a tear. It wouldn't have changed a thing. His words have infected me, made me believe that my lust is a sin and my pleasure a man's downfall. Is this why you never took a lover? Her eyes snapped to his. All signs point to a woman unaccustomed to proper male attention, love. His thumb found the pulse point at her wrist and caressed the silken spot, which is a true shame, 
as you are ripe for pleasure. She sighed. I wanted to. God knows I did. Only... She swallowed visibly. I thought it would make it worse for me to have a taste of pleasure and still be trapped. A bitter laugh filled the coach. Stupid. So utterly stupid that I let him win. She said it more to herself, but he drew her near. Entirely, he agreed softly, before bending down to nuzzle her neck and inhale the sweet scent of her, like sunshine and life and happiness. It felt so good to hold her again, as though one day had been a lifetime. I say we conduct a thorough investigation in the matter of your pleasure. His lips trailed over the fragrant skin under her jaw and she shivered. Consider me your willing victim. This time, when she laughed, it was light, relenting. <laughs> Pest. Mmm. Not leaving the delicious spot on her neck, he reached out and pulled the shade closed. The worst of the lot. Her head lolled back on a sigh. I wasn't supposed to like you, Northrop. Ian, he reminded her. His tongue touched her earlobe, drawing out another thready sigh. And you were supposed to be a bloody pain in my arse. Slowly, he kissed his way down her slender neck. The plump swells of her bosom trembled with each light kiss. He unhooked the first clasp of her bodice, and she went still. Ian? Hmm? You aren't honestly trying to seduce me in a carriage, are you? She sounded mildly amused and highly incredulous. Why not? His voice was muffled against her breast, the deep valley there a delight of curves and dips. Delicately, he ran the tip of his tongue along the line of her cleavage, and she made a little noise of surprise that had him as hard as iron in an instant. He eased down to kneel in front of her on the carriage floor, and then pressed in closer, kissing her butter-soft lips, her firm little chin, the side of her warm neck. Daisy squirmed against him, trying to get away or trying to get closer he couldn't be sure. He decided to find out. He nuzzled her neck and slipped the second hook free. It's quiet. He kissed her left breast. Private. Her right breast next. Then there are the convenient bumps and sways. It seems so obvious. Despite the protest, her hand drifted down to slide into his hair. He laughed, his breath hot against her skin. I shall keep that in mind for next time, lest my creativity be permanently called into question. Keep that up. Obligingly, her fingers stroked his hair, sending shivers of pleasure down his back. The next hook came free, and his knuckles grazed the underswell of her corseted breasts. All the times my mother warned me about being alone with men in carriages, I would think... She lifted her shoulders a touch, nudging herself into the kiss he placed on her collarbone. How prosaic! What true rake would dare! Ian lifted his head and caught her gaze with his. Daisy girl! The arc of her brow lifted. Hush! Her bodice slid apart in a hiss of satin, and he almost groaned. Her corset matched the colour of her eyes, a demi-cup design that lifted her breasts high. The shadow of her nipples taunted him beneath the thin linen of her combinations. His thumb found the first ingenious little latch release on the corset front, and he almost wept. God bless French lingerie designers. Ian held her gaze, watching the way she panted lightly, her lips parted and her colour high. He knew that she craved going down darker roads. His voice was not his own. It belonged to a beast with a raging cockstand. I'm going to lick and suck your sweet tits, Daisy Meg, until we're both dying from the pleasure of it. Her lips rounded to a shocked O, oh, a flush spreading from her cheeks down to the impressive swells of her breasts. He didn't miss the way her pupils dilated with desire and excitement. It fueled his. Because you deserve pleasure, lass. He flipped open a snap, 
the inhuman strength in his fingers making it easy. You deserve to be well and thoroughly loved. With each distinct click of her corset snaps releasing, her breath ratcheted, and he fought not to fall on her like a man starved. Slowly the corset parted, revealing its hidden prize. The tightness in his gut turned to near pain. Her panting had grown hard and agitated as she waited, her blue eyes watchful. With a flick of his wrist, he set her corset free. She exhaled in a shuddering breath, as though she too had been freed. Liquid heat flowed down his spine. Keeping his eyes on hers, he let one claw out and hooked his finger over the edge of her combinations. Whip first, her hand lashed out and gripped his wrist with surprising strength. Ian froze. Daisy's eyes had gone wide and panicked, fear warring with desperate longing. Tension vibrated down her arm and into his wrist, and his heart kicked in his chest. I don't know what will happen either, he whispered, his breath growing as agitated as hers. In truth, he could go limp, fail again, or perhaps fall so far and deep for her that he would not recover, and yet. Let us discover it together, love. Her throat worked on a swallow, but her eyes, they filled with trust. Pride swelled in his chest. The grip on his wrist eased, and slowly, surely her hand fell to her lap. Ian held her gaze, and then he pulled. The delicate fabric tore to her waist with a rending sound that shot through the tense silence. Sweet Jesus! It was more a prayer than anything. She was gorgeous. Full, creamy, teardrop-shaped breasts that thrust upward, perfect, tawny nipples the size of sovereigns that invited a man to linger. His hands covered the curve of her waist where her tender flesh had been abused by the binding corset. He smoothed his palms over the red marks, and she hissed as though his touch burned. Perhaps it did, for he felt himself burning up from inside out. Poor lass, he whispered, brushing his lips over a red groove on her sweet belly. You should be free and unbound like this always. Her helpless laugh was cut short as he kissed his way up, his mouth following the path made by his hands. A groan escaped him as he cupped her lush breasts. His thumbs slid over the silken tips of her nipples, slowly, back and forth until they grew stiff and wanting. He gave them a little pinch, and her eyes squeezed shut, her lips parting on a gasp. The sight almost killed him. His mouth fastened over one flushed tip, and she moaned, arching up into him. Ian's breath was unsteady as he drew the stiff nub in deep, learning her taste, the feel of her. She was delicious, maddening. He gave her a little nip. She squirmed against him, and he knew he drove her as mad as he felt. Blood running hot and viscous as honey in his veins. He licked his way over to the other neglected breast and nibbled and sucked it until she was tugging at his hair. She was so primed that he could probably make her come by doing this alone. Hell, he was dangerously near spilling his seed as it was, and wasn't that enough to make him shout in triumph? But it was too fast. Giving her one last suckling kiss, he took a breath and sat back on his heels. Beneath lids lowered in dazed arousal, she watched him, confusion clouding her eyes even as she waited to see what he would do. The coach rattled over a rough patch in the road, and her breasts bounced lightly, her nipples dark and wet from his ministrations. Ian almost fell upon her again, wanting to suck and tweak those swollen tips until she came apart in his arms. He fisted his hands at his side because he wanted more, much more. She deserved more. Lift your skirts. His voice was guttural, brutal in its command. Her soft mouth fell open, her eyes going wide, but he saw the flash of heat in those blue depths. They stared at each other, their breathing heavy and fast. Lift them high and show me your sweet, cunny Daisy Meg. A little gasp escaped her lips, her gaze turning fever-bright at the demand. He held her gaze unflinchingly, 
the silence so thick it pressed upon his chest like a hand. For one lurching moment, he thought she might refuse, and then slowly, oh, so slowly, her hands moved. Trembling fingers fisted her skirts, and lust surged like victory through his gut. His muscles clenched as she gathered up her gown, the rustling of satin over loud in the silence. Trim ankles came into view, then the elegant line of her shins covered in red silk stockings. Ian wanted to laugh in delight upon seeing her naughty choice in hosiery, but he couldn't catch his breath. He licked his dry lips. Higher. It was a growl. She struggled with the fabric, bunches of it slipping and sliding in her hands. Poor girl. Her breasts bobbled as she arched up, making room for the mass of her skirts on the bench seat. The lacy ruffle of knickers peeked out. The frilled edge of the gown eased over her dimpled knees. Ian swallowed hard, his shoulders shaking despite his wish to be still. Spread your legs, he ordered on a pant. Shyly, she bit her bottom lip as she spread her thighs. The scent of her desire made his head light. Her hips came forward on the seat, the white length of plump linen-covered thighs opening like flower petals to the sun. Wider, he said, when the shadowed apex of her thighs remained hidden to him. His cock throbbed with impatience, wanting to push and thrust. He took a deep breath, willing it to calm. No longer was it a question of could he finish, but could he refrain from finishing too soon. She made a little sound that had his fingers digging into his thighs for control, and then she moved, parting, revealing herself to him. Ah, oh, God! His hands shook as he put them on her thighs. Framed by the slit in her combinations and a nest of honey-gold curls, pink lips, as pouty and plump as her mouth, glistened in the dim light. I could eat you alive, Mora. And then he did. Spreading her legs wider still, he kissed those lips, his tongue laving through her slickness. Ian! Her back lifted off the squabs, mewling sounds breaking from her as she undulated against his questing mouth. She was honey and salt, and so succulent the animal in him wanted to sink his teeth into her. He gripped the soft abundance of her ass and hauled her closer. The way her hips gently rocked in time with his kisses drove him on, and he devoured her. His mind went dark, his flesh turning to liquid fire, and his heart threatened to pound right out of his chest. She was going to kill him. Chapter 29 He was going to kill her. Surely one could die from pleasure. Daisy bit her lip to keep from screaming out. Slick and hot, his tongue lapped at her, each long lick sending heat coursing down her thighs. Sagging against the seat, she blinked up at the carriage roof, her breath coming in shallow bursts. Her damp palms clutched at the mass of her skirts for fear that they would slip and hinder his efforts. Dear God, nothing ever felt so good, so sinfully good as this. Sensation overwhelmed her, drawing her focus to the wet sounds of him kissing, sucking, to the air caressing her nipples still wet and throbbing from his earlier assault, and his tongue, his clever, devious tongue. Her hand fluttered down to weakly cup the silky back of his head and keep him close. A whimper left her as he did something particularly decadent with his mouth, and she pushed herself into the kiss. He rewarded her by doing it again, a slow, swirling glide that had her writhing. A growl rumbled low in his throat. His big hands clutched her bottom, holding her still. She was utterly open to him, her thighs trembling and her sex pulsing. Ian, it was a plea. He made a noise as if he were as helpless as she, but he did not stop, his mouth moving over her in a maddeningly steady rhythm, surely designed to torment. In a haze, she saw his hand go to the fall of his trousers, his arm jerking as he worked to open the buttons and free his cock. Cock. She remembered when she'd learned that word. It was the same day she'd learned what it could do, how it made her feel, 
the heat and fullness of it inside of her. Before her marriage, she'd loved men, loved their bodies, their taste. A lump rose in her throat. She'd nearly forgotten. Her gaze drifted down to the dark head between her legs, the sight of it making her insides clench. This man, this man above all others drove her to distraction. She wanted Ian's cock now, driving into her, taking claim. Heat rippled up her torso, and her pleasure spiraled toward a precipice. Ian! He tilted his head, the strands of his thick hair spreading over her thigh in an auburn fan. He blinked up at her, slow and languid as if he hadn't a care. But the devil lurked behind his innocent expression, sly and ready to tease. Yes, sweet. Perspiration trickled between her breasts and down the small of her back. She licked her lips, forcing the words past her laboured breaths. I want... She couldn't say it. Her cheeks burned as she looked at him in supplication. His breath stirred her wet curls, making her twitch. What do you want? Oh, the horrid bastard! She tried to nudge closer, but he held her back. You... She gasped as he planted another soft, searching kiss on her sex. You! Now! God! Beneath the shadow of his lashes, his eyes were a blue flame, wicked and wild as they pinned her. What is it that you want me to do? A shiver racked her. He wanted the words. The look in his eyes told her he knew that deep down she yearned to say them, that the very idea of saying them made her burn hotter. Anticipation gathered in her limbs and made her heart pound as she thought of the words, the most sinful way to ask. An evil smile curled Ian's mouth. Well? His tongue snaked out to flick over her swollen flesh, and she arched off the seat. Please. Slowly, he kissed his way up her torso. His lips closed over her nipple, giving it a light suck, and she moaned. Please what? he whispered around the trembling tip. His hips moved between hers, and she felt him there, the crown of his cock pressing against her entrance. He did not move, but fisted the sides of her skirts as his forehead rested on hers. His lips hovered over hers, his breath an unsteady pant. Tell me. The carriage lurched, rocking as it turned up an incline, and Ian's cock nudged against her opening, he grunted, his throat working on a swallow, but he held steady, waiting. She closed her eyes for a brief moment. She could feel his power, the restraint that had the muscles of his shoulders shaking. When she opened her eyes, their gazes collided. With a flush of white-hot heat, she said the words that gave her power and set her free. Fuck me! His groan filled her mouth, mingled with her gasp as he plunged home, a smooth, gliding thrust that seated him to the hilt, just as the carriage lurched to a halt. The penetration, the intimacy of it nearly undid her right there, but the unmistakable sound of the coachman jumping from his seat made her freeze. A muffled curse left Ian as he too went utterly still. Barely able to breathe, or to think past the sensation of being filled with him, Daisy blinked up at Ian in horror. Ian stared back, his expression a virulent mix of pained impatience and growing wrath. Footsteps sounded just outside the coach door. My lord, leave off, George, Ian shouted in a strangled voice. A bead of sweat trickled from his temple down to his twitching jawline. He glanced at her and moved his hips a fraction, a slight pull that sent a delicious ripple through her core. Murmuring a sound of impatience, he grazed his lips over hers, intent on exploring, but the coachman's strained voice ruptured the thick silence. But my lord, I said leave off! Ian's plea broke on a groan, his head falling against her neck as he struggled not to move. Christ, I'm going to kill him! It's Lady Archer, said a frantic George. Daisy's heart seized. My lord, she is out of her carriage and headed this way. Oh, God! 
Daisy shot upward, her nose colliding with Ian's chin as she shoved at his chest hard. Get off! Oh, do! Dislodged, Ian fell back with a curse as Daisy scrambled to get her skirts down. Her bodice lay gaping, her breast swaying in humiliating fashion. Miranda was here. Her sharp voice was just outside the door as she argued with George to let her pass. Damned meddling woman, Ian muttered as he tucked himself into his trousers. He moved to help Daisy, but she smacked at his hands. He batted her back. I'm faster. Wasting precious seconds, they slapped at each other's hands in a battle to redress her bodice until Daisy threw her hands up in the air. Forget it. There's no time to relace the corset and the bodice won't close without it. What are you doing? She hissed as he began to pull off his coat. Put that back on. A knock rapped on the door and she jumped within her skin. Bloody hell! Daisy, are you in there? Ian's smile was quick and tight as he kissed the tip of Daisy's nose and then swung his coat around her shoulders. Chin up, he said, as she struggled to put her arms through the long sleeves. He tucked a curl behind her ear. And look the devil in the eye when she has a go at you. Miranda's eyes widened as Daisy stumbled out of the coach, now parked in Ian's drive. Daisy took Ian's advice and met Miranda's reproachful look with a lift of her chin, though she could not quite pull off the pose with the dignity she wanted as her hair was tumbling down around her shoulders and her frame swayed on unsteady legs. She clutched the edges of Ian's coat tighter together. Not a word, she said when Miranda made to speak. Not a single admonishment, Panda, or I'll march right by and finish what I started in the privacy of Northrop's home. The strangled sound of a masculine laugh came from behind her as Miranda's brow lifted. Ian, finishing the act of buttoning up, leaped down from the conveyance and gave her sister a courtly bow. Lady Archer, a pleasure as always. Miranda's mouth pursed. I doubt it very much in this instance, Lord Northrop. Her green eyes cut to Daisy, wonder and wariness warring within their depths. But she took a deep breath, and her expression fell to grief. Oh, Daisy! In an instant, Daisy pulled her into a hard embrace, heedless of her dishevelled state. What is it, pet? Miranda's arms held her just as tightly. Winston. Miranda said against Daisy's hair. He's been attacked by the werewolf. Beside them, Ian snapped to attention. Where? When? Miranda straightened. I don't know. He's alive, but just barely. Archer is with him. She turned back to Daisy and her eyes glistened. For a moment, she looked like the little girl who used to follow Daisy and Poppy round the house, wanting to house, wanting to play. Their little sister, who was as annoying as she was dear. Daisy, I'm so afraid for Poppy. If she loses Winston. Daisy's insides clenched. Winston Lane meant everything to Poppy. Chapter 30 Truth, it seemed, hurt, and Winston hurt. All over he hurt a screaming, fiery pain that ate at the left side of his face and ripped into his arm and chest. Winston tried to breathe and gurgled on his own blood instead, a salty, metallic sludge that made him gag. Easy, darling, easy. A cool hand touched his. He fought a sob. Poppy. Her voice. Her touch. So familiar to him, it was like coming home. Home? Perhaps he was. The air was warm here, no longer cold and dank, the surface beneath him soft, not the uneven hardness of that dark lane where... His hand lashed out, remembering the thing that attacked, the razor-sharp claws that tore into him. A hand grabbed him, strong and steady. Do not move. This is hard enough work as it is. Who was it? His mind raced for the answer. Dark voice. Deep. A liar. Something tugged at his face, pulling at his cheek. He stiffened. Win. Poppy again. Be still. 
and let Archer sew you up. Archer, that bastard. Fire burned over his skin and down his throat. They were all lying bastards. She- Sheridan? He had to know. Knocked out cold, came Archer's detached voice. Beyond having a bump on his head, he'll live. Winston shifted, wanting to get away from the voice that seemed to haunt him with some unwelcome memory. Christ, there he goes again. Poppy, if you would. Poppy's hands came down on his shoulders. Win, easy, please. He calmed because she asked him to, and lay quiet as the pinch pull at his face continued. Water tinkled in a basin, and then came the cool feel of it along his neck and chest. Oh, Wynne. Poppy's voice, so soft. Wynne, we'll see you well, we will. He tried to focus. Slowly, the hazy outline of a head formed, a fiery nimbus of scarlet hair. Her severe brows were drawn tight. Poppy. His Hellenistic beauty, so strong and clean, his Boadicea, for he had thought of the goddess the moment he'd first laid eyes on her, fearing he'd never have a chance to win the fierce beauty who kept the world at bay with a glare. Poppy, his wife, his one true partner. She'd never lied to him, not her. She leaned in closer, her expression tender, though nothing could fully gentle the strength of her features. Rest easy, Wynne, she said. It is almost over. Save it was just the beginning. The anchor of that knowledge fell upon his chest, dragging him down. His gaze came to rest on the glint of the gold chain she wore about her neck, the pendant, well hidden as always, beneath her collar. But he knew its contours so well he could draw it in minute detail from memory. That pendant, the tiny bit of gold fashioned into a goddess, whose winged arms lifted up to form an arc like those of a phoenix rising. How many times had he seen it? Hell, he'd taken it between his teeth when Poppy rode him, her lithe body rising and falling above him, pert breasts bouncing in maddening rhythm. God, it made him crazed with lust when they made love in that manner. He stared at the chain now his hand curling tighter over the object he'd kept clutching since he'd torn it off his saviour's cloak. Metal bit into his skin, a taunt. His eyes lifted to his wife's, and he saw her confusion and hesitation. Slowly, he let his grip relax, and the little charm clattered to the floor at his side. Poppy's eyes went to it, and then flew to his, for it was the same charm. How well he remembered the first time she'd let him see it, during the first time they'd made love. How she quoted the poet Apuleius, I am nature, the universal mother, mistress of all the elements, primordial child of time, sovereign of all things spiritual, queen of the dead, queen of the ocean, queen also of the immortals. Winston had never questioned why Poppy wore the charm, he figured it a fancy born from her love of books and myth. Now, as he held her gaze and saw her tremble, he could only look away. He closed his eyes to her, for he'd seen in her what he inevitably saw in everyone. A liar. Ian was not surprised when Archer joined him on the steps, leading to the garden terrace where he'd gone to wait, not wanting to interfere with Daisy and her sister's shared grief. Ian wanted to leave Archer House altogether. How? He wanted to haul Daisy back in his coach and finish what they'd started. If he weren't a randy bastard, he'd have admitted to being worried about the inspector. In truth, he rather liked Lane, or at the least respected him. Ian stood and snubbed out the cheroot he'd been idly smoking in an effort to distract himself. I've a theory that smoking bodes ill for one's health, Archer said. Ian gave a short laugh. Seeing as I'll live forever, I will forego that worry. The man beside him chuckled in turn. An excellent point. And anyway, you're the one who looks like hell. Worry flickered in Archer's eyes, and Ian's hackles rose, but the look disappeared. 
Archer's mouth twisted in a parody of a smile. It's been a long night. Tell me about Lane. Ian might have assisted, but Archer had the matter well in hand by the time he and Daisy had arrived. Quite frankly, Ian doubted his wolf could cope with the overwhelming scent of blood and mad werewolf mixed together without turning Ian into a snarling beast. Archer let out a tired sigh and rubbed the back of his neck. Extensive damage to the left side of the face, left arm and anterior torso, four particularly nasty incisions across the face, one that nearly bisected the masita, the masita muscle being necessary if a man wanted to chew. Christ. I got it all sewn. Tired lines bracketed Archer's mouth. Thank Christ he was out then, or it would have been a mess. Archer took the cheroot Ian offered him with little more than a quirk of his lips. When it was lit and blue smoke perfumed the night, he continued. Must have put over a hundred stitches in the poor bastard. If he survives the shock and possible infection, he'll be significantly scarred. They hung their heads for a moment, and Ian felt the tips of his claws threatening to break free. He wanted to tear into the beast that did this. Unbidden, he thought of Daisy and went cold. How did you find him? Ian asked. Archer finally turned his eyes to Ian. His expression grew tight and weary. That's the strangest bit of all. He found us. Gilroy answered a knock at the door, and there he was, unconscious in a bloody mess. Ian frowned, looking off into the garden. Who would have brought the inspector here? More importantly, how did he survive? Ian knew enough about his kind to understand that a full-on attack would only end when the victim's throat was torn out. Tense silence filled the space between them. Was it ever going to fade? Did he want it to? Ian had been so angry with his old friend for so long that there were times he couldn't remember how or why it had started. And then all Archer had to do was come near him and Ian wanted to rip him apart, rage and the feeling of betrayal threatening to consume him. Standing beside the man now, Ian experienced an odd discomfort. Though it filled his mouth with bitterness, he knew the feeling to be remorse. Point of fact, he missed his friend. Disgusted in himself, he kicked at a loose pebble on the edge of the stairs. Archer's voice broke through the quiet. As to Daisy, he dropped his cheroot and stamped it out. She may want to stay. She stays with me. Archer's grey eyes widened as he looked back at Ian. You're falling for her. Ian's back teeth met. You think it impossible? Not impossible, nor surprising. Simply inadvisable. Ian's temper flared, tightening his gut and making his wolf rise. I believe I said the same to you a while back. And damn if his meddling wasn't coming back to bite him in the ass. It did not appear to change your course of action. The man refused to be cowed. She's mortal. Two simple words, and more than enough to lash him. Ian cursed and turned away. His fist curled with the urge to strike. Ice filled his veins. Christ! Unwelcome memories filled his mind like sticky pitch. Each beat of his heart hurt as he closed his eyes, trying to block the flood of images, but they came regardless. Una's once smooth face lined with wrinkles, her once bright eyes dull when she looked upon him. Do not touch me, Ian. I cannot look at you without thinking of what I once was. Please leave me. I cannot stand the sight of you. His feelings, his hurt had no longer mattered. Ian dragged a breath through his clenched teeth, and another. The wolf inside him whined, circling and cowing. A plea. Aye. He knew better than anyone how stupid it was to want Daisy. Yet everything in him screamed in protest at the thought of giving her up. Una's words continued to taunt him, pricking at his conscience. It was a mistake, Ian. Dizzy, he placed a hand on the balustrade and felt his claws sink in deep. 
A black hole of despair opened up before him, threatening to suck him down. He knew with crystal clarity what his life would be like without Daisy in it, because he had lived it for the past eighty years. He might as well fall into that hole now and end it if that was the way of things. Archer's voice cut through his nightmare. While I was fool enough to act without fully understanding the consequences, you do understand. You've lived it, man. Don't go back there. Don't be a fool. Ian whirled round. I'll not have judgment from you. Why? When you've judged me for years. He took a step into Ian's space and pointed a finger at him. Ian's wolf growled, itching to release its claws and fangs, but Archer did not back down. It was never about you, Ian. I never wanted to hurt you. You knew how I felt about immortality. You knew the damage it had done to me, and still you sought it. Ian slashed at the granite balustrade beside him, his claws slicing through the stone with a satisfying scrape. He'd let Archer in, revealing the pain he hadn't the courage to show another soul. You threw my suffering in my face. Even in the dark, Ian could see the dull red wash over Archer's cheekbones. I never meant it to be like that, and you know it. Did you not? And what of introducing my father to that mad fiend? Archer had brought Ian's father into West Moon Club, a secret society of fellow noblemen obsessed with immortality. They soon got their wish when Victoria, a female demon claiming to be an angel of light, found them. She had promised them immortality if they drank an elixir, not realizing that in so doing they would become like her, destined to crave the light of human souls, a mindless monster. Ian's claws punctured his own palms. The bite of pain spurred him on. You knew my father was unhinged when it came to his quest for power, and still you lured him with promises of untold strength. Not being satisfied with the immortality granted to all Lycan, Ian's father, Alistair, had wanted more, more power, the impenetrable strength of a god. When he realized what Victoria truly was, he had wanted to leave. Victoria tried to burn Alistair alive and succeeded in scarring him for life. And while Ian couldn't truly blame Archer for Alistair's faults, he could blame the man for preying on them. The worst of it is that when I tried to warn you off, you told me to take a piss. And what of you? Archer snapped. When I turned to you for help after I'd changed, who told me to take a piss then? Christ, you tried to steal my wife out from under me. Ian's outrage deflated under that inescapable truth. He suddenly felt all of his one hundred and thirty years. His mouth quirked as he looked at his oldest friend. Fine, we're both jackasses. You want to have a go and beat the shite out of each other? Or we'll call Pax? Archer's hard expression eased. You're only saying that because you can finally beat me. Finally, Ian snorted. I could have beaten you before if you hadn't ambushed me when I was pissed drunk. Archer grinned. That's your excuse, is it? Pratt. They were silent for a moment before Archer glanced at him. Does she make the risk worth it? Despite the years they'd been at odds, they still understood each other perfectly. Ian didn't hesitate to answer. It isn't a matter of choice, Benjamin. The other men sighed. It never is. Chapter 31 He won't look at me. Poppy's words held the strength of smoke. Her lips trembled and she pressed them together so tightly they went white. Daisy cast a glance at Miranda, whose eyes creased with the same concern that Daisy felt. They had never seen their sister weak. She was their mountain, solid, unmovable. Now she sat listless in a chair by the hearth in Miranda's sitting room. Winston slept in a room down the hall, watched over for the moment by Tuttle, who'd come from Northrop's house to serve as nurse. 
The woman fussed about, checking for fever and administering various concoctions, along with a liberal application of her ointment in an attempt to stave off infection. Poppy picked at the loose folds of the dressing gown Miranda had lent her. He turns away when I draw near. Daisy's head throbbed. She wanted to lie down and sleep for a week, or find Ian and... She bit her lip. Between her legs, her flesh was still slick and sensitive with longing. Her cheeks burned with the memory of what Ian had done to her, and the base part of her craved more. But her sister needed her. Daisy's skirts rustled as she stood and went to Poppy's side. Resting a hand on Poppy's bright hair, she smoothed the glossy crown of her head. Why, Pop? Both sisters knew Poppy well enough to know Poppy already had the answer. Poppy turned her head to face the fire. Orange light danced over Poppy's high cheekbones, turning the red tips of her lashes bronze. He knows. Daisy's hand stilled. About us? How? Slowly, Poppy's clenched fist opened, and a little silver charm shined in the firelight. Daisy heard Miranda rise, but she kept her eyes upon the charm and leaned down to see. Miranda's voice, soft with worry, drifted over the silence. What does it mean, Poppy? Poppy's slender throat worked as she swallowed. The S.O.S. Daisy sighed and touched her sister's cheek, surprised to find it cold despite the heat of the fire. Dearest, you aren't making sense, which was unthinkable. Pain and resignation clouded the depths of Poppy's eyes. The Society for the Suppression of Supernaturals, the SOS, they exist so that the world never learns of beings like us. This, Poppy lifted the charm, is their emblem. Winston had it in his hand when they brought him in. Miranda's eyes narrowed. They did this to him. Heaven help these people if they did. Need and strength shifted within Daisy's belly, writhing as if to break free. She saw the answering promise in the glint of Miranda's eyes. For the first time in memory, Daisy felt useful, capable of serving justice to those who wronged the innocent, and it felt like freedom. Poppy's tone was resolute as she answered. No, they saved him. How can you be sure? Daisy asked. Because I am one of them. Oh, Poppy... Daisy's overskirts billowed around her knees as she sank to the footstool at Poppy's side. Poppy's fist tightened around the charm. I lied to him, like all the others. I pretended to be something I am not, and now I am paying the price. A single tear trickled down her white cheek. I made a lie of love. Out of respect, Daisy turned from her sister's pain, yet her words made a fist around Daisy's heart and clanged like warning bells within her ears. She, too, was a liar, and it made her inexpressibly tired. She was tired of pretending that she didn't want everything with Ian, tired of resisting her baser nature. Suddenly, waiting felt like a cloak smothering her breath. Gathering her skirts, she rose. I'm sorry, dearest. I must go. What? Miranda sat up straighter in her seat. Why? Where? Suspicion darkened Miranda's eyes, and she obviously thought of the scene she'd come upon, of Daisy's dishevelment and Ian unrepentantly buttoning his trousers. Daisy refused to blush now or turn away. Her sister had no right to judge, but she saw no such judgment from Poppy, who looked at Daisy with understanding, and yet such sorrow that Daisy's chest ached. She is going to live in truth, Poppy answered for her. Old doubts made her insides roll, but when Daisy spoke her voice was clear. Yes. Ian prowled his room, walking the length of it in an endless loop, just as he had done since returning home alone. His pulse jumped, his fingers twitching with the temptation to reach out and grab her. Only she wasn't here. He yanked at his cravat, desperate to get the blasted thing off before it choked him. 
He ought to go out and run, get the need out of his system. But he didn't want to run. He wanted her. He wanted to finish what they had started. The cravat ripped free and he sucked in a breath. Damn, but he couldn't do those things. Not tonight. Her sister needed her. It was as it should be. She wouldn't come to him tonight. Perhaps she wouldn't come to him at all. Fine. He liked the chase. Always had. Only for some damned reason, he wanted to be chased in return. Just once. His gait turned stiff and disjointed as he stalked to the sideboard in search of a drink. He needed something to ease this burning. His cock was an iron staff in his trousers, his balls drawn up so tight they ached. He'd been inside of her. For one perfect heart-stopping moment, he'd been clasped by her slick, warm... The crystal decanter in his hand clattered against his glass with too much force, cracking its side. A hollow laugh burst from his mouth. Bloody hell, he muttered, before rubbing a tired hand over his face. Utterly undone by a woman he was. Ian blinked down at his unshod feet, not able to do anything else. A small hole was growing in his stocking, and his big toe worked to break through. He stared at the undignified sight. The sound of his own heart beating filled his ears, and then something else. The clatter of hooves and the creaking of a coach pulling to a stop. His heart clenched painfully. The dainty patter of feet alighted the front stair, followed by a rap of the knocker. He closed his eyes and inhaled sharply and deeply. Vanilla, jasmine, sunshine, and her. His breath released in a burst of shock and hope, bloody anxious hope that had his insides quivering and his fists clenching. In the front hall, a feminine voice murmured before a light tread sounded on the centre staircase, heading toward his room. Ian couldn't move. His muscles locked, his breath coming hard like a steamer. Each step she took sent a quiver along his hot, tight skin. By the time the handle turned, he was shaking. The door creaked open. She stood, framed by the light in the hall, golden wisps of her hair curling about her head like a halo, and her summer eyes alive with equal parts hesitation and want. They stared at each other in the charged silence, and a flush spread over the tops of her plump breasts. His mouth was as dry as toast, his heart slamming to get past his ribs, she was so bloody beautiful. On a breath, he was striding forward, each step hard and strong. She met him halfway, her slim arms going up and around his neck, even as his hands tunneled into her hair to hold her still as he captured her mouth on a low groan. He devoured her, reveling in the feel of her pillowed bottom lip and the taste of her, like sweet strawberries and dark chocolate. Ian groaned again and opened her mouth farther, desperate to have all of her. They stumbled back, her nimble hands pulling at his shirt as he ripped at her lacings. A small laugh escaped her, and she caught his gaze with hers. He found himself smiling back, inanely, like a green lad getting his first taste of sin. The soft promise in her eyes settled him a bit, eased him in a way he didn't understand. Gently, he touched her cheek, the skin there as smooth as fine satin. When he kissed her again, he took his time and savoured her. He touched her with deliberation now, drawing out her pleasure and his. You came, he whispered as his hands roamed over her. I didn't think... your sister. I couldn't stay there, she said just as softly. I needed... Her blue eyes looked up at him helplessly. He understood. She needed a release, to not think about the horrors around her, and yet it pinched a small part of him that it was all she needed. Selfish or not, he wanted her to need him the way he needed her. He said none of that, only gave her a soft kiss and nibbled his way down her warm, fragrant neck. I'll give you what you need, my daisy he said against her skin. 
I'll take care of you. Daisy sighed and molded against him, her hands coming up to tuck him back to her mouth. One small gesture and his heart nearly burst within his chest. Lust ratcheted within him. It fed hers, and their hands grew unsteady once more. Silken hair tumbled over his fingers and spilled around her shoulders. He broke their kiss to allow her to wrench his shirt off. The shirt sailed overhead. Her bodice hit the floor with a slap as he walked her backward toward the bed, still kissing her. He couldn't leave her mouth. It was too delicious, quenching his thirst yet driving his hunger. She was quicker than he, helping him out of his clothes and getting herself free of that hideous contraption of a bustle when his shaking hands proved useless. It was she who pulled him onto the bed with a sound of impatience. Her skin was satin against his, her body trembling and her breathing as rough and unsteady as his own, as if they'd just finished instead of having just begun. He breathed her in and let his hands slide down all that soft, smooth skin to cup between her legs. Gods, but she was wet. He felt the fine tension humming beneath all that softness. Are you afraid? he asked between kisses he could not stop from taking. He stroked through her wetness with a light touch, easing her legs open. Her eyelids fluttered before she focused on him. Not with you. She looked almost surprised by this, but her gaze did not waver. I'm not afraid of you. Pride and lust and relief surged through him, setting his body aflame. She had seen him at his worst and still wasn't afraid of him. He kissed with little technique and all heat, his fingers sliding in deep to lay claim, and she moaned. Ian pulled back, and she wrapped her arms about him as if she feared he would go. Not a bloody chance of that. But he had to look at her and drink his fill before he took her. When he did, pain returned to his chest and his gut. Mother of God, she was made for sin, made to be adored. She was an hourglass, sweet curves that turned a man weak-kneed and panting, full breasts, tiny waist, and a gorgeously rounded ass that made him whimper. Dizzy Meg, he managed. You light the moon looking as you do. A smile spread across her face. She traced a path around his nipple, and a bolt of heat went straight to his cock. And you put the sun to bed, wild man. Wild man. He was at that moment, kissing her like he was starved. Her legs threaded with his. Her full breasts crushed against his chest as he moved over her. All that warmth and softness finally his. He nibbled on her bottom lip as he filled his hands with the plump miracle of her ass. She made a little noise that had him grinning like a fiend. He squeezed again and ground his thigh against the wet heat that called to him. Sweet Christ, she was intoxicating. Finesse was impossible with her. Not this time. Not when he was so hot and wanting that he shook with it. Sweat trickled down his back as he slid his cock over her wetness to tease them both. Once. Twice. His arms trembled as they bracketed her, and his tongue plunged into her mouth the way his cock wanted to plunder her warm quim. Ian, she pled against his lips. Now! He gritted his teeth when she nipped his lower lip impatiently. Wait, let me give you more. He'd do right by her if it killed him. Her legs spread wider, a cool home. Now! Sly devil that she was, she arched her hips a fraction, and suddenly he was in, tunneling into tight, wet heat, and he lost his mind. A vicious oath tore from him as he pumped her, hard, harder than he ought to. He couldn't stop. She was warmth, all soft and malleable flesh. Her hot, clenching sex fisted his cock, so very good. His knees dug into the mattress as he struggled to gain leverage, to get in deeper. Grunting, he hooked one smooth leg over his elbow and she moaned. Oh, God, Ian! Her breath came in pants, her creamy skin dewy and flushed. Like that! Like that! He kissed her fiercely as he pistoned hard and deep inside her. His free hand kneaded her round bottom and held her prone. 
some dark part of him urged his fingers lower, down along the seam of her pert ass, to find the tight little rosette just below her wet sex. Her eyes went wide as he stroked it with his thumb. He stroked it again, adding just a bit of pressure as he did. Delicately, she bit her lip, and then the shock was his as she nudged herself against his thumb. The beast within him roared. He slammed into her as his thumb pressed harder, and when it breached that tight barrier, she came apart in his arms. Ian! A keening wail broke from her mouth as her nails dug into his shoulders. She held herself taut against him, burrowing her face against his neck, sucking his skin there as her sex milked his, drawing him deeper still. Lightning heat flashed down his spine and into his cock. He bucked on a shout, the orgasm hitting him so hard he lost his sight for one blissful red moment. Weak as a pup, he fell limp against her, his breath ruffling her curls. Daisy, he said hoarsely. Every inch of him felt battered. It hit him with a jolt that not once had he thought of failing her. It hadn't even occurred to him that he would. Satisfaction and peace made his heart light as he closed his eyes and gathered her in his arms and turned onto his side. Daisy, he said again. It was all he could say, and in that moment, it was everything. Chapter 32 They lay in a languid tangle of limbs, so intertwined that she wasn't sure where she ended and he began. One of his strong arms snaked under her neck and around her shoulders to hold her close, as if she might try to get away. Their breath moved in a gentle panting cadence that spoke of physical exhaustion, their lips brushing together with each inhale. Idly, his big hand cupped her breast, his clever fingers toying with her nipple, lightly playing over the stiff tip and setting her insides to clench once again, despite the liquid warm contentment that made her want to melt into the bed. She arched into his touch, her thighs tightened against his in reflex, and he growled low in his throat. Their lips melded gently, lightly, a flicker of wet, warm tongues that sent another impossible flood of heat through her. I think I may have come close to dying just then. Even as he spoke, he tweaked her nipple as if he couldn't stop himself from touching her. Nor could she. Her hand smoothed up over the strong slab of muscle that flanked his spine and was gratified to feel him shiver too. I think I did die, she said. Their lips touched as if drawn together like magnets, a sip, a taste before he pulled back slightly, his devilish eyes studying her face and his expression careful. You'll be wanting to go back now, to your sister. Her heart stilled. Somehow she found her voice. Panda is with Poppy. She licked her tender lips. Do you want me to go? They were so close that her ribs compressed with each sharp rise of his chest. Her hand flattened against his shoulder blade, holding him still. Holding him for she suddenly saw the vulnerability hiding beneath his pride. He did not know the power he had over her. The hand at her breast stilled but held her, warm and possessive. Do you want to go? You cannot answer a question with a question, she hedged. His brows drew together in a fierce scowl, but it was need that burned bright in his eyes. His hand slid down her ribs and settled on her hip, the long length of his cock rose up between them, heated steel that pulsed against her belly in an insistent tattoo. I... His fingers bit into her flesh. Stay. Stay with me. I don't want to go, she admitted in a rush as his hand moved to her bottom, hauling her so close that she lost her breath, and his mouth found hers. His kiss was fierce, tender, and filled with yearning as he rolled onto his back and pulled her on top of him. Every inch of her felt sore, heavy and aching from their play, her breasts, limbs, sex, even her ass. God help her, and yet when her wet folds slid over his cock, her insides tightened in anticipation. 
Then ride me, Daisy girl. His voice was rough with sex and utterly seductive. Do what you will and I'll follow. Emotion caught hard and fast in her throat. Beneath her palm, his heart pounded, just as hers did. He'd given the power back to her. He'd given her control, and all she wanted to do now was cherish him, adore him with her touch. His eyes closed just before she placed a soft kiss on one eyelid and then the other. Trembling, she traced a path of kisses along his jaw and down the strong column of his neck. He was better than caramels, richer and saltier. She reveled in his taste as she licked and sucked the tender skin at the base of his throat and nibbled the hard line of his collarbone. He turned his head toward her, seeking her mouth. Their tongues twined, their kiss open-mouthed and so hot she thought she might faint. Strong hands gripped her hips, guiding her. Moving as through water, she lifted up and found the wide tip of his cock. Their eyes met, and she paused, her nipples skimming over his hard chest with every labored breath she took. It was you I needed. No one else but you, she whispered, and then pushed down, impaling herself onto that wonderful, thick, long cock. Ian groaned, his strong body bowing as if he'd been shocked. His brilliant blue eyes blazed up at her. She flowed over him, letting herself go free. The long, rangy muscles along his torso and arms bunched and trembled as she worked him, his eyes never leaving hers. You'll stay. It was a husky rasp, as much a plea as a demand, and Daisy's heart turned over in her chest. Every night. Her hand tunneled into the cool silk of his hair and grabbed hold. Ian's nostrils flared as she clenched her inner walls, squeezing his thick length that pulsed inside of her. Every night, Ian, she countered, unwilling to let him look away. The desperate fight left his eyes to be replaced with something that looked like joy. Grinning like a boy, he tumbled her over, pouncing with playful fervor. Glad we have that settled, he said, as she laughed breathlessly. His grin widened, and without warning, he flipped her onto her stomach, intent on a different play. Her hair fell around her face, and she heard the sound of his sudden, ragged intake of breath. Everything in her froze. Her back was to him. His growl cut into her. What the fuck? Humiliation washed over her in a wave of sour sickness, and she scrambled to get up, get away. But he was too fast for her. His hand lashed out, snatching up her wrist, his powerful thighs pinning her hips, holding her face down on the bed. What the hell is this? That position... That exposure. She could not bear it. Rage surged like hot fire and she bucked. No, she screamed. Do not. Her legs thrashed against the bed, tangling in the sheets. With one arm she swung out, sending a glancing blow off his jaw. You will not touch me. Daisy. Hands clasped her arms. She reared, her head smashing against his nose. Oh, Christ. Daisy, stop! She would not be held down again. She would not. A body fell upon her. No! Daisy, girl, his voice crooned. Calm yourself, lass. Not his voice, but Ian's. Ian's voice. Something in her stilled. Ian's body on top of her. Not pressing, but holding. His strong arms a cocoon. That's it, love. Lips brushed against her hot cheek. That's me. Only me. He kissed the corner of her eye, and she realized that tears leaked from them. That's all right. You're safe. The fight left her on a sob. Ian's strong body trembled, and she knew it was from rage held in tight check. Rage at seeing the network of red slashes along her lower back. One moment of relaxing her guard and he had seen. He rested his head next to hers on the bed, close enough for her to see his expression. Daisy closed her eyes against it. Oh, my sweet lass, he said brokenly. What did that bastard do to you? 
Shame was a hot tar coating her insides, clogging her throat. I can't. His hand smoothed down her forearm. You can. Haven't you realized yet? I am yours whether you will it or no. She sobbed again, but took a quelling breath, squeezing her eyes shut to stop the tears running down. He found out I wasn't a virgin, she said at last. Dark memories filled her mind, the disgust she'd felt in having to bed Craigmore on their wedding night, the sick feeling of him on top of her, Craigmore's ugly face twisted into something hideous and profane as he raised his hand high and smacked her. She licked her lips. There was a riding crop. Ah, oh, the pain. She could remember it still. The way he'd ripped her gown from her, somehow pinned her down as he unleashed his fury upon her back. It had taken a week to heal, and the scars stayed, a red crisscross to forever mar her lower back. She supposed she ought to be thankful they weren't raised. Did he? His breath caught. Did he? No. She opened her eyes to find him looking at her with compassion. It hurt almost as much as the telling. He'd already had me, hadn't he? A bitter laugh left her. He never touched me again. He called me the worst sort of filth, a whore whose foul cunt was poison to a man's sword. Filthy fucking bastard, Ian hissed, his teeth clenching. Her lips twisted. That he was, but in truth he only said what society believes. No. Yes, she said. A true lady remains a virgin for her husband. She doesn't go off bedding the stable lad, or the tailor's son. She lowered her lids. He might have been the vessel, but I was the source of my shame. Ian's forehead fell lightly against hers. Christ, that bastard twisted your mind. When she opened her mouth to protest, he kissed it gently. That rotten piece of filth hurt you because he was a coward and a bloody hypocrite. Daisy swallowed hard. I thought I was over it, but then you saw my back and... She closed her eyes. I feel such shame for letting him do that to me, for giving him cause to do it in the first place. Daisy girl. And nothing can change it, she hurried on. I'll always carry these marks the ugliness of it. I will always be ugly because of it. He moved then, his hand brushing away the mass of her hair cascading down her back. No, she said, twisting to move her back from view. Don't. Yes. His lips found a mark and pressed there. You are the most beautiful woman. He kissed his way along a red path. I have ever laid eyes upon. Ridiculous. He raised his head to spear her with a glance. Ever. A warm hand cupped her bottom and gave it a squeeze. Ah, Daisy girl, when you look at me with those eyes, even if they're scowling at me from over your shoulder as they are now, he smiled, you light me up. She clung to the soft bedding. She could not take his kindness, didn't know how. She wanted to run away, but he wouldn't let her. Firm but gentle hands held her as soft kisses assaulted her senses. He slid over her, his body a weight that anchored. So often she felt as if she might float away in the darkest part of the night and not a soul would be there to see her go. Ian? Tears clogged her throat. She wanted to say so much more, but didn't know how to say the words. She'd never said them to anyone. He traced the groove of her spine with his lips as if he could erase old hurts. I wouldn't take away a single scar for all the world if it meant changing the woman you are today. I... She spun around and silenced him with a kiss. He kissed her back, soft yet fierce kisses that punctuated his former words. Her throat ached as she wrapped her arms around his neck. It might never fully go away, Ian. She searched his face for any sign of wariness. These old fears, 
As much as I try to change, I might fall back into darkness now and then. Gently, he threaded his hand through her curls, spreading them about her. We are all imperfect creatures, love. I don't want perfect. I just want you. Pressed against his lean body and wrapped within the security of his arms, Daisy felt that lost part of herself finally return and slip into place. She might have wept in gratitude. Foolish man. Lovely, foolish. But he was her fool, and so she kissed him and then smoothed a lock of his hair back from his brow and studied his face, the sharp angles and sweeping planes that held both strength and vulnerability. I could love you, you know. A look of bemusement clouded his eyes, as if he wanted to believe her but couldn't, and Daisy's heart squeezed in response. She saw him reach for the careless expression he often wore, but he failed, and his voice came out rough when he spoke. I could love you, too. Chapter 33 Sometime in the night, Ian awoke with a suddenness that had him lurching upward. Panting, as though he'd run miles, he stared unseeing in the darkness. His heart pounded painfully within his chest, and for a moment he couldn't place where he was. Beside him, a feminine form stirred, and a soft hand smoothed his bare thigh. Something in him eased. Daisy. Sweat rolled down his temple as he gazed down at her. Sweet, luscious Daisy. At the sight of her, need, longing and tenderness rolled within his heart with such force that he wanted nothing more than to gather her up and squeeze her tight. The wolf inside him didn't brood. He lived in the now and the wolf was clamouring for Ian to make Daisy his in all ways. But the man in him was lost in the past. I will never be like you, forced to roam this world alone, a thing not of nature but of fearsome myth. Pain sliced through him at the remembered words. Christ, his stomach pitched. Ian swung his legs over the edge of the bed. He was going to be ill. Grabbing his dressing robe where it lay slung over a chair, he wrenched it on as he fled. His breath came in harder pants, his heart going like a metronome. Running blindly now, he found himself in the garden, the grass wet and cool beneath his feet. Moonlight warmed his skin. His kind felt the moon's rays as humans felt the sun's. Even with the warmth and the power of the moonlight, his insides were ice cold. He fell to his knees, but still he felt as though he were falling, falling without a thing to cling to. Bloody hell, he was done in. His breath came out in a wheeze as his fingers dug into the moist, fragrant earth. He wanted to be happy. He wanted it with every fibre of his being. You know as I do that my very existence is wrong. Every breath I take is an exercise in selfishness. I will not wait out my fate. Ian's arms buckled. Why? Why must he think of Macon now? But Ian knew, and he ground his teeth so he wouldn't shout. It didn't help. Black spots dotted before his eyes as he struggled for air. Footsteps sounded behind him, and he whirled around, landing on his ass. Christ! He hadn't even noticed her approaching. Daisy stopped short at his movement. Her unbound hair undulated and coiled down to her waist. Moonlight caught the golden strands and turned them silver. Her eyes, indigo in the night, were wide and troubled. Ian's fists curled tighter. He couldn't say a word, find a jest to hide behind. You are hurting, she said. His chest heaved, the feeling of falling making him dizzy. Her bare feet sunk into the grass as she drew near, closer, and he shook with the need to run. But she was upon him, her body emanating heat. He rose upon his knees as she stopped before him. Without a word, she wrapped her arms about him and drew him close. He shuddered and clutched the skirts of her dressing gown. Ian, she murmured, hold on to me. 
The acceptance in her voice choked him. His claws snagged on the satin as he clung tighter. I had a son. The confession broke from him without thought. Acid burned in his throat. Macon. Her fingers sifted through his hair. He was perfect. A good lad. The weight on his chest crushed into him, and the words came out hard. Brooding at times, but a smart lad. Ian's throat worked. I was so proud. Tell me, love, she whispered. Una. She was human. We met before I had reached maturity. She told me that our differences wouldn't matter. Daisy continued to hold him and keep him steady while his heart raced and his chest ached. Then I became lichen. I did not age, and she did. He closed his eyes and pressed his face into the safety of Daisy's bosom. Her heart beat strong and true. It did not matter to me. I loved her still, but Una could not stand it, nor could she stand the wolf within me. And Macon, she made him a confidant, told him that his life would be an endless misery, that he would become an animal. Stupid, bloody Una. A growl of rage rumbled in his chest. He hated Una in the end. Macon was thirty, so close to the change. There are signs when the time approaches. He tried to enjoy life, women, but he began to withdraw. And then he... Shit. Ian could not breathe. He fucking killed himself. Christ. His voice was too high, too thin. Daisy's arms held him tight, so tight he could not fall through the black hole that opened up beneath him when he thought of Macon. Macon, who had flung himself off the high tower of their ancestral keep in Scotland. Macon's head crushed on the pavers, blood pooling around him, Macon's body twisted and broken. Ian. Oh, Ian. She rocked him gently. He left a note said he would not turn into me, wouldn't become a thing destined to be alone, trapped in a body that would not die. And everything in Ian's world had stopped. He would no longer be a lichen. He would ignore that side of himself. Until now. Una faded away after that, and cursed him with each dying breath she took. He hadn't found it in himself to grieve her loss until years afterward. A broken heart, Daisy whispered, and then kissed the top of his head. Ian, love. God, I am a hypocrite, he said. I tell you to let go of the past when I cannot release mine. Her hand was in his hair, stroking, petting. Perhaps there are some things we can't let go of, but simply accept as over. He would. If she was his future... He would accept the past for her. She held him until he could breathe properly, and the black thing that threatened to take him slipped back into the shadows. Ian's grip upon her skirts eased, and his hands slid to her hips. He did not want to become like me. He didn't want to be a monster. When he looked up at her, she touched his cheek tenderly. You are not a monster, but a man. Her fingers spread, bracketing his jaw. The best man I've ever known. Ah, but she killed him. She had cut out his heart and taken it for her own. I want to marry you. He winced, cursing himself for letting the words spill out. Daisy's hand fell away. What? He wouldn't let her go. It's happening again, and I can't seem to fight it. I want to be with you, take you to the theatre, to parties and balls. I don't want the world to assume you are my mistress, because you deserve to be a wife. A wife who can hold her head up high when out in public. My wife. And it tears into my soul because I should not want it. I should let you go. He leaned into her. She smelled of cool silk and warm roses. She smelled of home. I am afraid, eh? Bloody terrified of history repeating itself. He wrapped his arms about her waist and held on tightly. 
but I want you more. Do you understand? I feel free when I am with you, happy. You are the gift I never saw coming. She was quiet, and he knew it would end now. But a man could ignore his fate for only so long. Soft hands touched his cheeks, saving him from further humiliation. She tilted his head back, and he made himself look at her. Then have me, she said, throwing him off kilter. He blinked up at her, not understanding. Have you not heard a word I said, lass? Her cheeks trembled as she smiled, a weak smile but there, shining in the moonlight. A rustling sounded around them. Fingers of grass brushed his bare legs as they began to lengthen. We've both lived in fear for so long, denying what we are to the world, to ourselves, and what good has come of it? I don't want to live that way any more, Ian. Her finger traced his ear. I am afraid too, she said. Afraid that when the time comes, I will not be any different than Una. You are already different than Una. You are... You, brave, proud, his other half. Fragrance bloomed as the grass grew lush and wild flowers burst free beneath the moon's bright glow. It was magic, perhaps, or all in his mind. He did not care, not in this moment when his hope had finally returned. His only care was for her. Daisy's thumb traced his bottom lip, and he caught it up as she let go of a sigh. But I'll have you, she whispered. Joy surged through his chest like wildfire. Because I too want you more than I am afraid. He pulled her down into his lap, and she laughed a bit as he peppered her face with kisses. Daisy. He tumbled them down onto the dewy grass, now thick with flowers, and rolled on his back to protect her even as his hands slipped into her gown. She made an appreciative noise. Greedy thing that she was, she ripped his robe open and ran her hands over his chest. His beast preened right along with him. A sigh escaped her when he pulled her close, laying them skin to skin. She raked her fingers through his hair. This is madness, Ian, you know that, don't you? But her gaze was without fear. He brought her closer until there was not space between them. And yet it is the only thing that has ever felt completely right. His mouth found hers, and he drank her in. His Daisy Meg. She would be his wife. In the comfort of Ian's bed, Daisy smiled. I want to marry you. She'd awoke in his arms, her fingers threaded through the strands of his hair that shone with glints of copper and bronze in the morning sun. Barbaric and untamed his hair maybe, but Daisy rather liked it long. She'd stroked the glossy mane, enjoying the feel of it running through her fingers, until he opened his eyes with a smile and a sigh. He'd canted his head into her touch and closed his eyes with a grunt of satisfaction. So it's true, she'd said. Wolves do like to be petted. Men too. With a contented grumble, He'd moved his warm, hard body over her, and then into her, making them both sigh as he sank deep. He made lazy love to her in the morning sun, whispering wicked things in her ear, kissing her mouth until she fell into a haze of lust and need. He made her laugh and dive under the covers when he rang for a bowl of melted butter, and she'd made him cry out and beg when she followed through on her promise. She ought to be afraid at the depth of her happiness, yet she was not. When she thought of marrying Ian and of sharing mornings just like this with him, she felt not shame or worry, but a fluttery warmth that made her lay a hand upon her belly to calm herself. And yet she was calm, surprisingly so. He would not hurt her. He'd seen her worst and not turned away. In the comfort of their bed, Daisy smiled too. Now she could relax, and perhaps the throbbing headaches that plagued her of late, the sore throats and the constant tightness in her muscles would fade. In fact, she would celebrate now by soaking in a hot bath. Sun dappled the room with brilliant strips of gold as she padded naked over to the bathing room. Waiting for the tub to fill, 
Daisy brushed out her hair. A glimpse in Ian's full-length mirror stopped her short. Just below her hairline was a red bump. It might have been the odd pimple or a bug bite, but the sight of the sore sent a violent chill through her, for it lay in the exact spot where the werewolf had bitten her. With trembling hands she inspected it. Hard and red, just touching it made her heart flip. Dread clamoured like warning bells. Daisy swallowed with difficulty and prepared to dress instead. Chapter 34 Ian had woken up surrounded by the soft warmth of Daisy. If there was a better way to greet the day, he could not think of it. They had continued their play, and his happiness had swelled. But when he'd finally left her to dress for the day, dark thoughts began to creep in. She would marry him. Despite everything he'd confessed, she had agreed. The baser part of his soul wanted to haul her down here, find a priest and bind her to him now before she came to her senses. But he knew full well that marriage vows were not a guarantee, nor a promise of everlasting happiness. A feeling much like guilt writhed in his guts. He should have left things as they were and not pressed her into this rash action. Guilt and fear. Fear was gaining. Every time he stopped moving, it crept along his spine with insidious hands. What if she came to regret him? What if he couldn't stand seeing her age and die? Dressing, without the aid of a missing and most likely surly talent, Ian spent the time waiting for Daisy to finish her much longer dressing ritual by going for a walk in his garden. Prowling his garden would be more accurate. He longed to run, but he had no intention of leaving Daisy alone. When he thought of what she'd endured, his blood boiled. If the bastard Craigmore weren't already dead, Ian would surely tear his cods off and feed them to him. No closer to feeling content, he ended up in the corner of his terrace, taking solace under the shade of a potted peach tree as the sun started to rise higher in the sky and the heat of the day took hold. Through the twitter of birdsong, he heard the light swish of skirts as a woman approached the terrace doors and then her scent as she opened them to step out into the sun. Unfortunately, it was the wrong scent. A wash of ambergris and figs touched his nose. Her golden-brown hair gleamed in the light and then darkened as she walked beneath the shade of the peach tree. Ranulph, Mary Chase said with a nod of her head. He'd ignore her cheek for addressing him by his brother's title for now. Miss Chase, you have news for me? Yes, sire. Spending much of her time in her spectral form lent her physical body an effortless grace as she glided closer. I believe I've found your werewolf. Ian tensed. You've been following Connell. He knew this. Thus he knew what was coming. In his heart he was almost glad. Glad to have a reason to overthrow his brother that did not involve the machinations of others. Despite what sort of leader Connell was, or what he had done, he was still Ian's brother. Regret and soul-deep sorrow was the constant mix of emotion when Ian thought of Connell. Mary Chase's luminous eyes took in his struggle, and she lowered her lids as if in sympathy. I believe so. Her rosebud mouth opened to continue, but she suddenly stiffened. Ian turned to watch Talent walk onto the terrace. He'd been aware of Talent drawing near, but hadn't thought that Mary Chase would realise it so quickly as well. Gims did not possess the lichen's superior sense of smell. His curiosity grew as Talent skidded to a stop upon seeing her. His valet's face twisted in an ill-disguised sneer of disgust. You! Mary Chase's expression remained serene. Yes, me. How observant you are, Mr. Talent. Dark clouds gathered over Talent's countenance. Any moment now the lad would go off. Ian didn't understand the animosity between them. As far as he knew, they'd met only twice before, and on both occasions hadn't exchanged more than two words, but Ian needed to hear information, not play nanny to bickering children. 
Your news, if you please, Miss Chase. Mary inclined her head in that floating manner of hers. Last night, Lyle and Connell talked about the werewolf and Ian Ranolph. I could not get too close, but I heard them say they were going to address the problem tonight. How? Talent asked. She flicked him an irritated glance, but looked to Ian when she answered. I don't know what they plan to do, but they are going to Buckingham Palace. Ian straightened. The little bugger. The palace was abandoned and so large and isolated by its massive grounds that the howls of a werewolf might go unnoticed. They are set to go at midnight, Mary said. Then we will go there before they can move him. You can't be thinking about trusting her. Talent's skull twisted. She's an unholy body thief. Mary Chase bristled. And you? Whose identity do you steal when you think no one is looking? Talent went as white as paper, and then five shades of red. But he got a hold of himself and turned his back on her. Sir, he said to Ian, let me take you in. If it is a trap, at least I'll be there to help you. I need you to watch over Daisy. Talent frowned, and Ian placed a hand upon the lad's shoulder, for he knew the tenderness of a man's pride. I'm leaving you to watch my heart, Jack. The lad appeared a bit mollified, but Mary Chase's expression made it clear what she thought of Talent's assignment, and the colour was soon rising once more up Talent's neck. Ian stepped between them before any more squabbles broke out. The wear dies tonight. A surge of adrenaline lit over him at the idea. When we are done there, I'm going for Connell. As you wish, Ranulph. Mary Chase left the terrace in a delicate swirl of skirts and flowing hair. I don't trust her, Talent muttered as he watched her go. But Ian's mind was on other things, such as how the hell he was going to take down the wear, and what he was going to do with Daisy. Back in his cage, the wolf cowered in the corner of it, as far away as he could get from the stink of his waste that spilled across the floor. They didn't clean the cage anymore, didn't give him drugs to numb the pain. Pain, 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 a chant that went through his head as he slammed his aching skull against the walls. Stop! The wolf lunged at the bars, his teeth snapping, claws raking against the thick iron in an effort to get to the lichen. But the man danced back with a laugh, taunting Buck. Temper, lad! Lad! The lichen called him that when the wolf had been a man. The man inside the wolf surged to the skin for a moment, screaming his hate and rage as well. He hated the lichen too. The lichen's grin widened. Ah, your rage is a glorious thing, yet you aim it at the wrong man. Have you not been kept safe all these years, safe from execution? Hell, you've even had a woman, as deformed as you are. His woman. The man inside the wolf cried out in sorrow. Your clan cared for you. The lichen stepped near, his eyes flashing when he was the one that put you in the grave. The wolf whined, his legs wobbling beneath him, buried in the dark, hardwood coffin above his head, his fingers worn to the bone as he clawed his way out through the wood and earth, agony knifed into his skull and he howled. Ah, oh, yes, you're remembering a bit of it, aren't you? The lichen's voice turned soothing. Remembering how he left you behind, how he went on with his life, let your mother rot as if she was nothing until she too faded away. Dizziness threatened. He remembered the lichen with the blue eyes, a calm voice, safety, comfort, home. The man inside wanted to remember, but the wolf did not. The wolf ground his head into the stone wall, letting the pain lance him and take away the memories as the man raged and rattled about within the wolf's brain. And now he has your woman. Likely he's fucking her right now. 
Man and wolf went wild, slamming as one into the bars. The wolf's bones cracked, blood flowed, his fangs scraping iron and tasting it on his tongue, and the lichen just laughed. Soon, Macon, soon you can have your revenge. Daisy made her visit when she knew Miranda was out consoling Poppy, who was distraught over Winston's withdrawal. Otherwise, Daisy would not be able to face this. Although she wasn't expected, her brother-in-law received her immediately. Daisy. Archer's silvery eyes travelled over her face in concerned assessment. Are you well? Nerves swarmed like angry bees within Daisy's belly as she clutched the ends of her cloak. That is the problem, Archer. I'm not sure. His handsome face darkened. Is it Northrop? Has he done something to upset you? She rather thought Ian would be in for another thrashing should she answer yes. A wobbling smile touched her lips, for despite his taciturn demeanour, Archer cared for her like a brother. No, nothing like that. Ian is... He is good to me, Archer. Some of the tension left Archer as he nodded, sending a thick black curl falling over his brow. I never thought I'd say this, but I am glad. The edges of his mouth pinched as though he fought to keep from speaking. He was my closest friend, you know, once upon a time. Archer scowled down at his hand, and she wondered if he was remembering when he'd been altered, half man, half demon. Miranda had loved him regardless, and Daisy could see why. He was loyal and honest, a good man. Ian has changed, he said. I see in him the man he was before. If he ever lets himself swallow his pride, she said, suppressing her sad smile, I think he would ask to be your friend once more. God, she hoped it were true. Archer made a masculine noise of ambivalence, designed, she supposed, to make her think he didn't care. Unfortunately, she needed him to care, for Ian's sake. For a moment, she couldn't breathe past the pain and terror that clutched her heart. He'll need you, Archer, she said when she could speak. Even if he won't admit it, he will. His head shot up, his eyes alert and worried. Tell me why you are here, sister. With a shaking breath, she unclasped her cloak. Daisy swallowed hard. I need you to look at something. In a professional capacity, she added when Archer's eyes widened. His expression turned to stone, and she knew he was hardening his heart, much as she prepared to do. When he spoke, his voice was calm, authoritative. Let us go to my library. Chapter 35 What are you reading? Daisy asked a silent, dour Northrop, who thumbed through a small leather notebook as they sat in a small corner table at the plough and harrow, where they had stopped to take supper. She could not think of him as Ian when he was like this, not when he brooded like a stranger. Soon after she'd returned from Archer's house, Ian's manner had changed, just as thoroughly as his donning of new clothes. So thoroughly, in fact, she had not been able to summon the courage to tell him what she must. Although polite and attentive when need be, Ian was distant now, avoiding her gaze and fidgeting as though his skin were too tight for his frame. It was he who had suggested they dine out. Out being among people and away from the threat of privacy, and the bedroom, she supposed bitterly. She swallowed down the ball of hurt that seemed lodged in her throat. Had he regretted proposing to her? Perhaps it was for the best. She needed to tell him. Terror rushed over her so quick and cold that her breath hitched. Her fists bore down on the scarred wood of the table. Well, she pressed, if only to speak and not cry. Later. She would think about the future later. Are you going to respond? What do you have there? Northrop's wide shoulders hunched as far as his perfectly cut coat would let them. Winston Lane's notebook. Ian, 
You can't steal Winston's notebook. His brows furrowed as he read. It appears that I can and did love. His fingers tapped an idle beat as the scowl on his face grew. It's amoral to steal from an invalid. He made a noise but did not look up. It's amoral to let a man's attacker go free too. I should think the ends justify the means here. Bosh! Daisy sat back, her chair scraping a bit on the wood floor from the force. Around her was the happy laughter of men drinking at the bar, and the warm scent of good food. Usually, the familiar pub was a balm when her nerves were frayed. Tonight, it served only to exacerbate her upset. She pointed to the battered notebook. What is in there that has caught your undivided attention? May we start with that? Daisy did not believe for one moment whatever it was had him in this mood. It was her. A war of emotions played over his face as they stared at each other from across the divide of the table. Fear, yearning, and frustration flickered in his gaze. His knuckles stood out bone white against the worn wood, and as much as she longed to cover his hand with hers, she did not. Not when she knew in her belly that she was the cause of his current torment. Finally, he blinked and let go of a breath with a long sigh. Lane was attacked at the perfumer's shack. They found Lane's assistant, John Sheridan, at the scene. According to these notes, Lane discovered that the perfumer was a Mr. Ned Montgomery, who, incidentally, was secretly engaged to Miss Mary Fenn, the first known victim of the werewolf. Ah, so the perfumer is our killer? No, the perfumer is most likely the chap we found in the shack. Daisy repressed a huff of annoyance. You're not making very much sense, you know. If you'd let me explain, I might. Northrop ignored her glare, but she saw the wry humour in his expression as he thumbed the edge of the notebook. The perfumer had a sister, Miss Lucy Montgomery. Northrop's eyes gleamed with a dangerous light. Aside from being Ned's sister. Miss Lucy was also employed as a nursemaid at Ranulph House. It isn't a far stretch to assume that she had been nursing a lichen plagued with syphilis. The gleam grew deadly. My bastard brother has been lying to me. It might be a coincidence. Perhaps Connell isn't involved at all. Daisy knew that no matter what Ian said, the notion of killing his brother ate at his heart. And what of the stick pin? Northrop countered. Perhaps someone nicked that stick pin from him. Nicked? Northrop repeated with a repressed smile. For a breath-stealing moment, his blue eyes warmed and her insides fluttered, but he shook his head as if to clear it, and the connection was broken. A nice thought, he said with his silk and gravel voice. Well, could it be yours? Maybe someone nicked it from you. He didn't laugh at her tease. No, lass, my stick pin is long gone. A shadow of grief fell across his face. I buried it with my son. She touched him then, because she couldn't bear not to any longer. His hand was warm beneath her palm. Maybe it isn't that stick pin at all, but one that resembles it. Victoria was crowned forty-six years ago. She added when he shook his head. It was so long ago. You can't expect your memory to hold so well. His smile was wide and wolfish. So you blame my faulty old man memory, do you? You are not old. An amused snort filled the air between them. I am going on one hundred and thirty-one. That is different, she said tartly. Oh, his brows slanted upward. His smile shrewd. How so? You have the vigor and appearance of a man in his prime, as you well know, you arrogant bastard. She tried to sound annoyed, but for the first time in the day, he was acting himself. She hadn't realized how much she needed his teasing, his joy, him. Northrop's white teeth flashed. Yes, vigor is quite important, is it not? Do be serious, Northrop. Ian. Ian. She corrected. Something inside of her squeezing tight.
His expression softened at the name, and she leaned closer, noting the way his nostrils flared and how the look in his eyes grew heated. She swallowed, her mouth dry, but the moment died when he spoke again. Stick pin or not, have you an explanation for Miss Montgomery's both working at Ranulph House and being intimately associated with not only a victim, but the perfumer? Daisy did not. We must warn her then. Is this what you plan to do tonight? Slowly, his thumb stroked her knuckles. No, sweet, I believe Miss Montgomery is long past help. Lane describes her as being fair of hair, blue-eyed and pretty. Ian's lids lowered. The woman we found in Ned's shack might have been so once, and Miss Montgomery was let go from Ranulph House about a month ago due to illness. Cancer, she claimed, but I'd bet my hat that it was syphilis, given to her by this mystery lichen who is now aware. Lane apparently thought as much too. Well, Daisy sat back. It appears that Winston is a better detective than you gave him credit for. He is a good man, Ian said, and I will not let his attack go unanswered. Then tell me what you plan to do, she said, not without a little exasperation. He hesitated for a fraction of a second. Well, that's the thing, love. It appears that Connell has been hiding something in Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace? She did not want to hear this. She did not. The one and only. It stunned her how well she could read him now, and she did not like what she saw. Do not tell me you plan to break into Buckingham Palace. He did not so much as blink. Fine, I won't. Wily bastard, you are mad. Ian grinned in acknowledgement, but he remained undeterred. It's not as cracked as you assume. Only a few guards remain to watch the palace, which is most likely why Connell has been using it. The little shite probably loves to thumb his nose at Victoria by hiding the werewolf there. Only a few guards? The table creaked as she leaned over it. And if you get caught, you can be charged with high treason. I will not be caught. Daisy had to take a breath to keep from shouting. Just how do you intend to get in? Ian blinked then. I'm taking Mary Chase with me. <laughs> oh, no. Daisy's hand curled into a fist upon the table. Not that, that. Moll? His lips quirked. She is not a moll. All right, perhaps she is, but she is also a very good spy. I need her to guide me in. Of course you do. Perhaps she'll let you feel her bosom as well. And Daisy would hunt her down and claw her gleaming golden eyes out. Being a fool, Ian wagged his brows. Do you think she might? Squinting, he stroked his chin. Perhaps she would at that. Gratitude for me bringing her into danger, I suppose. Oh, stop. She tossed the table linen at him, which he ducked with a laugh. I am going with you, she said when he straightened. He laughed again, and not without a little humour. You see, lass, there is where you are wrong. You, he pointed a long finger at her scowling face, are going to be nice and safe at home with talent keeping guard. She grabbed the finger and hauled his hand, and thus him, close. I do believe you must be suffering some malady of the mind if you think that will come to pass. Daisy. I am not without resources, Ian. Her curt response gave him pause. What are you saying? Daisy took a breath. I have a power as well. Oddly, he didn't look as shocked as she expected, but rather relieved. Were well, you planning to tell me any time soon? I'm telling you now. I found out the night you let your despicable brother tear you to shreds, and she braced herself. It involves dirt. Dirt, he repeated. She wrinkled her nose. Bother, I hate dirt. When he lifted his brows in exaggerated query, she sighed. You see, I can move the earth, make it quake, 
part, surge and so forth. I can control the plants, trees. He closed his eyes. I did not dream those lichens being speared by tree roots, did I? Or the flowers in the garden? I fear not. Azure blue eyes opened. Daisy girl, I cannot tell you how much it pleases me to hear that you can defend yourself when threatened. His fingers, still caught in her grip, threaded through hers and Daisy felt the warmth of his affection. Something in her relaxed. The grip on her fingers tightened and he jerked her against him. But if you think that such revelations will cause me to take leave of my senses and put you in the direct path of danger, then you've gone as daft as a wee loon. It appeared that Daisy had not gone as daft as a wee loon. Ian's colourful phrasing aside, she could not fully justify coming along with him. One fool breaking into Buckingham Palace was enough. She wouldn't distract him by waiting outside, a sitting target for whoever happened along. So here she was, cosseted away like a bloody child with talent to nanny her while Ian ran off with Mary Chase. Smothering another curse, she glared into the crackling fire burning merrily away in the small upstairs library hearth. Beside her, talent brooded for reasons of his own. When she could no longer take his burning stare, she turned to glare back at him. It was his idea for you to watch me, not mine, so kindly stop looking at me in that manner. Of course it was his idea. He crossed his arms over his chest. Before you came along, he relied on me for important tasks. Now I'm stuck watching over one of his women. One of his women? The little rat... Talent thought he knew how to get to her, did he? Is that why you do not like me? She gave Talent a thin smile. I know you don't. You have made that quite clear. Talent smirked. I wasn't going to deny it. He leaned forward suddenly, and his broad cheekbones flushed. I don't like you, because you make him weak. You distract him. Well, I'm here, aren't I? Daisy's words came out in a hiss, while he's off with that gim. She expected Talent to jump on her weakness, but he looked equally disgruntled. She's an unnatural piece, that one. Quickly, he crossed himself. Does everyone revile the poor gims? Daisy asked, a little shocked by his vehemence. His lip curled. Poor gims? They're body thieves, unholy, the dogs of our world and untrustworthy. Northrop trusts her. It should be good enough for you. And for me, she thought with a qualm. He's a fool around women, Talent said with a sneer. Loves them too much. Daisy's nails tapped along the arm of her chair as she studied the young man. He wasn't particularly handsome, not in the traditional sense of the word. Though hard, his features were even and well-formed, she suspected that when he smiled, he would be devastating in his own way. And he was not a boy, no matter how often Ian treated him as such. Talent continued to frown into the fire. Are you in love with Northrop? she asked. He jumped within his seat, his mouth hanging open. You are balmy! She offered a smile. Stranger things have happened, and you do go on rather like a jealous lover. Good God, he snarled, before leaping up to pace. In love with him? Talent spun on his heel and glared down at her. He is like a father to me, do you understand? I've been with him for years. Years I've witnessed his loneliness, and now you come along and he's out of his head. Daisy's fists clenched. Yet you begrudge his happiness with me. Because he will not survive it when you leave, Talent shouted. He was better off closed up. Better off not feeling. She did not know what happened to the man to make him have such a dim view of life, but she understood his fear. Feeling too much was a dangerous endeavour. It was on the tip of her tongue to shout at him that she would never leave Ian. Doing so would be like ripping out her own heart. But that would make her a liar. Try as she might to forget what she knew, the truth could not be ignored. 
It burrowed into her heart and made her feel ill, and so very frightened that she wanted to curl up and hide. Daisy sighed and sank back deeper into her seat. You're right. Whatever cutting retort Talent had been about to utter died a quick death in the face of her confession. What are you going on about now? Daisy's bottom lip trembled and she ducked her head, cursing herself for crying now, and in front of him of all people. I shouldn't have let it go so far, she whispered. I am not for him. She might have laughed at the way Talent's head cocked to the side, his expression utterly confounded, but she couldn't. Not when her heart was breaking. Damn it, but Ian had been right. Distraction worked for only so long. You. Talent ground his teeth before continuing. You make him happy. It was an admission dragged out with the greatest reluctance. Of that Daisy was sure. She did laugh then, but without any humour. Yes, and he makes me so very happy too. She sniffled as she went as leaky as a blasted kitchen tap. With a sound of disgust, Talent handed her his kerchief. Thank you, she said. You know, I never used to cry. It seems all I'm capable of now. If you make him happy, and he makes you happy, Talent said, then why should you care a whit what I say? She looked up at him through her watery gaze. Admitting that you aren't all knowing now, are you? When he glared, she smiled. I am human, Jack. Tears welled up again and she blinked hard. I'm going to die. She swallowed hard. Eventually, I will die. And he will remain. He opened his mouth to protest when a sharp noise from below brought him up short. He stilled and held up his hand as if to bid her quiet while he listened. The sound came again, of breaking glass. His green eyes gleamed with determination as he looked at her. Stay here. Daisy lurched to her feet, her heart pounding a wild rhythm. Before he could move away, she caught his arm. Don't go down there. Talent looked at her hand upon his arm and then up at her with pointed annoyance. Are you joking? Of course I'm going, it's my duty. Daisy didn't let go. Talent might be abrasive and pompous half of the time, but she couldn't see him hurt. It might be the werewolf. I bloody hope so. I've been itching to get my hands on that bastard. He tugged at her grip. Let it go, will you? No. She clutched him harder. Ian said you weren't a lichen. How do you even expect to fight it? Talent snorted. Now you ask me. I trust Northrop's judgment, she said. But you have no idea how strong that thing is. He laughed with equal parts mirth and outrage. Hell, woman! I am a shifter! She had no idea what a shifter was, but it did not sound very impressive. A shifter is what, exactly? Bloody... A shifter is its own beast. I can shift into any living thing. An evil smile spread over his face, and then the air about him shimmered and his body distorted. It was a quick thing, a blur of movement. Daisy gave a cry of shock and nearly fell on the floor. Talent laughed. What? Don't like what you see? She gaped back at herself. He turned into her. Her face, her figure dressed in Talent's clothes, looking back at her. Good God, she sputtered. A thought occurred to her and she yelped. You were that blasted crow who followed me. The air around him stirred as he shifted back. Quick one, aren't you? He leaned in and all the humour leached out of his expression. I can turn into anything, he said with emphasis. Even another werewolf. When Daisy blinked back at him, too dumbfounded to speak, Talent laughed heartily. She'd been correct. He was devastating when he truly smiled. Haven't you learned, woman? You've fallen off the map. Here there be monsters. Another crash stopped him cold. With a firm hand, he guided her to the chair and sat her down as if she were a child. 
Now let me go handle this one. Chapter 36 In the course of a life as long as Ian's, a man learned to be grateful for small mercies. Therefore, he was extremely grateful that the Queen eschewed living in Buckingham Palace. Breaking into the monarch's property was damning enough without having to worry about running into her person. Since she was not currently in residence, nor had been for some time, minimal security was in place. Two guards patrolled the insides, bald men who played of brag while passing a flask of gin between them. They were currently sleeping off the effect of the lord and a merry chase had snuck into their gin. Even so, Ian's footsteps made not a sound as he walked down the dank, dark corridors in the upper hall. Must thickened the air, cobwebs and dust gathering in corners, a rather sad state for the magnificent structure. He hadn't come empty-handed. Armed with two silver hunting knives and a loaded dart gun, Ian intended to put the wear down in a humane fashion and walk out with his own head intact. It was one thing to attack the wear while defending another, but he would not dishonour them both by doing so if the thing were caged. A ways in front of him, Mary Chase's spectre floated along, her form pearly white and translucent. She retained her shape and was able to give the appearance of walking when she was so inclined but more often it was easier and faster for a gim in spirit form to drift. But the longer they roamed the massive palace, the more agitated he grew. Not a soul stirred, nor was there any sign of a werewolf having inhabited the place. The hairs lifted along the back of his neck. Ian's pace quickened, his jaw growing so tight that it throbbed. When they'd come full circle yet again, he stalked toward Mary Chase's ghostly form. There is nothing here, he hissed, not a bloody thing. She frowned, the skirts of her diaphanous dress wavering in a phantom breeze. We are too late. Ian punched the wall, not giving a damn that he'd torn through the damask. There was never a wear in this place. He punched the wall again, and the picture frames rattled. Sire, do not call me that. Ian raked his hand through his hair and felt the sting of his claws. Why lure him out here? To get him away from Daisy? Ian went cold for one tense moment, but his heart eased. Talent would protect Daisy. Even so, Ian itched to return home. They've laid a trap and we've fallen right into it. Hovering beside him, Mary's spectral form frowned just before her eyes went wide with fright. Her thin, ghostly voice whispered, No! And then she disappeared. Ian's hand reached out in a reflexive attempt to pull her back when Connell's voice rang out from behind the palace walls. Hold there, brother. I've got your little puppet by the neck. Come out and play nice, will you? Or shall I pull on her strings? Ian's blood went hot as he ground his teeth. Come along then, called Connell. There's a good bitch. Connell, Lyle, and six of their guards stood in a semicircle on the Queen's back lawn. Pale moonbeams highlighted his brother's face and made it appear narrower. Otherwise, it was like looking in a bloody mirror. Ian knew then that part of him would die along with Connell this night. Mary Chase stood placid and unmoving, as though Connell's large hand was not curled around her neck and squeezing tightly. Let her go. Ian set down his weapons. She's got nothing to do with what's between us. You're a little spy. Connell shook Mary hard. Her hair tumbled over her face, but she did not move. Making bargains with the devil's minions now, are we? Sneering, he tossed her away from him, and she fell to the ground with a thud. Go, he said to Mary, before I change my mind and rip your clockwork heart out. She sprinted away without a word. So then, brother, Connell said. 
Will you be challenging me now? Or were you planning to slink about all night? He came out of the shadows, and Ian noticed that he was kitted out in formal attire, the clan Ranulf kilt wrapped about him in a bright swathe of crimson and blue, a lacy jabot frothing at his throat. He'd been expecting Ian's challenge then, as it was the custom for the king of Ranulf to wear court dress when confronting a bid for his throne. It made it a bugger to fight, but then an alpha didn't fear such trivial things. Now we'll be fine with me. Ian pulled off his coat and tossed it. The bones in his neck cracked as he rolled his shoulders. The lichens around them circled close, watching now to see who would be Alpha. Lyle stepped forward. Is it to be a formal challenge then, Ian Ranulph? I'll need to hear the words. Ian hesitated for a mere second, for there was a light in Lyle's eyes that made Ian think the lichen was pleased. He hadn't expected that. Regardless, Ian stood straight and faced his kind. I, Ian Alistair Ranulph, hereby challenge Connell George Ranulph for the throne of Ranulph, as is my right by blood, birth, and will. He gave Connell an assessing look. Or will you concede defeat and step down? It had to be said. The rules demanded it, and Ian wanted there to be no contention when he took his throne. The very thought made his body hum with impatience, his wolf alert and clamouring for blood. Connell laughed as he undid the jabot and took off his coat. I'll give you this, he said. You've kept your humour. Lyle spoke up. Challenge has been issued. He bowed his head toward Connell. Will you accept Ranulph? Aye. Connell's tone was almost bored, but Ian saw the gleam of anticipation in his brother's eyes. Well then, Ian unsheathed his claws and his fangs extended. Let's be at it. They came together in a fury of fist and claws. Snapping fangs missed Ian's neck by a hair. Ian swept a leg under Connell's feet and took him down with a thud. His claws sank into Connell's wrists, pinning him. Is that the best you got, brother? Connell spit at him. Ian didn't flinch. You are the one on the ground. Yield, Connell, and end this madness. Connell bared his teeth. Death first. Death. Ian knew it would come to this, and yet seeing his brother beneath him, his heart recoiled and his soul screamed in protest. Da wouldn't have wanted us to come to this. Da was a mad dog who deserved to be put down, and you were nothing more than his bitch. Connell lurched forward, his teeth snapping. You want my throne, then try to take it like a true alpha. Ian squeezed Connell's wrists until he felt the bones bend. True alpha, he spit out. You rule by fear, nor respect. A red haze blinded his world for a second. He snarled, his teeth aching to rip into Connell's neck. His brother merely laughed, not bothering to get free. Respect? You've let the gims and the SOS gold you into trying to take my throne, you bloody fucking puppet. Little shite! Ian smashed his forehead into Connell's nose and felt the satisfying crush of bone. You know nothing of my motives. Blood seeped over Connell's lips, colouring his fangs red. Nor you mine. You're barely a lichen now, told what to do and how to do it by a society that would destroy our kind if they knew. Which is why we keep the knowledge from them, Ian ground out. Or have you forgotten? I forget nothing, Connell bared his teeth. And if you thought I'd just roll over and let you take what's rightfully mine, then you're a bloody fool, too. With a burst of strength, Connell lunged and threw Ian off balance. Claws sliced at Ian's chest. A blow to his head had him reeling. When I finish with you, Connell said, panting, I'm going to take your woman and give her a taste of true alpha cock. Ian roared. 
ignoring the pain he slammed into his brother, punching and slicing until hot, slick blood covered his hand and hit his face. Pinning his brother, Connell jerked and swung out at Ian, but Ian wouldn't let go. His hand curled around Connell's neck, and his claws dug in until they hit his brother's spine. A fraction more, and Connell would be dead. Connell froze. Blood ran in rivulets down his face and over Ian's fingers as he stared back at him. You are done, Ian said through his teeth. Your life is in my hands, to end or to spare, you know it. Ian squeezed just a bit harder, and Connell gagged, blood bubbling from his lips. But more important, they know it. Connell's gaze darted to the group of lichens who stood tall and silent, watching and waiting. Even without looking, Ian could feel the change in them, the shifting of their loyalty to him. They knew Connell had been vanquished. It was just a matter of what sentence Ian would mete out. I am Ranulf by right and by will. The rightness of it rushed like the tide through Ian, and his wolf howled within him. Beneath Ian's hand, Connell's throat moved on a swallow, but his eyes flashed defiant. Finish it then. The sight cut into Ian. Christ, this was his brother. He knew Connell's scent as well as his own. He'd held him when their mother had passed on. His wolf did not need more blood, nor did Ian. With a sneer, he lifted his brother high and then tossed him. Connell landed on the grass with a thud. No, Ian said, looming over him. I'll not make it so easy for you. He leaned over and hauled Connell up. You get to live, knowing that I bested you, that I gave you mercy. Ian stood tall and looked at his clan. Connell Ranulf is hereby banished from Clan Ranulf. Bastard! Connell's arm hung at an odd angle as he staggered to his feet. Aye, that and more, brother. Ian advanced on him. Now tell me where the werewolf is before I chain you and have your balls cut off. Ian didn't want to kill him, but he could make him hurt. For the last time, Connell shouted in a ravaged voice, there is no where. Ian took another step, but the fight was draining out of him. Instead, he felt a sharp tug of dread. Facing his brother, he ripped the stick pin from his pocket and tossed it at Connell. Explain this then. With his good hand, Connell caught it. He glanced down at the pin and his brows furrowed. Where did you get it? Ian held his gaze, pinned to the bodice of a dead woman in Bethnal Green, a woman who wore the same perfume as every damn woman who has been killed by the wear. Connell studied him for a long moment in which not a soul stirred. Then, with rough movements, he limped over to the bundle of clothes lying on the ground and ripped something free from his jabot. The bit of gold sailed through the night before Ian plucked it from the air. Even as his hand closed around the metal, Ian could feel the blood rushing from his face and his heart stuttering within his chest. That's my pen, Connell said. A buzzing sound filled Ian's ears as he looked back at his brother. You truly thought I'd made up the werewolf as an excuse to take your throne? Aye. Connell took a hobbled step closer. It's not my pen, Ian, he said, watching him with wary intent, because Connell knew, just as Ian did, where the other pin had ended up. It's Makin's. A block of ice formed in Ian's stomach, and his blood congealed. No. He couldn't say anything more. Sweat trickled down his back. No. Pity filled Connell's eyes. Lyle told me there wasn't a wear. Ian heard the hiss of the sword a second before it sliced through Connell's neck. 
Connell's mouth hung open in surprise, even as his head hit the ground with a heavy clunk. It wobbled there, as his body fell beside it. Lyle stood on the other side, sword in hand, and his own mouth open in shock. Chapter 37 Ian could not move or speak as he stared at the beta who had just killed his brother. For a thick moment they said nothing, and then Lyle looked at the sword in his hand as if he couldn't understand how it got there. I told Connell that you crafted the tale of the wear to make him look incompetent. You? Ian's voice failed him, for his body was still numb and his brain still trying to make him believe that his brother was dead. Aye. Lyle let the sword fall, and the fool believed me, just as you believed that Connell was controlling the weir. His gaze went to Connell's body for a second, before shooting up to Ian. The clan needed a true leader. The clan needed you. Acid rose in Ian's throat and he swallowed. This was all to get me to be ruler. Got you out of that bloody pathetic state of self-pity, did it not? Lyle's face went red. You should have taken the throne when it was offered. Instead, you let your brother nearly run us into ruin. Low in Ian's gut, a tremble started, working its way up his back. Where did you get this pin, Lyle? Macon gave the pin to that girl. The wearer is Macon. Lies. It was all Ian could say. Not Macon. His son was dead. He had buried him. Grieved over his grave for a full night and day. Grieved in his heart every day thereafter. He'd already made the change. You buried him, damaged but alive. Poor lad clawed his way out and ran straight to Ranulf Hall. Only you were gone, and I was there. It wasn't true. Every cell in Ian's body screamed in denial. His head was split open. His neck broken. He was dead. Slowly, Lyle shook his head, and Ian saw the truth in his eyes. He just needed time to heal. Why would he? Ian's breath hitched. The wear was sick with syphilis. Lyle nodded as if seeing the understanding come over Ian's face. He had the pox. Said he didn't want you or Una to see him that way. Hell, it's why he tried to kill himself. Blood thundered in Ian's ears as he finally looked at the man who had turned his life upside down. Have you no sense? No notion of what was in store for him? Lyle's chin lifted. Gave him a nurse, didn't I? Made him as comfortable as I could. Didn't expect him to turn when the nurse died, but when he did, I saw the opportunity for what it was. It was all Ian could do not to be ill. Bile surged up strong and burning. Sweet Jesus, Ian wanted to sob, beat Lyle's face to a pulp, only he was frozen. Rage pulsed through his temples and set his teeth grinding. Why? He bit back a growl, his limbs quivering with rage, held in tight rein. Why did you keep him from me? Ian's body came to vivid life. Why, you twisted mad fuck, he asked. Lyle took a shuddering breath. Jesus, he begged. I could not deny him. I loved him like a son. He was my son, not yours. The belligerent look in Lyle's eyes flashed to fury. He should have been mine. Ian's heart lurched. You never even looked at Una. I could give a shite about Una. Lyle flung his arms wide. I never found a woman who could give me offspring. You did. You the favoured son who didn't even want the throne, who let an incompetent rule. You, who would have killed Macon had you known. I would have tried to help him. I would not have let him suffer. 
You would have bloody put him down. Where is he? Ian roared. Lyle palmed the sword as though it could keep him safe. You were supposed to think Connell was to blame for everything. After you killed him, that's what you would think, I. Eh? He shook his head. After all, I couldn't have you distracted by another human, so I'll let Mickin out to play. Daisy. In one leap, Ian tackled Lyle. They rolled, grass and sky a dark blur. Lyle might have spent his life as a beta, but he was strong and a born fighter. Lyle's body shifted and grew, his wolf rising so close to the fore that he barely appeared human. Sharp teeth sank into Ian's arm, hitting the bone. On a shout, Ian punched Lyle hard in the temple, once, then twice. The side of Lyle's head dented in as his skull cracked and his hold on Ian failed. No, shouted Lyle. I'll not die because of another fucking Ranulf. Before Ian's eyes, Lyle turned to full-out werewolf. Fur tickled his nose, the wild scent of beast clogging his throat, and then Ian was tossed back, flying into the air by the superior strength of the wolf. Bloody hell, the man had turned with the ease of breathing. He'd set his wolf free. Ian's mind reeled at the possibility, while his wolf howled to be free as well. Let me... Just let me. Claws gouged the flesh on Ian's shoulder as Ian rolled at the last moment. Another swipe of Lyle's claws nearly eviscerated Ian. On a growl, he kicked Lyle's snout. The wear barely staggered. He was too strong in this form. Putting his back into it, Ian lunged, tackling the wolf and crushing its ribs. Lyle twisted his hind legs finding Ian's exposed belly and sinking in. Pain burst in brilliant colour behind Ian's lids. Blood pooled in his mouth. He caught sight of the glowing moon, and he thought of death and Daisy. Everything slowed, his breath, the beat of his heart. You failed her too, McRanoff. She'll know it when she dies. Lyle's thoughts were in his head, ringing as clear as a death knell. Daisy. Lyle was stronger, but an alpha's will was greater than strength. This conniving bastard would not take another thing from Ian. Conviction rushed like wildfire through his flesh. Without another thought, he burst forward, urgency and need burning his blood. Strength and power as he'd never experienced surged through him with such force that he barely felt the pain lancing his body. On the next breath, he was on four legs, and Lyle was scrambling back. Free. Free. His wolf was a shout in his mind. Not his mind any more, but the wolf's. And he lay trapped, unable to control his limbs. Panic rose like acid. Calm. Oddly, the wolf soothed him. The wolf knew what to do. Daisy, save her. Kill Lyle. These things were simple in its mind. The wolf would take care of him. He would protect his mate. On a snarl, he flew up and clamped down on Lyle's neck. His teeth sank past thick fur into the other wear's tender throat and slicing through the jugular. He shook the dying wolf like a rag, severing his spine, ending his life. Blood coated his tongue as he let the wear drop. The wolf felt a keen surge of victory, but deep in the corners of his mind, the man cried for all that he'd lost. The lichen men around him kneeled, but the wolf didn't acknowledge them. He was already running across the lawn, his paws sinking into the grass, his heart threatening to burst for he knew he would be too late. It was too quiet. Daisy sat in the chair with her knees drawn up and her arms locked around them. It was a childish pose, but she did not particularly care at the moment. Talent had been gone for too long. There had been no sounds of fighting, no call for her to come out. It was as if he'd up and disappeared. Cursing, 
she got to her feet and paced the floor. All was silent, still, too still. She could not stay here, waiting for whatever it was to come up and claim her. Going to the French windows that opened up onto a small balcony, she looked out into the dark night. The only light came from the gibbous moon overhead. The marble terrace gleamed icy blue, punctuated here and there by the dark shadows of potted trees. Just beyond lay a wide lawn that stretched down to the glittering river, winking through a row of stately trees. Ordinarily, she would think it madness to leave a house for the outdoors. Only right now, she felt the moonlight on her face and saw the sway of the tree limbs and felt the call of nature. Out there was her strength. She felt it now, just like a rush of warm light through her veins. Out there is where she would be safe. Gathering her skirts with resolve, she went out to the balcony and then hefted herself over the edge. Her footing was sure as she climbed down the trellis. She'd climbed up and down her father's trellis many times before, the naughty daughter who snuck out at night to carouse in taverns because she craved laughter and life so very much she'd rather take the risk and live it. How she missed being that girl. Emotion clogged her throat as she jumped lightly from the last rung and landed with sure feet. Creeping along, she made it as far as the middle of the terrace when she realized something was amiss. The coppery tang of blood touched her nose. Walking on heavy feet, she followed the smell to the stairs that led to the garden. Her heels slid away as she came sharply to a halt before a black pool of blood on the white marble. Breath caught in her throat as she slowly turned toward the spill. A scream rose and died on her lips. Talent lay in a heap at the foot of the stairwell. His right arm was a stump, his body ravaged. She thought him dead, but he moved as if hearing her. One green eye, bloodied and raw, opened. His lips worked for a moment. Run. She couldn't move, couldn't leave him to this. He snarled, Run! As if giving her wings, his command made her fly down the stairs and toward the garden. Her sweaty fingers slipped on her skirts as she lifted them high. A rose garden flanked the sides of the terrace where, in June, the thick, sweet scent of their blooms would surely perfume the air. Now, however, they were merely hard, twisted roots, cut short for the winter. A low, distinct growl stopped her cold on the path. Everything in her went still. Past the thundering of her heart and the panting of her breath came the click of claws upon the marble and the wild, noxious, sweet scent of wolf and sickness. He was behind her. Convulsively she swallowed. On trembling legs she turned. Up close, she finally got a good look at him. His head was deformed, massive tumours pulling his eyes far apart, sending his jaw askew. Amber eyes held such pain that Daisy felt not solely terror, but pity as well. Pity that died when the were snarled and headed for her. A surge lit through Daisy in answer, the strange feeling of power and pressure that throbbed in her belly and down to her fingertips. The ground rumbled for a moment, and then the sharp crackle of rose bushes growing rent the air. Daisy's insides quaked. Faster! More! The hard, thorny branches grew up and out, creating a wall around her. The wear attacked, running so fast that Daisy's breath caught. The impact cracked the branches. Knife-sharp claws slashed at the wood, splintering it. Fear surged through her limbs and her power slipped. The roots faltered. More. Stronger. Focus. Thorns and branches wrapped tight around werewolf limbs, holding the beast off but not stopping him. One foreleg broke free, and then another. The wolf's eyes were on her, a promise gleaming in them. Daisy edged back, her heart pounding, 
her breath caught in a ball of terror in her throat. Desperately, she drew on the feeling within her, and the rose branches snaked out, tangling around the ware again and again, but it was not enough. With a bone-shaking howl, the beast writhed and the branches shattered like glass. Daisy stumbled back, her strength sputtering like an empty lamp. The werewolf stopped and cocked his head as though confused. Daisy's jaw clenched tight enough to ache before she forced herself to ease, trying to ignore the blood that caked the wear's coat. Talent's blood. She froze upon the ground, too terrified to do anything more but wait. It limped forward, one foreleg shorter than the other due to his humped back. Light from the house windows hit his molted coat, highlighting the open sores that plagued him and the wounds from the thorns. Quite suddenly she wanted to cry. This was her future too, this suffering and deformity. You hurt, don't you? Halting, the wear whined and shifted his weight from one leg to another. A world of agony lay in its eyes. I'm sorry, she whispered, her voice too thin. His head lowered, yet a growl rumbled in his chest. In a flash, he snapped his teeth at her, snarling and growling. Her fingers clenched on air. Ian! She wanted Ian! Please let him be on his way. Let me help you. I want to help you. He whined again, his massive head swaying as he cowered. Pain. I feel pain. Daisy's heart skipped a beat, for she distinctly heard the words within her head. Licking her dry lips, she tried again. Let me talk to the man. He shuddered violently, keening. The man, she said. Let him come and I can help you both. The wolf sighed, and his head sank down. The snap and pop of his bones filled the night as he shifted, and Daisy was left staring at a man. No better off in his human form, his naked, twisted body fell to a heap upon the floor. There he trembled, the sores that covered him weeping and swollen. Disease had destroyed this man, ruining his body and his reason. She feared she might be ill. A gnarled hand lifted to the massive tumour on his head that had deformed his face into something barely human. A pitiful cry broke from him. Kill me, he rasped, bleary eyes lifted to hers. I cannot live as this. Daisy's heart threatened to pound out of her chest. I cannot, he snarled, smashing his fist into his skull. Kill me, kill me. He howled, his body rocking. Pain, too much. Would someone take pity on her, were it she who suffered? Did he not deserve compassion? A sob tore from her. Let me get someone to help you. His voice grew thready, his displaced eyes desperate as he looked at her. You, I want it to be you, please. He curled in on himself with a groan. Please, Lucy, I tried to find you. Lucy, he thought she was his love. All this time he'd been looking for his love. She blinked back her tears. These other women smell of you, but were not. A growl rumbled in his chest and fangs grew. They were not. But I am here now, Daisy said quickly, soothing him with her voice and praying he would not notice his mistake. She thought of Alex's ravaged body and swallowed hard. What can I do for you? Take my head. She blanched. Anything but that. His breath rattled. Shred my heart with silver. A knife. I cannot live like this. And it will come back. The madness. The wolf wants to die too. You promised to help him. For a long moment she could only stare, 
To kill in cold blood was something beyond her. Yet to live as he did, it was no life. Her eyes burned with unshed tears. Again came the hard rolling of her stomach and the urge to cast up her accounts. She took a deep breath. All right. He didn't stop her as she stumbled away past Talent, who had either passed out or died. She was too afraid to look. Moving stiffly, she found the butler's pantry and the silver carving knife within. Her heart beat a fierce tattoo, her mind numb to all thought but one. She might have run away, yet she could not. She would help this man, this harbinger of her fate. His skin was clammy, his breath a wheezing rattle as she knelt beside him. His eyes, however, were lucid as he gazed up at her. I'm sorry, he whispered, for all of it. Tears blurred her view of him. I know. Extreme pain, tumours and madness. They were the tools of destruction for those suffering from syphilis, a fate worse than any death. Yet she could not make herself move. Not your fault. His voice was gentle, and when she looked down at him, he touched her arm. Never was. God, he appeared a man no older than thirty. How long had he been like this? Her arm shook so badly that she could barely raise it. Her nerves jumped when his hand closed over hers. His gaze grew dazed. I only wanted to see you once more, Lucy Love. Of course, she whispered. I wanted to see you too. Rest now. Everything will be all right. In the end, it was his strength and her hand that plunged the knife down between his ribs, past muscle and into the heart. With a hard jerk of his body, he wrenched the knife back and forth. All the while, Daisy's hand caught below his, the hilt of the knife slippery against her skin. The man took his last breath in a gurgled sigh of blood. On a cry, she scrambled far away from him and curled up by a ravaged rose bush. Weary to the bone, she rested her head upon her arms and sighed. It was done. For him. Her fear, however, went so deep that she could not think to move. Her small piece was shattered when the terrace doors slammed open with enough force to send one hanging on its hinge. A scream leaped up in her throat as an enormous brown wolf charged onto the terrace. It skidded to a stop when he spied her. Daisy's mouth went dry. Dear God, but it was magnificent. This was not the poor, deformed creature she'd help pass on, but a full-out wolf, enormous in form, but graceful and proud. The beast's thick, auburn coat gleamed with blood, his wild blue eyes intent upon her, and then the bottom fell out of her world. Those eyes! Ian's eyes! Oh, Ian! She wanted to scream in rage and sorrow. Ian had turned. Daisy put her hand to her breast to ease the pain there. The wolf growled. She did not move, but her mind raced. She'd spoken to the sick where. The wolf had set the man free. Could she reach Ian? She would. She had to. Hello, she said calmly. A lie for her heart threatened to burst it pounded so hard. I know you, she said slowly, softly. I've been waiting to meet you. The wolf whined, cocking his head a touch. He took a tentative step forward. Yes, she said pretending that her breath wasn't ragged, that her fingers did not shake. Come to me. Let me touch you. With a grunt it moved, a quick lope that had it knocking against her, his big head nudging her shoulder hard. A gasp burst from her, but she did what instinct prompted and threaded her fingers through the dense, coarse hair at the wolf's neck. The wolf's eyes narrowed, not in aggression, but pleasure. With a sigh, she stroked his fur. If you're here, you must have had to protect Ian. 
It was the only reason Daisy could think of. Ian simply wouldn't lose control of his wolf unless it had been his last choice. Yes, save you. She heard the words inside her head, and the voice was Ian's, and not. It was rougher, more primal. The wolf's. Daisy's breath caught and her eyes burned. You've done well, so well. Save you from the wear. Its blue gaze moved past her to rest on the dead man. A keening noise sounded low in the wolf's throat, and it turned away from the sight as if it pained him. I am so proud, she murmured as the wolf bunted his snout under her chin. The hit rattled her teeth. Before she could move, gentle fangs took hold of her lower jaw, but the wolf did nothing more than hold her still. A claim. With a smile, she pushed him back. No more of that. She was insane, but could only hope the wolf understood. It seemed to, for it simply panted and nudged her once more. Daisy wrapped her arms around his neck. Let him come back, she whispered. I cannot lose him. The wolf whined, and she stroked his fur. He knows how to set you free again. He will but I need him now. The wolf stilled and her heart thundered. Ian, she pled, come back to me. Come back. Dread pulled at her insides for a cold moment, and then the wolf stirred. Bones cracked and popped, the body around her arms shrinking. In the next breath, she felt smooth, hot skin, and Ian was in her arms, as weak as a pup as he fell to his knees. His chest heaved as he glanced up at her with reddened eyes. I think, he said, I am going to be ill. He clung to her, his body damp with sweat and shaking. Daisy held him close, but she felt him stiffen as he caught sight of the twisted body on the ground. All colour leached from his face, and he wilted. Macon. Such pain in that utterance. Daisy's blood stilled. Macon. She glanced at the poor body of the man and back to Ian, who tore himself from her grasp and stumbled forward. Devastation marked every line of his countenance. I had a son. Macon. He was perfect, a good lad. Her head went light. Oh, God, Ian's child. A sharp pain lanced her chest. Ian, what did I do? Ian's breath rattled as he sank to the ground next to the body. But he died, she said in a panic. You said he died. Ian did not look at her. He'd already turned. His throat worked. I... I did not know. Lightly, as if he feared the body would break. Ian gathered his son against himself. Macon's head lolled back, his eyes sightless and staring. Daisy gripped herself so tightly her knuckles cracked. No, 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 not this. I killed him. Such a stupid thing to say. What had she done? Yes. Ian did not take his eyes from his son. Ian! Her voice cracked. I'm... I did not know. He didn't seem to hear her. Lyle had him. All this time, watching my son go mad. A grand joke. Lyle? She thought of the crafty lichen who'd been Connell's right hand. He'd been the one to capture them at the cemetery. He'd been everywhere. Lyle kept him when he turned. All this time he was playing Connell and me against each other. He used Macon so I would challenge Connell, and it worked. Ian's shoulders lifted on a breath. My brother is dead, and my son. Oh, Ian. Were Lyle here, Daisy would kill him. Yet she knew in her bones that he was already dead. Ian would not have let him live after such a betrayal. Are you hurt? Still, Ian would not look her way. Suddenly she was glad for it. She could not bear to see his eyes in the accusation there. 
She deserved it, but she could not bear it. No, I... He... Daisy couldn't bring herself to say that Macon had begged for death. It sounded like an excuse. She wouldn't excuse herself for it. Ian's head fell forward, his hair swinging down to hide his face. Shame choked Daisy as she watched him. She wanted to say she was sorry, but knew it wouldn't matter. When he finally spoke, his voice was a broken thing that made her heart ache. I need to bury him. She licked her dry lips. I'll help you. No. He took another breath. Just, just go into the house. She went, because it was the only thing she could do for him. Chapter 38 It was not Ian who sought her out hours later, but Talent. Daisy stirred from her cold spot in the settee as he limped into her bedroom, his battered body bandaged up like a mummy. You should be in bed, she said. Her throat ached and her eyes burned, but the man before her looked like hell. He slumped onto the seat beside her and closed his eyes. Doesn't matter where I am, he said. I'll hurt like a bitch regardless. Your arm. It was missing below his elbow. Guilt flooded her at the sight. He had been defending her. We'll grow back, eventually. He did not sound very concerned, merely annoyed. Jesus, it's cold in here. Haven't you any notion of how to start a fire? He cracked one eye open. Or are we feeling sorry for ourselves? She didn't rise to his bait, but stood and lit the coals that had been laid out, and then found her thick shawl to drape over him. Talent grunted in acknowledgement and kept his eyes closed. He didn't try to speak any more, for which Daisy was truly grateful, but simply sat with her for a long while as they stared into the fire. Every bone in her body hurt. She ought to go home. Only that place didn't feel like her home. Ian was her home, and she destroyed it. Eventually, she knew he'd seek her out and tell her to go. Until then, she would remain hiding away in cowardly fashion and aching to hold him. You had no choice. She sucked in a breath at the sound of Talent's voice. It took her a moment to find her own voice. It doesn't matter. It should. Macon was insane and hurting. He turned his head to look at her. I heard him beg you. Daisy winced, but he kept on. You did him a kindness. Ian will understand. Hell, you called him back after the wolf claimed him. He ought to be thanking you. Her laugh was weak and pained. It was his will and the wolf's trust that brought him back, not I. And as for his son, I fear logic and emotion never go hand in hand. No, Ian said from the door. They don't. Daisy and Talent stood up as one. Ian stepped into the room, his expression implacable. He'd cleaned himself up and dressed, yet he looked so defeated that she wanted to run to him and beg him to let her hold him. But she did not move. They stared at each other from across the room, the tension between them pulled as tight as a bowstring. Daisy could not think of a word to say to make things right. Talent frowned and then stirred. Utter one word, Jack, came Ian's fierce growl, and I'll rip your sharp tongue from your mouth. Well. Talent's mouth snapped shut. With a terse nod, he left them. Ian slammed the door shut behind them and stalked across the room. All protest died on her lips as he hauled her against his chest in a bone-squeezing embrace and he buried his face in her hair. He stood shaking, holding her as if she might be snatched away. Nothing had ever felt better than his embrace. She clung to him and wished that it would never end. Don't, he pled when she started to speak. His grip tightened. Just... don't. Not yet. Whatever she felt at that moment receded in the face of his disquiet. He eased only a little when she slid her hands up and cupped his cheeks. 
Firelight turned his features into a patchwork of gold and amber angles and reflected in the haunted sheen of his eyes. Ian, she whispered, because she knew he liked his name upon her lips. Then she kissed him. He made a sound close to a whimper and then fell into the kiss, a man gripped by need. She pulled back and touched his face. Ian, you don't need to. I do need. A cracked, raw sound left him as he rested his forehead against hers. I need more than you know. He unsheathed one claw and reduced her gown into tatters with stunning adeptness. Cold air shivered over her skin as he tumbled her onto the bed. Soft bedding enveloped her, and then he was there, the long length of his body pressing her deeper into the covers, the wool of his suit warm and rough against her nakedness. His knuckles grazed her damp sex as he unbuttoned the fall of his trousers. The hot length of his cock fell against her thigh, and Daisy undulated against him. Unsteady hands slid along her arms to capture her wrists. Their fingers twined, and he lifted her arms above her head. His kiss was a desperate thing, without finesse. I don't know any other way, he said against her mouth. I don't know how else to show you. His eyes were wild and frightened as he gazed down at her, pausing as if to see if she understood. She was pinned to the bed, his thighs holding hers so wide apart that she felt the exposure acutely, and with it the need to be filled. Her heart knocked against her ribcage, for suddenly she did understand. She blinked back the mist blurring her vision and tightened her grip upon his fingers. Then show me your way, she whispered. A deep shudder racked his frame. She expected him to act, to take her with quick brutality, but he did not. He simply looked at her, his eyes wide open, hiding nothing, letting her in. What she saw took her breath. He was utterly beautiful to her just then, and she knew her heart and soul was no longer her own. Holding her gaze, he tilted his head and kissed her, a soft, open-mouthed kiss of melting heat. The tip of his cock nudged her opening, drawing her attention until it was the only thing she could think on. She wiggled against him, impatient and hurried, but he would not let her rush. Murmuring soothing words against her mouth, he gentled the kiss once more, his silken tongue dipping, tasting with smooth strokes. Only when she panted with need and small cries left her mouth did he ease into her, slow enough for her to feel every inch tunneling through her flesh, filling her up. She shuddered, her thighs aching to move, but she was pinned, and he was withdrawing with the same steady deliberation. Invasion, retreat, he worked an undulating rhythm that tormented all the while he kissed her, working her mouth as he worked her. Her body shook, perspiration blooming along her heated skin. God, but this could become essential. A woman could want this every day, all the time. The feeling within her was almost angry, a blinding, dark thing that had her biting his lower lip before licking to soothe it. He squeezed their twined fingers, his thrusts growing harder, his breath coming in shallow pants. She was burning up beneath him, the feel of his clothes heightening the sensation. She wanted to feel him without barrier. His deliberation fractured into desperation. Groaning deeply, he dropped his forehead to her neck, burrowing there as he pushed deep. A shiver lit over her skin, through her flesh and into him. He shook with a violent tremor but stopped. Ah, oh God, I need... let me... Shuddering, he withdrew, and before she could think, he turned her around to take her from behind. He stilled, remembering perhaps what had happened the last time he had tried. His big hand trembled as it pressed against her belly. Please, Daisy, will you let me... The very idea set her aflame, released something wild within her, but his hesitation and concern for her was a kick to her heart. Her voice was barely a whisper when she responded, Yes. He expelled the breath he'd been holding, 
Stepping away, he ripped free of his clothes and then came back to her, his breathing as ragged as her own. She groaned as he nudged her legs apart. Daisy's eyes fluttered closed as she slumped forward and lifted her hips to him. Christ, he hissed as he sank in deep, and then his hands grasped her hips and he took her. It was brutal, savage, and Daisy shivered from the shocking pleasure of it, her mind crying out, yes, and more. Ian's body surrounded her, holding her, keeping her, his strong teeth so unlike the wolves clamped down on the soft junction of her shoulder, and Daisy shattered. He followed her with a sharp cry as he strained against her. In the resounding silence, he fell onto the bed next to her and threw an arm over his eyes. His glistening chest heaved as he lay there, struggling for breath. She moved to touch him, and he lowered his arm. Daisy's vision blurred as she saw the raw pain in his eyes. Ian, you brought me back. His voice was a ghost of itself. You came back. I wanted to be afraid, but I knew in my heart that you would. I came back to you. Without another word, he curled against her, burrowing his face into the crook of her neck. She held him tight as he silently wept for the loss of his son, and even his brother. Eventually he calmed, his long body becoming loose and warm against hers. As they drifted off to sleep, her last bit of peace shattered when he whispered, They all die. They would have to talk. Eventually, Daisy knew this. Pull the thorn out quickly, was what her mother used to say. But she didn't want to. She didn't want to see Ian hurt any further, and she knew he would be. So she let him sleep, and sleep Ian did, his big, lean body taking up their bed in a sprawl of golden limbs and tousled auburn hair. He slept like the dead. Grief could do that to a person, make them seek the oblivion of sleep rather than face the day. Daisy knew from experience. Acting the coward, she dressed and then watched over him until the sunlight crept up his long legs and played with the flat muscles along his back. When he finally stirred, she went to him. Sleep must and grumbling, Ian tugged her near, wrapping his arms about her waist and resting his head in her lap. He seemed to breathe her in, his chest lifting with it. His fingers plucked at her dressing gown. You're dressed, he said, from the comfort of her lap. It sounded like a complaint. Though it made her want to smile, she couldn't. Softly she stroked his silken hair. A lump rose in her throat. It's midday. Is it? Mm. She smoothed a strand of hair between her fingers. Ian sighed and nuzzled against her. So very wolfish, she thought, a smile rising at last. But the smile faded. Ian. She laid her hand upon the crown of his head. Ian, I am so sorry. Tension tightened along his body. She felt him swallow. His voice was low but controlled when he spoke. Talent was in the right. You did make an a mercy. Lightly, he traced along the swirling pattern in her skirt. I was coming to do the same thing, love. I... He did not deserve to suffer. Last night, he said after a moment, when I... A rough exhale sent warmth against her belly. I thought I was too late, he rasped. I thought... He sucked in a deep breath. Fuck. She hugged him close. Had I known, I would have waited for you. I wish I had done so with all my heart. He didn't seem to hear her. I couldn't bear it, Daisy, if you'd died. I don't want to live in a world without your light. Letting my wolf free did not matter if it saved you. He looked at her as if seeing her for the first time, and he lifted his hand to slowly trace the contours of her face as if imprinting them in his mind. I love you. He said it so simply, without reservation or shame, 
as though he'd said the words to her a thousand times. It took her breath and shattered her heart. The corner of his lips quirked in a repentant smile. I should have told you before, but I haven't. I haven't said the words in a long time. Quickly, she pressed a hand to his jaw, running her thumb across his bottom lip. Hush. Her insides were tearing apart, and it hurt. It hurt so badly, she thought she might wail. But she forced herself to say what she must. Hush, Ian. She bent over and gave him a soft, quick kiss and almost sobbed. You needn't. Her mouth wobbled, threatening to betray her, and she took another breath. You needn't feel obliged to say those things. He went utterly stiff against her, his expression recoiling as though he'd been struck. Daisy forged on, making herself speak quickly, see the deed done. I know you care, Ian. Care? His voice was flat, his eyes narrowing. Care? Obliged? He sat up full, and she drew away, sensing the inevitable explosion. But he wouldn't let her go far. Strong hands whipped out to clasp her upper arms in an unbreakable grip. Her heart cracked at the pain swimming in his blue gaze. I tell you I love you. Words I vowed never to say to another again. His fingers bit into her soft flesh, and you think them spoken out of obligation. His voice turned sharp, cutting, out of some warped need to coddle you. Ian, she whispered, for her voice wouldn't obey her any more than her heart would. You're hurting me. His eyes widened, and he let her go as if burned. With a curse, he jumped up, oblivious to his nakedness. I... And you are hurting me, he snapped, or are my feelings so unworthy as to not merit discussion? Daisy got to her feet. Don't be ridiculous, of course they matter. Oh? His brows slashed upward. I tell you I love you, and in turn you spout utter rot. Do I mean nothing to you? Yes. Oh, but the walls were closing in on her his questions making her too hot, too agitated. I care for you as you care for me. Care, he snarled, tossing up a hand. His eyes flashed blue fire. I'm beginning to hate that word care. Fuck care. He paced toward her, gathering her in his arms again, his eyes wild but his touch careful now. No more deflections, Daisy Meg. It's just you and me here. Tell me. Tell me why you cannot accept that I love you. Doubt flickered in his troubled gaze. Why you cannot say that you love me. She wrenched herself out of his embrace and stumbled back when he moved toward her. Because you cannot love me. You should not, Daisy shouted. I am not for you, Ian Ranulph. I am mortal, if you remember. I will die. He flinched then. I... Some days that's all I think of and it cuts me to the soul. She gasped, pressing a hand to her throbbing head. And you ask me why I resist. I know why you resist, he retorted. Why I resisted for as long as I did. He took another step closer. And I told you before. I'm willing to risk the pain to be with you, Daisy mine. Ian's expression darkened as he bore down on her. Yesterday, you were willing to try. Yesterday, you agreed to become my wife. Yesterday, her life was filled with hope. She wrenched herself out of his embrace and stumbled back. Yesterday, I didn't fully appreciate the reality of what we would be to each other. She paced away from him and the look of betrayal and pain she'd put in his eyes. I don't want to do this while you're hurting. I don't want to say these things now. Then don't say them. Someone has to. I know how much it devastated you to lose Macon. Her stomach pitched as he winced. And if we continue on this way, it will happen to you again. She tried to touch him, but he flinched away. Her hand curled into a fist as she let it drop. 
I can be unselfish for once. I can do that much for you. The whites of his eyes were red and glassy as he glared at her. You're running away. Again. Yes, she said, backing away. I will not be another regret, Ian. I cannot be the one to cause you pain when I die and leave you behind. Pain lanced through the center of her skull and she ground her teeth. Love should not be the destruction of another. Talent was in the right. I make you weak, Ian. I cannot bear the thought of making you weak. Not you. The strongest man I've ever known. He stared at her for a long moment, his head cocked as if he were confused. But the clouds cleared, and he appeared almost angry. Christ! He strode forward. His mouth took hers in an open, heady kiss that spoke of frustration and desperation. She gave as good as she got, sinking into him because this was the last time she could. On a groan, his kiss gentled, exploring, coaxing, and when they finally parted, he gazed down at her. You never made me weak, he said, giving her a little shake. You make me strong. His big hands smoothed up her arms. Just knowing you're in this world makes me want to live in it, makes me want to fight. A small sob broke from her lips, and his gaze grew tender as he brushed a kiss along her temple. No, my daisy Meg, he said against her hair. Never weak, but infinitely strong. Sunlight gilded the swells of his shoulders and turned the ends of his hair into bronze. When he spoke, his voice was clear and firm. I would be a god with the power of your love, if I knew that I had it. He touched her cheek, but I cannot do it alone. I cannot bow and scrape for each scrap, hoping you'll see what I see in us. I won't have you by default. A small smile lifted his mouth. Ah, but if you gave it to me freely... I swear on my soul I wouldn't let it go to waste. With everything I am, I'd give it back to you in return. I'd keep you, love you, to my last breath, lass. Softly he kissed her. A promise. It was all she ever wanted. He was home, peace and happiness, and it split her in two. A hole lay in her chest where her heart had been, and she felt as though it bled straight through her skin and onto her clothes. Everything in her turned cold, then hot. Why did he have to make it so hard? Why did he have to fight her? She wanted to kick and bite him for her pain, for his. So she turned from him. Ian simply followed her with his head. Tell me that you don't love me, Daisy. His chest heaved. If that be the case, tell me and I'll let you go. Tears leaked from her eyes, scalding her skin as they ran free. I cannot. He exhaled with a deep shudder, his grip easing. Then why? I'm dying, Ian. The statement snapped like a whip, making his head rear back and his body tense. She closed her eyes on a sigh, defeat suddenly making her utterly weary. What? He swallowed audibly. Macon, she croaked. He bit me on the night he first attacked. Quickly she licked her dry lips. I've had headaches, sore throats, dizzy spells. I found the sore yesterday morning. Archer confirmed it. I have syphilis. His frozen stance shattered with a burst of agitated movements. Where? His hands were already fumbling with her gown. What does it matter? Where? He'd gone as white as chalk, his eyes awash with pain and denial, and it wrenched her heart anew. Too tired to resist, she lifted up the thick fall of her hair to reveal the small, round sore. His fingers hovered just above it, shaking. He bit his bottom lip hard and gave one sharp shake of his head. No. She forced herself to look him in the eyes. I'm done for. No. He took a shallow breath. There are treatments. 
At this, she allowed a small smile. You know better than anyone how effective those treatments are, Ian. They're almost worse than the disease. I'll care for you. You won't be alone. We will find a cure, I swear it. Ian, you know what lies in store. Pain, fevers, sores, deformity, madness. You said yourself that you would have helped make him go. Because he was already more than half gone. Ian gave her a little shake. I will not do that to you, so don't you fucking ask that of me, Daisy. Do not dare. She let him see the resolve in her eyes. That existence is not life. I won't do it, Ian. Do not ask me to become that. No. His expression crumpled. No, Daisy, no. A sob tore from him, and he buried his head in her hair. I won't let you. I can't. She cradled him, cooing under her breath as he cried. His arms wrapped around her, a vise that wouldn't let go as his lean frame shook. Do not do this, please. I can't lose you, too. No, love, she managed. Not now. There's time yet. She let him undress her and helped him with his clothes, their kisses soft, silent, his hands shaking as he touched her everywhere, mapping the topography of her body and she his, his gloriously strong body that would never age, never grow ill. He was the miracle that she could never be as a human. Slowly they relearned each other. There, in the sanctuary of their bed, with him, his touch, his taste, she was timeless, eternal. She was whole. She held on to the feeling until he finally slept, his limbs entwined with hers. Rest, however, eluded Daisy. Carefully, so as not to wake Ian, she slipped from the bed and went out onto the balcony. Moonlight turned her skin marble white. Staring down at her bare arms, she thought of her life. She had not lived as she ought. A cold rage swept over her, and her hand shook. She had not taken control of her wants and needs, and now her chance for happiness would go to waste. Daisy bowed her head and struggled not to scream. But as her breathing slowed and calm descended, a thought swelled within her, tantalizing with possibility. She straightened. Could it work? Could she do it? Ian did not stir when she came back inside and padded on silent feet into the dressing room. Anticipation and fear sent her blood to racing as she prepared to head out. Of the two emotions, fear was the greater. The unknown had always frightened Daisy, but she would face it now. She only prayed that Ian would understand when he learned what she had done. Chapter 39 Ian's fist nearly broke through the front door of Archer House. He pummeled it with all the terror and pain that gripped his soul. Open up! His shout ripped his throat raw. Open, damn you! Before he could howl and shred the door to bits with his claws, it whipped open. Miranda stood in shocked fury, her green eyes glinting. Northrop, have you gone mad? You scared my butler into his closet. Where is she? He shook with the need to hold Daisy. Waiting only made his wolf whine and his muscles twitch. The sight of Miranda blinking in confusion nearly brought him to his knees. He knew in his gut that she hadn't a clue where Daisy had gone. He'd known the instant he'd woken up alone that Daisy had left for good. Bile surged in his throat. His knees cracked hard against the flagstone. She was gone. He felt it felt her soul slipping away from him and leaving him ice cold, leaving him alone. A hand touched his shoulder. Ian, Miranda whispered fiercely, where is my sister? Fury and despair had his fangs sinking into his lip and tasting blood. She'd given up, quit on him. A keening cry tore through the air. He realized it was his. Words felt like broken glass in his mouth. 
She's taken her own way out. Her footsteps echoed in the silence as Daisy walked slowly across the Waterloo Bridge. She was afraid, so very afraid and cold. It made her want to turn tail and run back to Ian and his warmth. Wrapping her arms about her middle, she kept going. A thick fog had come up, shrouding the bridge in murky grey bunting, punctuated only by the ghostly glow of the gas lamps. She would not think about him, about her family, her life. Her steps stuttered. Think about Macon, what he'd become, deformed, grotesque, in agony. She shivered, her steps slowing. The mad beating of her heart overshadowed the mournful wail of a foghorn and the clang of a buoy. Her lips trembled, her breath coming short. I am afraid. I want to go home. Her fingers curled around the cold, slick wood of a piling as she stepped onto the pier. Just beyond, the barge floated at anchor, as if waiting for her to pay a call. What if he said no? What if she had to inhabit another body? Bile rose in her throat, threatening to let loose. Her muscles tensed as she moved to pull herself up. The water below her raced onward, making her dizzy. Ian, what would he think? Would he understand that she had no other choice? Would he find her repugnant? Shame burned in her belly. On a cry, she tore away from the piling. I cannot. You can, because you are no coward. Daisy jumped at the sound. A scream clogged in her throat as a figure emerged from the fog. The man stepped closer, his familiar features illuminated by the weak lamplight behind her. His voice was a low melody in the dusk. I've been waiting for you. You've been watching me. Yes. She ought to be furious, but he had promised Ian. Then you knew I would come to ask. Of course. He gave her a wry smile. We are, after all, the ears of London. Her insides trembled. He would make dying easy. She knew that now, and she didn't know if she appreciated the gesture. I am afraid. She blinked down at the hand he held out. Salvation is yours, he said. The question is, how much are you willing to sacrifice for love? There, glinting in the black bed of his gloved palm, it lay. A silver charm in the form of a goddess, with the wings of an angel. Chapter 40 it wasn't easy to find Ian. Aside from his home and Ranulph House, both of which were unnervingly empty, she hadn't a clue where to look. As a last resort, she went to Miranda's home. Her sister ran out into the hall to meet her. Daisy, where have you been? Daisy tried to smile, but she was too weak. Her body felt odd, heavy yet light, as if she might float away from it at any moment. The heart within her chest was like a ballast stone, an uncomfortable bulk that stretched against her breastbone, a sensation she was assured that would lessen with time. Later, pet. I need to find Ian. Do you know where he is? Miranda's eyes pinched. He was beside himself. He thought... She clenched Daisy's arm. He was under the impression that you went off to kill yourself. Guilt speared her, and with it, a cold fear that he would find what she'd done even worse. Well, obviously I did not, she said briskly, and then winced at her own callousness. Panda, where is he? Oh, how glib you are acting. You scared the devil out of me, Daisy. I... Oh, Daisy. Archie told me about what's happened. She teared up. You must know that we will help you. Daisy stroked Miranda's cheek. I'm sorry to have worried you all. It was a misunderstanding. Everything will be all right now, dearest. That is supposed to be what I say to you. Miranda stopped short and studied her with a keen eye. 
You look odd. Lovely, but odd. Well, she felt odd. Daisy could no longer bite back her impatience. Panda, I need Ian now. Indeed, if she didn't see him soon, she might scream. He's at the Plough and Harrow, said a male voice behind them. Talent limped forward on limbs still healing. He's gone out of his head. I came to see if Lady or Lord Archer could talk him down. Cold accusation burned into her. Because I thought you were gone. How did you get in? Miranda asked. Flew through an open window. Miranda blinked in surprise, but Daisy was already gathering her skirt. Daisy, wait! Miranda searched her face. I'm sorry I stood in your way. He loves you so. I know. And the knowledge gave Daisy the strength to run to him. Clemens was in a state when she arrived. The way-faced barkeep paced in front of his tavern, wringing his hands and muttering about crazed noblemen. He threw everybody out, Clemens told her. Had his man give me a sack of coins and said he'd buy the use of the place for the night. Daisy moved to go in when he blocked her path. He ain't in his right mind, lassie. I'm fearing for your safety. She meant her touch to be light, but she ended up all but shoving Clemens to the side in her haste. I've nothing to fear from him. He was sitting at their table, a forlorn figure hunched in the near darkness of the deserted tavern. From Clemens's warning, she feared he'd been drinking or had possibly destroyed the room. But he simply sat, alone in the quiet. Elbows on the table, his head in his hands, he didn't see her approach. For a moment, she wondered if he knew she was there. Get the fuck out! She stopped at his harsh command, and her stomach dipped. Ian didn't lift his head to acknowledge her as he spoke in a dead, flat voice. I don't care who you are or what you want. I've paid for this space, now go. Her lips trembled in a smile. Ridiculous that she should be smiling now, but it was that or cry. Ian, she whispered. His lithe body tensed so hard that every muscle along his shoulders and arms stood out in fine relief against his shirt. His chest lifted on a deep breath, and she knew without doubt that he was scenting her. In a rush, he exhaled. Slowly, as though he were afraid to look, he let his hands fall, and he raised his head. Red rimmed the azure colour of his eyes. Thick auburn stubble shadowed his jaw and throat. A stain, whiskey perhaps, spread over the expanse of his rumpled linen shirt. He looked ghastly. He looked wonderful. She expected him to come to her, but he didn't move. He stared at her for a long moment, his lower lip twitching, his eyes wide and agonized. Daisy fought the urge to fidget. Her blood moved like sludge through her veins, a painful feeling, compounded by the ache in her chest. Part of her wanted to run away, the other part wanted to run into his arms. His voice cracked through the silence. You left. A grimace of pain twisted his features. I thought you had... He bit down on his lip and swallowed audibly. She ground her fists into her skirts to keep still. I know. I'm sorry, Ian. So sorry. Ian blinked as if her words were a physical blow. Where did you go? His teeth clicked together. Why didn't you wake me? Daisy's hand floated up to her chest to rest there. How was it that her heart still hurt? I... She couldn't find the courage. Why are you hovering there? He said quietly not moving, barely breathing. Are you afraid of me then? She took a step closer to him. Never. His jaw clenched as his gaze slid away. Perhaps you should be. I'm in a rare temper just now. You don't appear to be. He snorted softly without humour. For future reference, lass, a wolf's always dangerous when he's gone still. His mouth curled in a parody of a smile as his hands clenched into fists, 
and I am of a mind to stroop your backside, as you so kindly put it once. The hurt surrounding him made her eyes water. She would make it up to him. With everything she had, she would make him feel loved and cherished. You still don't scare me, Ian Ranulph. His eyes fluttered closed for one pained moment. When they opened, they shone brilliant blue. Then come here, he exhaled with a ragged growl. Come here. Let me touch you, if you're real. His throat worked. I want to touch you. I need to touch you. Ian? She took a shuddering breath. I did something. He heard the regret in her voice and his eyes grew watchful. What? His voice was flat, afraid. What have you done? She hugged herself tightly. What I had to do. He wouldn't understand. Ian, I... I am frightened that you... He moved before she could blink, catching her up, hauling her against him. His mouth was on hers in an instant, tender, demanding, thirsting. She kissed him back, holding him tightly because he was her home, her other half, and she hadn't felt whole or safe until he touched her. He broke the kiss first, but he didn't let her go. Hasn't it seeped into your thick head yet, Daisy Meg, he whispered, his hands roaming her back, neck, shoulders. There isn't anything you can do that will make me stop loving you. You might break my heart, but it is yours anyway. Daisy sobbed, the tension in her breaking until she couldn't hold herself up. She could no longer give him her heart, but he had her soul. Always. Ian, I should have told you, I know. Cooing under his breath, he sank down into a chair and pulled her closer. It was then she felt how much he shook, deep tremors that racked his frame, but his voice was steady and his touch tender. There now, lass. His fingers threaded through her hair. I understand. I'm sorry I scared you. I couldn't think of another way. I... She stopped and picked at a loose thread along his collar. I understand, Daisy, I do. I'm not happy you left me to think the worst, mind you, but I understand your fear. He kissed her temple. We will work it out, I promise. She held him tighter and burrowed her face into the warm crook of his neck. Those hours she'd been gone, hours of hell and fear for both of them. I love you, Ian, so much. He stiffened, and she could feel the pounding of his heart against her ribs. A sigh left him, soft and gentle. Well, thank Christ for that, he said on a breath. Odd that she could feel him smile, but she knew he did. Ian always smiled with his whole body. I went to Lucian. The muscles surrounding her turned to rock. Before she could explain, he grabbed hold of her upper arms. His nostrils fled. What did you do? It was a whisper of fear. With shaking hands, she pulled open her cloak and undid the loose blouse she wore. Her tender ribs couldn't bear a corset just now. Ian made a strangled sound as she pulled the blouse open to reveal the line of golden stitching between her breasts, below which ticked her golden heart. Lucian had explained that, due to the delectable attributes of the female anatomy, a window won't do. Hence, she was stitched back together. Oh, Christ! Ian's fingertips hovered over her breastbone. Tell me you didn't. He clasped the back of her neck hard and pressed his forehead against her. His ragged breath fanned her face. Oh, Hill, my sweet daisy girl, why? She closed her eyes and wrapped an arm around his neck. She needed to hold him. Uncertainty made her bones shake. You know why. Ay, that I do, and it tears at my heart. He swore again, and then hugged her tight. It felt so much like home that her throat constricted. My brave love. I know it is not the most attractive alternative. It's beautiful, he cut in fiercely. If it's you, it is beautiful.
She pressed her lips to the strong, warm column of his neck where his pulse beat true. It is you who are beautiful, heart and soul. He held her as if she were a fragile thing, not the indestructible shell she had become. But she knew he was not content, not by half. How many? he asked as he stroked her back. The question was clear. She shuddered again. For a cold moment she was back in Lucian's barge, feeling her life end, the icy, sick dread of it, and the blinding pain of rebirth. She'd been violently ill for an hour afterward and wished for true death more than once as Lucian held her hair and patted her back in sympathy. She swallowed several times before she could speak. One. Ian eased back to look down at her in surprise. One soul. One soul and one hundred years of service to the Gims. One soul in place of hers, for she'd already given hers to Ian. One hundred years, because the Gims valued her connection to Ian and the Lycans more than they needed souls. So she would work with the Gims, collecting information, being their champion with the Ranulf court. A strange thrill shot through her at the thought of being useful. Hers was a brave new world. If she had Ian in it, she could face anything. His jaw worked in quiet fury. It should have been me. I should have offered in your stead. On a sigh, she cupped his cheek. It was my choice, my sacrifice. I've no regrets, Ian. His frown was slow to dissolve, and she gave him a little nudge upon his hard shoulder. You talk of thick skulls, she said. Haven't you realized? You are life. You are the reason I want to wake each morning, the inspiration for my every breath. I took salvation, Ian, for I too would be a god with the power of your love if I knew I had it. He touched her cheek softly, so softly. That you do, Daisy girl. Always. Then... She pulled him close. I swear on my soul, I won't let your love go to waste. With everything I am, I give it back to you in return. I shall keep you and love you till my last breath. She saw the realization break over him, that she was like him now, immortal. No longer would he have to see her age as he stayed the same, for as long as they had each other, they would never be alone again. His smile was the brilliance of the moon as he leaned down to kiss her. Till my last breath. Epilogue Ian and Daisy's wedding was a rousing affair, filled with drinking, dancing, and the occasional Scot bursting into song, never mind the antics of the lichens. Indeed, the bride and groom were quite shameless in their open displays of affection, so much so that come time to depart, the groom simply tossed his bride over his shoulder and carried his woman off. The bride laughed the whole way out. Show off, muttered his best man, Archer, though no one was fooled. Least of all his own wife, who gave him a secretive smile and tugged him home shortly thereafter. As for Poppy, she returned to an empty house. For three months she had endured this painful solo homecoming. Three months, and it did not get any easier. She went through the motions of removing...